Chapter 7 of History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Religion in Ireland during the 15th century. From the beginning of the 14th century, English power in Ireland was on the decline. The Irish princes, driven to desperation by the exactions and cruelties of the officials, adopted generally a more hostile attitude while the great Norman nobles, who had obtained grants of land in various parts of Ireland, began to intermarry with the Irish, adopted their language, their laws, their dress, and their customs, and for all practical purposes, renounced their allegiance to the sovereign of England. Owing to the civil war that raged in England during the latter portion of the fifteenth century, the English colonists were left entirely without support, and being divided among themselves, the Geraldines, favoring the House of York, and the Ormonds, the House of Lancaster, they were almost powerless to resist the encroachments of the native princes. Nor did the accession of Henry the Seventh lead to a combined effort for the restoration of English authority. The welcome given by so many of the Anglo-Irish, both laymen and clerics, to the two pretenders, Simnel and Warbeck, and the efforts the king was obliged to make to defend his throne against these claimants, made it impossible for him to undertake the conquest of the country. As a result, the sphere of English influence in Ireland, or the Pale, as it was called, became gradually more restricted. The frantic efforts made by the Parliament held a Drogheda, 1494, Poynings Parliament, to protect the English territory from invasion by the erection of a double ditch six feet high, is the best evidence that the conquest of the country still awaited completion. In the early years of the reign of Henry the Eighth. The Pale embraced only portions of the present counties of Dublin, Louth, Meath, and Kildare, or to be more accurate, it was bounded by a line drawn from Dundalk through Ardee, Kells, Kilcock, Clane, Noss, Kilcollen, Ballymore Eustace, Rathcole, Tullate, and Dalkey. Within this limited area, the inhabitants were not safe from invasion and spoliation unless they agreed to purchase their security by the payment of an annual tribute to the neighboring Irish princes, and outside it, even in the cities held by Norman settlers, and in the territories owned by Norman barons, the king's writ did not run. Recourse was had to legislative measures to preserve the English colonists from being merged completely into the native population. According to the Statutes of Kilkenny, 1367, the colonists were forbidden to intermarry with the Irish, to adopt their language, dress, or customs, or to hold any business relations with them, and what was worse, the line of division was to be recognized even within the sanctuary. No Irishman was to be admitted into cathedral or collegiate chapters or into any benefice situated in English territory, and religious houses were warned against admitting any Irish novices, although they were quite free to accept English subjects born in Ireland. 1367. This statute did not represent a change of policy in regard to Irish ecclesiastics. From the very beginning of the Norman attempt at colonization, the relations between the two bodies of ecclesiastics had been very strained. Thus, in the year 1217, Henry III wrote to his justiciary in Ireland, calling his attention to the fact that the election of Irishmen to Episcopal sees had caused already considerable trouble, and that consequently care should be taken in future that none but Englishmen should be elected or promoted to cathedral chapters. The Irish clerics objected strongly to such a policy of exclusion, and carried their remonstrances to Honorius III, who declared on two occasions, 1220-1224, that this iniquitous decree was null and void. As the papal condemnations did not produce the desired effect, the archbishops, bishops, and chapters seemed to have taken steps to protect themselves against aggression by ordaining that no Englishman should be admitted into the cathedral chapters, but Innocent IV, following the example of Honorius III, condemned this measure. Notwithstanding its solemn condemnation by the Holy See, this policy of exclusion was carried out by both parties, and the line of division became more marked according as the English power began to decline. The petition addressed to John the Twenty Second, 1317, by the Irish chieftains, who supported the invasion of Bruce, bears witness to the fact that the Statute of Kilkenny did not constitute an innovation, and more than once during the 15th century, the legislation against Irish ecclesiastics was renewed. The permission given to the Archbishop of Dublin to confer benefices situated in the Irish districts of his diocese on Irish clerics 
1485-1493, serves only to emphasize the general trend of policy. Similarly, the action of the Dominican authorities in allowing two superiors in Ireland, one of the houses in the English Pale, the other for the houses in the territories of the Irish princes, 1484, the refusal of the Irish Cistercians to acknowledge the jurisdiction of their English superiors, the boast of Walter Wellesley, Bishop of Kildare and prior of the Monastery of Old Connal, 1539, that no Irishman had been admitted into this institution since the day of its foundation, proved clearly enough that the relations between the Irish and English ecclesiastics during the 15th century were far from being harmonious. In the beginning, as has been shown, the Holy See interfered to express its disapproval of the policy of exclusion, whether adopted by the Normans or the Irish, but later on, when it was found that a reconciliation was impossible, the Pope deemed it the lesser of two evils to allow both parties to live apart. Hence the Norman community of Galway was permitted to separate itself from the Irish population immediately adjoining, and to be governed in spirituals by its own warden, 1484, and Leo X approved of the demand made by the chapter of St. Patrick's, Dublin, that no Irishman should be appointed a canon of that church, 1515. But though the Holy See, following the advice of those who were in a position to know what was best for the interests of religion, consented to tolerate a policy of exclusion, it is clear that it had no sympathy with such a course of procedure. In Dublin, for example, where English influence might be supposed to make itself felt most distinctly, out of 44 appointments to benefices made in Rome, 1421 to 1520, more than half were given to Irishmen. In the Diocese of Kildare, 46 out of 58 appointments fell to Irishmen, 1413 to 1521, and for the period 1431 to 1535, 53 benefices out of 81 were awarded in Meath to clerics bearing unmistakably Irish names. Again, in 1290, Nicholas IV insisted that none but an Irishman should be appointed by the Archbishop of Dublin to the Archdeaconry of Glendalough, and in 1482, Sixtus IV upheld the cause of Nicholas O'Hinnesaw, whom the Anglo-Irish of Waterford refused to receive as their bishop on the grounds that he could not speak English. But though attempts were made by legislation to keep the Irish and English apart, and though, as a rule, feeling between both parties ran high, there was one point on which both were in agreement, and that was loyalty and submission to the Pope. Though the Irish Church as such, like the rest of the Christian world, accepted fully the supremacy of the Pope, at the period of the Norman invasion, is evident from the presence and activity of the papal legates, Gilbert of Limerick, St. Malachi of Armagh, Christian, Bishop of Lismore, and St. Lawrence O'Toole, from the frequent pilgrimages of Irish laymen and ecclesiastics to Rome, from the close relations with the Roman court maintained by St. Malachi during his campaign for reform, and from the action of the Pope in sending Cardinal Papero to the National Synod at Kells, 1152, to bestow the palliums on the archbishops of Armagh, Dublin, Cashel, and Tuam. Had there been any room for doubt about the principles and action of the Irish Church, the question must necessarily have been discussed at the Synod of Cashel, convoked by Henry II, to put an end to the supposed abuses existing in the Irish Church, 1172. And yet, though it was laid down that in its liturgy and practices the Irish Church should conform to English customs, not a word was said that could by any possibility imply that the Irish people were less submissive to the Pope than any other nation at this period. After the Normans had succeeded in securing a foothold in the country, both Irish and Normans were at one in accepting the Roman supremacy. The Pope appointed to all bishoprics, whether situated within or without the Pale. He deposed bishops, accepted their resignations, transferred them from one see to another, cited them before his tribunals, censured them at times, and granted them special faculties for dispensing in matrimonial and other causes. He appointed to many of the abbeys and priories in all parts of the country, named ecclesiastics to rectories and vicarages, and Raphael, Derry, Tuam, Cumagdal, and Kerry, with exactly the same freedom as he did in case of Dublin, Kildare, or Meath, and tried cases involving the rights of laymen and ecclesiastics in Rome, or appointed judges to take cognizance of such cases in Ireland. He sent special legates into Ireland, levied taxes on all benefices, appointed collectors to enforce the payment of these taxes, and issued dispensations and irregularities and impediments. 
the fiction of two churches in ireland one the anglo-irish acknowledging the authority of the pope the other the irish fighting sullenly against papal aggression has been laid to rest by the publication of thener's vitura monumenta hibernorum et scotorum the calendars of papal letters the calendars of documents ireland and the annats if any writer regardless of such striking evidence should be inclined to revive such a theory he should find himself faced with the further disagreeable fact that when the english nation and a considerable body of the anglo-irish nobles fell away from their obedience to rome the irish people who were supposed to be hostile to the pope preferred to risk everything rather than allow themselves to be separated from the centre of unity such a complete and instantaneous change of front if historical would be as inexplicable as it would be unparalleled nor is there any evidence to show that lollardy or any other heresy found any support in ireland during the fourteenth or fifteenth centuries during the episcopate of bishop ledreed in ossory thirteen seventeen to sixty it would appear both from the constitutions enacted in the diocesan synod held in thirteen seventeen as well as from the measures he felt it necessary to take that in the city of kilkenny a few individuals called in question the incarnation and the virginity of the blessed virgin but it is clear that such opinions were confined to a very limited circle and did not affect the body of the people about the same time too the dispute that was being waged between john the twenty second and a section of the franciscans found an echo in the province of cashel though there is no proof that the movement ever assumed any considerable dimensions similarly at a later period when the christian world was disturbed by the presence of several claimants to the papacy and by the theories to which the great western schism gave rise news was forwarded to rome that some of the irish prelates amongst them being the archbishop of dublin and the bishop of ferns were inclined to set at naught the instructions of martin v fourteen twenty four but the latter pontiff took energetic measures to put an end to a phenomenon that was quite intelligible considering the general disorder of the period the appeal of philip norris dean of dublin during his dispute with the mendicants to a general council against the decision of the pope only serves to emphasize the fact that throughout the controversy between the pope and the council of basel ireland remained unshaken in its attachment to the holy see although the first measure passed by the parliament of kilkenny thirteen sixty seven and by nearly every such assembly held in ireland in the fifteenth century was one for safeguarding the rights and liberties of the church yet the roots of the evils that afflicted the church at this period can be traced to the interference of kings and princes in ecclesiastical affairs the struggle waged by gregory the seventh in defence of free canonical elections to bishoprics abbacies and priories seemed to have been completely successful but in reality it led only to a change of front on the part of the secular authorities instead of claiming directly the right of nomination they had recourse to other measures for securing the appointment of their own favourites in theory the election of bishops in ireland rested with the canons of the cathedral chapters but they were not supposed to proceed with the election until they had received the congue de elite from the king or his deputy who usually forwarded an instruction as to the most suitable candidate as a further safeguard it was maintained that even after the appointment of the bishop-elect had been confirmed by the pope he must still seek the approval of the king before being allowed to take possession of the temporalities of his see as a result even in the thirteenth century when capitular election was still the rule the english sovereigns sought to exercise a controlling influence on episcopal elections in ireland but they met at times with a vigorous resistance from the chapters the bishops the irish princes and from rome towards the end of the fourteenth century however and in the fifteenth century though the right of election was still enjoyed nominally by the chapters in the majority of cases either their opinions were not sought or else the capitular vote was taken as being only an expression of opinion about the merits of the different candidates indirectly by means of the chancery rules regarding reservations or by the direct reservation of the appointment of a particular bishopric on the occasion of a particular vacancy the pope kept in his own hands the appointments owing to the encroachments of the civil power and the pressure that was brought to bear upon the chapters such a policy was defensible enough and had it been possible for the roman advisers to have had a close acquaintance with the merits of the clergy and to have had a free hand in their recommendations direct appointment might have been attended with good results 
but the officials at Rome were oftentimes dependent on untrustworthy sources for their information, and they were still further handicapped by the fact that if they acted contrary to the king's wishes, the latter might create serious trouble by refusing to restore the temporalities of the sea. Instances, however, are not wanting, even in England itself, to show that the popes did not always allow themselves to be dictated to by the civil authorities, nor did they recognize in theory the claim of the king to dispose of the temporalities. It is difficult to determine how far the English kings succeeded in influencing appointments to Irish bishoprics. About Dublin, Meath, and Kildare, there can be no doubt that their efforts were attended with success. In Armagh, too, they secured the appointment of Englishmen as a general rule, and in Cashel, Waterford, Limerick, and Cork, the recommendations, or rather the recommendations of the Anglo-Irish nobles, were followed in many instances. Outside the sphere of English influence, it does not seem that their suggestions were adopted at Rome. At any rate, it is certain that if they sought for the exclusion of Irishmen, their petitions produced little effect. During the early years of the reign of Henry the Eighth, more active measures seemed to have been taken by the king to assert his claims to a voice in episcopal appointments. In the appointments at this period to Amal, Dublin, Meath, Leland, Kilmore, Clogger, and Ross, it is stated expressly in the papal bulls that they were made a supplicationem regis. Unfortunately, several of the ecclesiastics on whom bishoprics were conferred in Ireland during the 15th century had but slender qualifications for such a high office. On the one hand, it was impossible for Rome in many cases to have a close acquaintance with the various candidates, and on the other, the influence of the English kings, of the Irish princes, and of the Anglo-Irish nobles was used to promote their own dependence without reference to the effects of such appointments on the progress of religion. The archbishops of Dublin and Armagh, and the bishops of Kildare and Meath, were more interested as a rule in political and religious affairs than in their duties as spiritual rulers. They held on many occasions the highest offices in the state, and had little time to devote their attention to the government of their dioceses. Absenteeism was as remarkable a characteristic of the church in the 15th century as it was of the established church in the 18th, and in this direction the bishops were the worst offenders. Very often, too, sees were left vacant for years, during which time the king's officials or the Irish princes, as the case might be, wasted the property of the diocese, either with the connivance or against the bishops of the diocesan chapters. Of the archbishops of Ireland, about the time of the Reformation, George Cromer, a royal chaplain, was appointed because he was likely to favor English designs in Ireland, and for that purpose was named Chancellor of Ireland. John Aylen, another Englishman, was recommended by Cardinal Wolsey to Dublin, mainly for the purpose of overthrowing the domination of the Earl of Kildare. Edmund Butler, the illegitimate son of Sir Piers Butler, owed his elevation to the see of Cashel, to the influence of powerful patrons, and Thomas O'Molly of Tuam, a Franciscan friar, passed to his reward a few days before the meeting of the Parliament that was to acknowledge royal supremacy, to be succeeded by Christopher Bodkin, who allowed himself to be introduced into the see by the authority of Henry the Eighth against the wishes of the Pope. But, even though the bishops as a body had been as zealous as individuals amongst them undoubtedly were, they had no power to put down abuses. The patronage of church livings, including rectories, vicarages, and chaplaincies, enjoyed by laymen, as well as by chapters, monasteries, convents, hospitals, etc., made it impossible for a bishop to exercise control over the clergy of his diocese. Both Norman and Irish nobles were generous in their gifts to the church, but whenever they granted endowments to a parish, they insisted on getting in return the full rights of patronage. Thus, for example, the Earl of Kildare was recognized as a legal patron of close on forty rectories and vicarages situated in the diocese of Dublin, Kildare, Meath, Limerick, and Cork, and he held, besides, the tithes of a vast number of parishes scattered over a great part of Leinster. The Earl of Ormond enjoyed similar rights in Kilkenny and Tipperary, as of the Desmond family in the south, and the de Burgos in Connaught. The O'Neills, O'Donnells, O'Connors, McCarthys, O'Burns, and a host of minor chieftains exercised ecclesiastical patronage in their respective territories. Very often these noblemen, in their desire to benefit some religious or charitable institution, transferred to it the right of patronage enjoyed by themselves. 
Thus the monastery of Old, or Great Connell, in Kildare, controlled twenty-one rectories in Kildare, nineteen in Carlow, one in Meath, and one in Tipperary. While the celebrated convent of Grace Dieu had many ecclesiastical livings in its gift. Owing to these encroachments, the bishop was obliged frequently to approve of the appointment of pastors who were in no way qualified for their position. The lay patrons nominated their own dependents and favorites, while both ecclesiastical and lay patrons were more anxious about securing the revenues than about the zeal and activity of the pastors and vicars. Once the system of papal reservation of minor benefices was established fully in the 15th century, the authority of the bishop in making appointments in his diocese became still more restricted. Ecclesiastics who sought preferment turned their eyes towards Rome. If they could not go there themselves, they employed a procurator to sue on their behalf, and armed with the papal document, they presented themselves before a bishop, merely to demand canonical institution. Though, in theory, therefore, the bishop was supposed to be the chief pastor of a diocese, in practice he had very little voice in the nomination of his subordinates, and very little effective control over their qualifications or their conduct. Very often benefices were conferred on boys who had not reached the canonical age for the reception of orders, sometimes to provide them with the means of pursuing their studies, but sometimes also to enrich their relatives from the revenues of the church. In such cases, the entire work was committed to the charge of an underpaid vicar, who adopted various devices to supplement his miserable income. Frequently, men living in England were appointed to parishes or canonries within the pale, and, as they could not take personal charge themselves, they secured the services of a substitute. In defiance of the various canons leveled against plurality of benefices, dispensations were given freely at Rome, permitting individuals to hold two, three, four, or more benefices, to nearly all of which the care of souls was attached. In proof of this, one might refer to the case of Thomas Russell, a special favorite of the Roman court, who held a canonry in the Diocese of Lincoln, the prebends of Clonmethan, and swords in Dublin, the archdeaconry of Kells, the church of Nauber, the perpetual vicarship of St. Peter's Drogheda, and the church of St. Patrick's in Trim. This extravagant application of patronage and reservations to ecclesiastical appointments produced results in Ireland similar to those it produced in other countries. It tended to kill learning and zeal amongst the clergy, to make them careless about their personal conduct, the proper observance of the canons, and the due discharge of their duties as pastors and teachers. Some of them were openly immoral, and many of them had not sufficient learning to enable them to preach or to instruct their flocks. It ought to be remembered also that in these days there were no special seminaries for the education of the clergy. Candidates for the priesthood received whatever training they got from some member of the cathedral chapter, or in the schools of the mendicant friars, or possibly from some of those learned ecclesiastics, whose deaths are recorded specially in our annals. Before ordination they were subjected to an examination, but the severity of the test depended on many extrinsic considerations. Some of the more distinguished youths were helped by generous patrons, or from the revenues of ecclesiastical benefices, to pursue a higher course of studies in theology and canon law. As the various attempts made to found a university in Ireland during the 14th and 15th centuries proved a failure, students who wished to obtain a degree were obliged to go to Oxford, from which various attempts were made to exclude the mere Irish, by legislation, to Cambridge, Paris, or some of the other great schools on the continent. If one may judge from the large number of clerics who were mentioned in the papal documents as having obtained a degree, a fair proportion of clerics during the 15th century, both from within and without the pale, must have received their education abroad. Still, the want of a proper training, during which unworthy candidates might be weeded out, coupled with the unfortunate system of patronage then prevalent in Ireland, helped to lower the whole tone of clerical life, and to produce the sad conditions of which sufficient evidence is at hand, in the dispensations from irregularities mentioned in the papal letters. As might be expected in such circumstances, the cathedrals and churches in some districts showed signs of great neglect, both on the part of the ecclesiastics and of the lay patrons. Reports to Rome on the condition of the cathedrals of Ardell and Clomacnois indicate a sad condition of affairs, but they were probably overthrown in the hope of securing a reduction in the fees paid, usually on episcopal appointments, just as the account given by the Jesuit Father Wolf about the Cathedral of Tuam was certainly overdrawn by Archbishop Bobkin with the object of obtaining papal recognition for his appointment to that diocese. 
the earl of kildare represented the churches of tipperary and kilkenny as in ruins owing to the exactions of his rival the earl of ormond while the latter having determined for political reasons to accept royal supremacy endeavoured to throw the whole blame on the pope both statements may be regarded as exaggerated but the occupation of the diocesan property during the vacancy of the sees by the king or the nobles the frequent war during which the churches were used as storehouses and as places of refuge and defence the neglect of the lay patrons to contribute their share to the upkeep of the ecclesiastical buildings and the carelessness of the men appointed to major and minor benefices so many of whom were removed during the fifteenth century for alienation and dilapidation of ecclesiastical property must have been productive of disastrous effects on the cathedrals and parish churches in many districts yet it would be a mistake to suppose that such neglect was general throughout the country the latter half of the fourteenth century and particularly the fifteenth century witnessed a great architectural revival in ireland during which the pure gothic of an earlier period was transformed into the vernacular or national composite style many beautiful churches especially monastic churches were built others were completely remodelled and on the whole it would not be too much to say that it is the exception to find a monastery or a parish church in ireland which does not show some work executed at this period the disappearance of canonical election the interference of lay patrons the too frequent use of papal reservations and the appointment of commendatory abbots and priors led to a general downfall of discipline in the older religious orders though there is no evidence to prove that the abuses were as general or as serious as they had been painted even at the time when the agents of henry the eighth were at work preparing the ground for the suppression of the monasteries and when any individual who would bring forward charges against them could count upon the king's favour it was only against a few members and less than half a dozen houses that grave accusations were alleged even if these accusations were justified and the circumstances in which they were made are sufficient to arouse suspicions about their historical value it would not be fair to hold the entire body of religious in ireland responsible for abuses that are alleged only against the superior or members of a small number of houses situated in waterford or tipperary long before the question of separation from his lawful wifehood induced henry the eighth to begin a campaign in ireland against rome the mendicant friars had undertaken a definite program of reform in fourteen sixty the bishop of Kilala, in conjunction with the franciscan friar nehemihis o'donnell determined to introduce a strict observance into the franciscan houses and from that time forward in spite of obstacles from many quarters the observance succeeded in getting possession of many of the old conventual houses and in establishing several new monasteries in all parts of ireland but particularly in the purely irish districts the dominicans too took steps to see that the original rules and constitutions of the order should be observed in fourteen eighty four ireland was recognized as a separate province though the houses within the pale were allowed to continue under the authority of a vicar of the english provincial while at the same time a great reform of the order was initiated several houses submitted immediately both within and without the pale amongst the earliest of them being coolerain drogheda and Ugol. The various religious orders of men did excellent work in preaching, instructing the people, in establishing schools, both for the education of clerics and laymen, and in tending to the wants of the poor and the infirm. In the report on the state of Ireland, presented to Henry the Eighth, it is admitted that, though the bishops and rectors and vicars neglected their duty, the poor friar baggers preached the word of God, that the people and nobles, both Irish and Anglo-Irish, appreciated fully the labors and services of the friars, is evident from the number of new houses which they established for their reception during the fifteenth century the convents of longford portumna tulsk burishol thomastown and gola were established for the dominicans coconnell askeaton and escurthy moyne adair modigan donegal and dungannon for the franciscans dunmore nos morisk and cullen for the augustinians and rothmullen frankfort castle lyons and galway for the carmelites the abuses that existed in the irish church at this period arose mainly from the enslavement of the church and they could have been remedied from within even had there been no unconstitutional revolution as a matter of fact those who styled themselves reformers succeeded only in transferring to their own sect the main sources of all previous abuses namely royal interference in ecclesiastical affairs and lay patronage and by doing so they made it possible for the catholic church in ireland to pursue its mission unhampered by outside control 
it ought to be borne in mind that the faults of certain individuals or institutions do not prove that the whole organization was corrupt and that if there were careless and unworthy bishops there were also worthy men like the blessed thaddeus mccarthy of cloyne who though driven from his diocese by the aggression of the nobles was venerated as a saint both in ireland and abroad the great number of provincial and diocesan synods held in ireland during the period between fourteen fifty and fifteen thirty makes it clear that the bishops are more attentive to their duties than is generally supposed while the collections of sermons and manuscript the use of commentaries on the sacred scriptures and of concordances the attention paid to the scriptures in the great irish collections that have come down to us and the homilies in irish on the main truths of religion on the primary duties of christians and on the lives of the irish saints affords some evidence that the clergy were not entirely negligent of the obligations of their office had the clergy been so ignorant and immoral as a few of those foisted into irish benefices undoubtedly were the people would have risen up against them and yet though here and there some ill feeling was aroused regarding the temporalities probates fees rents rights of fishing wills etc there is no evidence of any widespread hostility against the clergy secular or regular or against rome the generous grants made to religious establishments the endowment of hospitals for the poor and the infirm the frequent pilgrimages to celebrated shrines in ireland and on the continent the charitable and religious character of the city guilds and above all the adherence of the great body of the people to the religion of their fathers in spite of the serious attempts that were made to seduce them prove conclusively enough that the alleged demoralization of the irish church is devoid of historical foundation nor could it be said that the irish people at this period were entirely rude and uncultured though most of their great schools had gone down and though the attempts at founding a university had failed learning has certainly not disappeared from the country clerics and laymen could still obtain facilities for education at the religious houses the cathedral and collegiate churches at the schools of irish law and poetry and from some of the learned teachers whose names are recorded in our annals during this period many of the clerics at least frequented the english universities or the universities on the continent during the fifteenth and sixteenth century one can point to several distinguished irish scholars such as ophilly the archbishop of tuam who was recognized as one of the leading theological writers of his day catha maguire the author of the annals of ulster bishop colby of waterford the author of several commentaries on sacred scripture the well-known carmelite preacher and writer thomas scrope patrick cullen bishop of clogger and his archdeacon roderick of cassidy and philip norris the determined opponent of the mendicants and the dominicans john barley johannes hibernicus and richard winchelsey the catalogue of the books contained in the library of the franciscan convent at ugal about the end of the fifteenth century affords some indication of the attitude of the monastic bodies generally towards education and learning in addition to the missals psalteries and tophonies and martyrologies the convent at Ugal had several copies of the Bible, together with some of the principal commentaries thereon, collections of sermons by well-known authors, several of the works of the early fathers and of the principal theologians of the Middle Ages, the decrees of Gratian, the decretals and various works on canon law, spiritual reading books, including the life of Christ, and works on ascetic theology. The works of Boetius and various treatises on philosophy, grammar, and music, and some histories of the Irish province of the Franciscans. Similarly, the library of the Earl of Kildare, about 1534, contained over twenty books in Irish, thirty-four works in Latin, twenty-two in English, and thirty-six in French. While the fact that Manus O'Donnell, Prince of Tarconnell, could find time to compose a life of St. Columba in 1532, and that at a still later period Shane O'Neill could carry on his correspondence with foreigners in elegant Latin, bears testimony to the fact that at this period learning was not confined to the pale. Again, it should be remembered that it was between the 13th and 16th century that the great Irish collections, such as the Book of Necken, the Book of Ballymote, the Liebharbreek, the Book of Lismore, etc., were compiled, and that it was about the same time many of the more important Irish annals were compiled or completed, as were also translations of well-known Latin, French, and English works. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8, Part 1 of History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Church in Ireland during the reigns of Henry the Eighth and Edward the Sixth, fifteen 
1509-1553. When Henry the Eighth ascended the English throne, though he styled himself the Lord of Ireland, he could claim little authority in the country. The neglect of his predecessors, the quarrels between the English colonists, especially between the Geraldines and the Butlers, and the anxiety of both parties to ally themselves with the Irish princes, had prevented the permanent conquest of the country. Outside the very limited area of the Pale, English sheriffs or judges dare not appear to administer English law, no taxes were paid to the crown, no levies of troops could be raised, and the colonists could only hope for comparative peace by paying an annual tribute to the most powerful of their Irish neighbours. The barony of Leacall and Down paid forty pounds a year to O'Neill of Clandeboy. Louth paid a similar sum to O'Neill of Tyrone. Meath paid three hundred pounds a year to O'Connor of Offaly. Kildare twenty pounds to O'Connor. Wexford forty pounds to the McMurroughs. Kilkenny and Tipperary forty pounds to O'Carroll of Ely. Limerick City and County eighty pounds to the O'Briens. Cork, forty pounds to the McCarthys, and so low had the government fallen that it consented to pay eighty marks yearly from the royal treasury to McMurrow. During the early years of his reign, Henry the Eighth was so deeply interested in his schemes for subduing France and in continental affairs generally that he could give little attention to his dominions in Ireland. Sometimes the Earl of Kildare was superseded by the appointment of the Earl of Surrey, fifteen twenty, and of Sir Piers Butler, the claimant to the earldom of Ormond. 1521, and of Sir William Skeffington, 1529. But as a general rule, Kildare, whether as deputy or as a private citizen, succeeded in dictating the policy of the government. By his matrimonial alliances with the Irish chieftains, the O'Neills, the McCarthys, O'Carroll of Ely, and O'Connor of Offaly, his bargains with many of the other Irish and Anglo-Irish nobles, and by his well-known prowess in the field, he had succeeded in making himself much more powerful in Ireland than the English sovereign. But his very success had raised up against him a host of enemies, led by his old rival, the Earl of Ormond, and supported by a large body of ecclesiastics, including Allen, the Archbishop of Dublin, and of lay nobles. Various charges against him were forwarded to England, and in 1534 he was summoned to London to answer for his conduct. Before setting out on his last journey to London, he appointed his son, Lord Thomas Fitzgerald, Silken Thomas, then a youth of twenty-one, to take charge of the government. The latter had neither the wisdom nor the experience of his father. Rumors of his father's execution, spread by the enemies of the Geraldines, having reached his ears, despite the earnest entreaties of Archbishop Cromer of Armagh, he resigned the sword of state, and called upon his retainers to avenge the death of the Earl of Kildare. 1534. The rebellion of Silken Thomas forced Henry VIII to undertake a determined campaign for the conquest of Ireland. His hopes of winning glory and territory in France had long since disappeared. He was about to break completely with Rome, and there was some reason to fear that Charles V might make a descent upon the English coasts, with or without the aid of the King of France. Were an invasion from the continent undertaken before the conquest of Ireland had been finished, it might result in the complete separation of that kingdom from England, and its transference to some foreign power. It was well known that some of the Irish princes were in close correspondence with France and Scotland, that Silken Thomas was hoping for the assistance of the Emperor, and that once England had separated herself definitely from the Holy See, many of the Irish and Anglo-Irish nobles might be induced to make common cause with the Pope against a heretical king. Hitherto the king's only legal title to the lordship of Ireland was the supposed grant of Adrian the Fourth, and as such a grant must necessarily lapse on account of heresy and schism, a new title must be sought for in the complete conquest of the country. The circumstances were particularly favourable for undertaking such a work. The royal treasury was well supplied. England had little to fear for the time being from Francis I or Charles V, as the energies of both are required for the terrible struggle between France and the Empire. The friends of Ormond and the enemies of Kildare, both Irish and Anglo-Irish, could be relied upon to lend their aid, and even the Irish princes, friendly to Kildare, might be conciliated by fair promises of reward. Relying upon all these considerations, Henry the Eighth determined to reduce Ireland to submission, and at the same time to put an end to his religious and political dependence on the Holy See. William Skeffington was reappointed deputy and sent over to quell the rebellion, together with Sir Piers Butler, 
who in consideration of the bestowal upon him of the territories of the formal earls of ormond he agreed to resist the usurped jurisdiction of the pope especially in regard to appointments to benefices fifteen thirty four the campaign opened early in fifteen thirty five but as the new deputy was physically unable to command a great military expedition lord leonard grey the brother-in-law of the earl of kildare was soon entrusted with the conduct of the war though in the beginning silk and thomas had met with success the news of the rumoured execution of the earl was untrue the murder of the archbishop of dublin by some of the geraldine followers and the excommunication that such a deed involved disheartened his army and caused many of those upon whom he relied to desert him at last in august fifteen thirty five he surrendered to lord grey who seems to have given him a promise of his life but henry the eighth was not the man to allow any obligations of honour to interfere with his policy after having been kept in close confinement in the tower for months he and his five uncles were hanged drawn and quartered at tyburn fifteen thirty seven the king's only regret was that the young heir to the earldom of kildare was allowed to escape and the failure to capture his own sister's son was one of the gravest charges brought afterwards against lord leonard grey as it was the rebellion was suppressed o'more of leeks o'carroll of ely o'connor of offaly and the other irish adherents of the geraldines were reduced to submission and thereby the work of conquest was well begun in fifteen thirty six as a reward for the services he had rendered and in the hope that he would carry the work of subjugation to a successful conclusion leonard grey was appointed deputy henry the eighth had separated himself definitely from the catholic church and had induced a large number of english bishops ecclesiastics and nobles to reject the jurisdiction of the pope in favour of royal supremacy in england he owed much of his success to the presence of cramer in the metropolitan see of canterbury and to the skill with which his clever counsellors manipulated parliament so as to ensure its compliance with the royal wishes hence when he determined to detach ireland from its allegiance to rome he resolved to utilize the archbishop of dublin and the irish parliament fortunately for him dublin was then vacant owing to the murder of archbishop allen during the geraldine rebellion fifteen thirty four after careful consideration he determined to confer the archbishopric on george brown an augustinian friar who had merited the royal favour by preaching so strongly against henry's marriage with catherine of aragon that most of the congregation rose in a body and left the church according to the imperial ambassador it was brown who officiated at the secret marriage of the king to anne boleyn and it was on that account he was created provincial of the english augustinians and joined in a commission with dr hilsey the provincial of the dominicans for a visitation of the religious houses in england the new archbishop received his commission from the king without reference to the pope and his consecration from cramner fifteen thirty six brown was in every way a worthy representative of the new spiritual dictator and of the new learning his nomination to dublin was condemned by the people of lincoln because he had abandoned the christian faith hardly had he arrived in dublin when he found himself at loggerheads with lord grey who treated him with studied contempt and took very violent measures to cool his religious ardour he was assailed by his royal spiritual head for his arrogance and inefficiency and warned to take heed lest he who had made him a bishop might unmake him by his fellow labourers and associates in the work of spreading the gospel staples of meath and bale of ossery he was denounced as a heretic an avaricious dissembler a drunkard and a profligate who preached only two sermons with which the people became so familiar that they knew what to expect once he had announced his text before the arrival of brown in ireland careful steps were taken by the deputy and the earl of ormond to ensure that only trustworthy men should be elected as knights of the shire while the lawyers were hard at work both in england and ireland drafting the laws that parliament was expected to ratify the assembly opened on monday first may at dublin was adjourned thirty first may to kilkenny then to cashel twenty eighth july then to limerick second august from which place it returned once more to dublin the next session opened in september fifteen thirty six and after several short sessions and long adjournments it was prorogued finally in december fifteen thirty seven as far as can be seen no representatives attended this parliament except from the pale and from the territories under the influence of the earl of ormond and his adherents it was in no sense an irish parliament as not a single irish layman took part in it 
nor could it be described accurately even as a parliament of Leinster. It is generally assumed that together with the act of attainder against the party of Kildare, all the legislation passed already in England, including the act of succession and of royal supremacy, the acts against the authority of the Bishop of Rome, against appeals to Rome, and transferring to the king the first fruits, etc., were passed almost immediately, and with very little opposition, except a strong protest lodged by Archbishop Cromer of Armagh. But an examination of the correspondence that passed between the authorities in Dublin and in London reveals a very different story. It is true that on the 17th May, Barbazin informed Cromwell that the act of attainder against Kildare, the acts of secession, of royal supremacy, and of first fruits, had already passed the commons, and that on the 1st June the deputy wrote that all these, including the act against appeals to Rome, had passed the parliament, and that in the same month Cromwell expressed his thanks to some of the Irish officials for having secured the assent of parliament to all these measures. But in spite of these assurances of victory secured before Parliament had been a month in session, there must have occurred some very serious hitch in the program. In October 1536, Robert Cowley wrote to Cromwell to complain that certain acts had been rejected owing to the action of some ringleaders or bellwethers, who had decided to send a deputation to England to argue stiffly against them. That Patrick Barnewall, the king's sergeant was on the side of the discontents, and that he declared in the House of Commons that he would not grant that the king had as much spiritual power as the Bishop of Rome, or that he could dissolve religious houses. As nothing could be done, the session was adjourned until February 1537, when the deputy announced that owing to the confusion caused in the Commons by the reported return of Silken Thomas, and to the boldness of the spirituality, on account of the religious rebellion which had taken place in England, no measures could be passed, and a further adjournment was necessary. When Parliament met again, matters were still going badly for the King. The deputy informed Cromwell that the spirituality was still obstinate, that the spiritual peers refused to debate any bill till they should receive satisfactory assurances that the spiritual proctors or representatives of the clergy should be allowed to vote, and that as the Parliament had refused to pass the bill imposing a tax of one-twentieth of their annual revenues on the holders of benefices, he was obliged to adjourn till July. He warned Cromwell that as the proctors and the bishops had formed a combination, little could be passed until the proctors were deprived of their votes, and he suggested that, as a means of overcoming the resistance of the spirituality, the king should send over a special commissioner to be present at the opening of the next session. Acting on this suggestion, a royal commission, consisting of Anthony St. Ledger, George Paulette, Thomas Moyle, and William Berners was dispatched to Ireland, July 1537, to deliver the following acts to be passed by Parliament, namely, acts depriving the spiritual proctors of their right to vote and against the powers of the Bishop of Rome, together with acts giving to the King the tax of one-twentieth on benefices, enforcing the use of the English language and dress, and prohibiting alliances with the wild Irish. At the same time, Henry wrote to the deputy and council, warning them to obey the instructions of the commissioners, and to the House of Lords, ordering them to ratify the bills to be submitted, and telling them that if any member be unwilling to do so, we shall look upon him with our princely eye, as his ingratitude therein shall be little to his comfort. When Parliament met again in October, the spiritual proctors were deprived of their votes, and it was only then that the act against the Bishop of Rome could be carried. The threats of royal vengeance seemed to have produced the same effects in the Dublin Assembly as in the English Parliament. Probably, as happened in England, those who could not agree with the measures were content to absent themselves during the discussions. The truth is, therefore, that Archbishop Cromer was supported in his attitude by the bishops and the representatives of the clergy, and that the acts against the jurisdiction of the Pope were carried against the wishes of the spirituality. But the placing of the acts upon the statute book did not mean that the cause of the king had triumphed. Steps must be taken to enforce the laws against the jurisdiction of the Pope. Already in October 1537, the royal commissioners, who had been sent over by the king to overawe the parliament, undertook a judicial tour through the southeastern portion of Ireland to inquire into the grievances of the people, and especially to secure grounds of complaint against the ecclesiastics so as to enable the government to overcome the opposition of the representatives in Parliament. During their journey they held sessions at Kilkenny, Waterford, Wexford, New Ross, Clonmel, and Tipperary. 
in the circumstances it is not difficult to understand how easy it was for them to find individuals ready to come forward with accusations both against the lay lords and the clergy especially as the commissioners in some cases at least suggested the points of complaint in wexford for example the crime alleged against the dean of ferns and three other priests of having pursued bulls from rome has a very suspicious ring against many individual clerics including the archbishop of cashel and the bishop of waterford the priors and heads of several religious houses and certain rectors and vicars it was alleged that they levied various exactions like the lay lords that they demanded excessive fees on the occasion of their ministrations and that they asserted claims to fishing weirs etc to which they were not entitled if it be borne in mind that the bishops priors and heads of religious houses were also landlords like the lay lords against whom charges of almost similar exactions were lodged the presentments of grievances at least in this respect were not very convincing for the same reason the fact that the archbishop of cashel was said to have been in a boat which robbed a boat from clonmel and that he caused a riot in the latter city that the bishop of waterford and lismore took bribes or that purcell the bishop of ferns joined with O'Cavanagh in an attack against fethard need not cause any surprise it was only against james butler the cistercian abbot of inislanga and his monks the augustinian monks of athassel the carmelite prayers of lady abbey near clonmel and Noctafer, and the abbot of dusk that grave charges of immorality were made even if these charges were true and the evidence is by no means convincing they serve only to emphasize the downfall of discipline caused in the individual religious houses by the interference with canonical election and the intrusion oftentimes by family influence of unworthy men as abbots or commendatory abbots henry the eighth was anxious to complete the conquest of ireland even before he had broken with the pope but after the separation of england from rome he realized more clearly the dangers that might ensue unless the Irish and Anglo-Irish princes were reduced to submission. As things stood, Ireland, instead of contributing anything, was a constant source of loss to the royal treasury, and, were an invasion attempted by some of his continental rivals, Ireland might become a serious menace to England's independence. The complete overthrow of the Geraldine Rebellion, 1535, had prepared the way for a more general advance, but the failure of the deputy to capture the young heir to the earldom of kildare was as displeasing to the king personally as it was dangerous to his plans the boy was conveyed away secretly by his tutor a priest named laverus who was advanced afterwards to the sea of kildare and was brought for safety to the territory of o'brien of thomond when thomond was threatened by the rapid advance of the deputy the young earl of kildare was conveyed to his aunt lady eleanor mccarthy of cork who on the marriage of Manus O'Donnell, Prince of Tyrconnell, brought the boy with her to Donegal, 1538. O'Connor of Offaly and O'Carroll had been compelled to sue for peace, 1535. In the following year, Lord Grey made a tour of the southeastern parts of Leinster, proceeded through Tipperary, and directed his march against the strongholds of O'Brien of Thomond. Partly by his own skill and boldness, partly by the treachery of one of the O'Briens, he succeeded in capturing some of the principal fortresses, including O'Brien's bridge. Had it not been for a mutiny that broke out among his soldiers, Lord Grey might have succeeded in forcing O'Brien to make terms, but, as it was, he was obliged to desist from further attack, and to retreat hastily to Dublin. O'Brien soon recaptured the positions he had lost. O'Connor of Offaly took the field once more and the unfortunate deputy harassed by his enemies on the privy council and blamed by the king for his failure to get possession of the hope of the geraldines found himself in the greatest difficulties but he was a man of wonderful military resource and knowing well that failure must mean his own recall and possibly his execution he determined to put forth all his energies in another great effort so long as the irish in the leinster districts were active it was little use for him to undertake dangerous expeditions towards the more remote districts and for this reason he turned his attentions to o'connor of offaly before many months elapsed he forced the mcmurroughs the cavanaghs the o'moores the o'carrolls MacGillapatrick of ossory and o'connor to sue humbly for peace but many difficulties still remained to be overcome before he could boast a final victory con o'neill manus o'donnell and many of their adherents were still threatening desmond o'brien of thomond and the nobles of munster generally could not be relied upon 
while the Irish and Anglo-Irish of Connaught paid but scanty respect to the king or his deputy. Rumors, too, were in circulation that North and South were about to unite in defense of the heir of the Geraldines, that secret communications were carried on with Scotland, France, and the Empire, and that the Pope was in full sympathy with the movement. Surrounded by discontented subordinates, who forwarded complaints almost weekly to England in the hope of securing his disgrace, Lord Grey was resolved to push forward rapidly, even though the campaign might prove risky. In 1538 he marched south and west, passed by Limerick through the territories of O'Brien and Clan Rickard to Galway, having received everywhere the submission of the princes, except of O'Brien and the Earl of Desmond. In the following year, 1539, he directed his attention towards the north, but O'Neill and O'Donnell, having composed their differences, and having strengthened themselves by an understanding with the Earl of Desmond and the adherents of the Geraldines, marched south in the hope of joining hands with their allies. Having learned when in the neighborhood of Tara that the deputy was on the march against them, they retreated towards the confines of Monaghan, where they were overtaken and routed at Bellaho, near, near Carrickmacross. 1539. Their defeat seems to have destroyed the spirit of the Irish princes. One by one they began to beg for terms, so that before Lord Grey was recalled in 1540, he had the satisfaction of knowing that he had vindicated English authority in the country. Instead of rewarding his deputy for all that he had done, Henry VIII, giving credence to the story circulated by Archbishop Brown and others that Lord Grey connived at the escape of the young Kildare and had supported the cause of Rome, committed him to the tower, and later on he handed him over to the executioner, 1541. Meanwhile, how fared it with the new archbishop, who had been sent over to enlighten the Irish nation? In July 1537, Henry felt it necessary to reprove his spiritual representative for his lightness of behavior, his vainglory, and his remissness in preaching the pure word of God, and to warn him that if he did not show himself more active both in religious matters and in advancing the king's cause, he should be obliged to put a man of more honesty in his place. The archbishop issued a form of prayer in English to be read in all the churches, extolling royal supremacy and denouncing the pope, but it produced no effect. Once, when the archbishop attended high mass in St. Andrews, the rector mounted the pulpit to read the prayer, but immediately one of the canons gave a signal to the choir to proceed, and the archiepiscopal message was lost to the congregation. In January 1538, he acknowledged that though the influence of the king ought to be greatest within the city and province of Dublin, yet, notwithstanding his gentle exhortation, his evangelical instruction, his insistence on oaths of obedience, and his threats of sharp correction, he could not induce anyone to preach the word of God or the just title of the king. The men who preached formerly till Christians were tired of them would not open their lips except in secret when they gave full vent to their opinions and thereby destroyed the fruits of the labor of their archbishop. That the observant friars were the worst offenders of all, refusing to take the oath and showing open contempt for his authority. That he could not persuade the clergy to erase the name of the Pope from the canon of the Mass and was obliged to send his own servants to carry out this work, that a papal indulgence had been published in Ireland, of which many had hastened to take advantage by fulfilling the conditions laid down, namely fasting on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, and receiving Holy Communion, and that all bishops, made by the king, except himself, were repelled to make way for those appointed by Rome. Although the chapter in Dublin had been packed carefully to prepare the way for the election of Brown, the archbishop was forced to complain that he had been withstood to his face by one of the prebendaries, James Humphrey, and that of the staff of the cathedral, twenty-eight in number. There was scarce one that favored the word of God. In a letter sent to Cromwell, 1538, Agard informed him that the power of the bishop of Rome was still strong, that the observant friars upheld it boldly, that nobody dared to say anything against them, as nearly all in authority were in favor of the Pope, except Brown, Allen, Master of the Rules, Brabazon, the Vice-Treasurer, and one or two others of no importance, and that the temporal lawyers who drew the King's fees could not be trusted. Everywhere throughout the country it was the same story. Those who should set an example to others resorted to the friars for confession, and were encouraged in their boldness. Nangle, who had been intruded into the see of Clomfort by the king, was driven out by Roland Burgo, the papal bishop, and dared not show himself in his diocese. Never was there so much Rome running in the country, 
four or five bishops together with several priors and abbots, having been appointed lately by the Pope, while friar and a bishop, probably Rory O'Donnell of Derry, who had been arrested, were tried and acquitted at Trim, because the people and authority were hypocrites and worshippers of idols. From 1536, therefore, till 1538, the new gospel had made small progress in Ireland. Had the men entrusted with this propagation been of one mind, they might have used the king's power with some effect, but the deputy, the archbishop of Dublin, and the bishop of Meath were at each other's throats almost continually. The deputy treated the archbishop with studied contempt, spoke of him as a pole-shorn friar, and obstructed his plans. According to Brown and his friends, Aylen and Brabazon, the deputy befriended the papists and the friars, knelt in prayer before the shrine of Our Lady of Trim, and supported a bishop appointed by Rome against one appointed by the king. Edward Staples, a former protégé of Cardinal Wolsey, by whom he was recommended to Rome, was appointed by the Pope to Meath in 1530. But being a steady opponent of the Geraldines, he was obliged to escape to his own country in 1534. There he took the side of the king against Clement VII, and on his return to Ireland, after he had received a sharp admonition from the king, he undertook to preach in favor of royal supremacy. But his views did not coincide with those of the Archbishop of Dublin. The latter was obliged to complain that Stables denounced him as a heretic and a beggar with other rabulous revilings, and that not content with this, he preached in the church at Kilmainham, where the stations and pardons were used as freely as ever, and attacked the Archbishop before his faith with such a stomach as I think the three-mouthed Cerberus of hell could not have uttered it more viperously. He glossed every sentence of the archbishop's sermons after such opprobrious fashion that every honest ear glowed to hear it, and he exhorted them all, yea, and so much as in him lay, he adjured them to give no credence to their spiritual guide, whatsoever he might say, for before God he would not. The Bishop of Meath replied that the Archbishop had given himself such airs that every honest man was weary of him, and that he, the Bishop, had come to the conclusion that pride and arrogance hath ravished him from the right remembrance of himself. In reply to Brown's covert hint that Staples was conniving at the authority of the Pope, the latter charged the Archbishop, whom he described as his purgatory, with abhorring the Mass, and prayed that an inquiry should be held. An attempt was made to patch up the quarrel, but the archbishop was far from content that his authority had not been upheld. For so far, the Reformation had made little or no progress in Ireland, and apparently bishops, clergy, and people were still strong on the side of Rome. But during the successful military expedition undertaken by Lord Grey into the centre, south, and west of Ireland in 1538, he claimed to have achieved great success. In March 1538, O'Connor of Offaly made a submission, promising at the same time not to admit the jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff, or to allow others to admit it. The Earl of Ormond and the Butler family, generally, were attached to the king's cause on account of their opposition to the Geraldines. O'Carroll of Ely agreed to accept the king's peace, but there is no evidence that he agreed to the king's religious program. At Limerick, according to the deputy's own story, the mayor and corporation took the oath of royal supremacy and renounced the authority of the Pope, as did also the bishop, who promised furthermore to induce his clergy to follow this example. Similarly, in Galway, he assured the king, he had sworn the mayor, corporation, and bishop to resist the usurped jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome. But as against the trustworthiness of this report, it should be remembered that it is contradicted in very important particulars by another official account of the proceedings, written by eyewitnesses, that the deputy's doings on this occasion were belittled and disparaged by the Privy Council, that Brown charged Grey with having deposed, while he was in the neighborhood of Limerick, a bishop appointed by the king to make room for a Franciscan friar provided by the Pope, and with having supported the mayor of Limerick, who was a strong adherent of the Geraldines, that according to the same authority, while Grey was in Galway, he entertained right royally a bishop, probably Roland de Burgo, who had expelled the king's presentee from the bishopric of Clonfort. And that finally, in Robert Crowley's opinion, Grey's expedition had for its object not so much the extension of the king's territory as the formation of a Geraldine League against the Irish and Anglo-Irish of the South and West to support O'Neill and O'Donnell. It is important to bear in mind that the highest English officials in Ireland at this period were divided into two factions, 
one favouring the deputy and another attempting to secure his downfall by charging him with being too friendly toward the papists and the geraldines the leaders of the latter section and according to a trustworthy witness the only men in authority who favoured the campaign against the pope were brown allen the master of the rules Brabazon, the vice-treasurer and one or two others amongst whom might be reckoned aylmer the chief justice they were annoyed at the reported success of lord grey in fifteen thirty eight and however much they tried to disparage it they felt that unless they could accomplish something remarkable for the king's cause the triumph of the deputy was assured early in december fifteen thirty eight a message had been received containing an advertisement for the setting forth of the word of god abolishing of the bishop of rome's usurped authority and extinguishing of idolatry immediately the members of the council hostile to lord grey saw their opportunity of securing a signal victory if they could not penetrate into the north or west they determined to make an excursion into the four shires above the barrow to assert the king's supremacy but also to levy the first fruits and twentieth part with other of the king's revenue leaving dublin towards the end of december they proceeded at first to carlow where they were entertained by lord james butler and thence to kilkenny where they were welcomed by the earl of ormond on new year's day the archbishop preached to a large audience setting forth the royal or rather cromwell's injunctions fifteen thirty six several copies of which were supplied to the bishops and dignitaries of the diocese for the use of the clergy something similar was done in ross wexford and waterford except that in the latter place they hanged a friar in his habit in order that his corpse should be left on the gallows for a mere to all others of his brethren to live truly next they visited clonmel in which town according to their own story they achieved their greatest success at clonmel was with us two archbishops and eight bishops in whose presence my lord of dublin preached in advancing the king's supremacy and the extinguishment of the bishop of rome and his sermon finished all the said bishops and all the open audience took the oath mentioned in the acts of parliament both touching the king's succession and supremacy before me the king's chancellor and divers others present did the like though as shall be seen there was probably some foundation for this report there are many things about it which would seem to indicate that its authors were guilty of gross exaggeration in the first place it should be noted that though it is headed the council of ireland to cromwell is signed only by brown aylen brabazon and aylmore the sworn enemies of the deputy and the very men who had denounced him for magnifying his success in the previous year secondly it deals only in generalities giving no particulars about the names of the archbishops or bishops who were alleged to have been present though such details would have been of the highest importance thirdly as can be seen from the correspondence of the period brown was not accustomed to hide his merits or his services and yet in a personal letter written to cromwell a week later he merely states that during the month he spent in munster he did not only preach and set forth the word of god but also my master the king's highness most goodly purpose lastly it should not be forgotten that though brown and his friends claimed to have been honoured with the presence of the bishops from the entire province of munster yet at that time the earl of desmond and his adherents o'brien of thomond the mccarthys and nearly all the irish and anglo-irish nobles of the province with the exception of the ormond faction which controlled only a portion of south-eastern munster were still loyal to rome the object of the report then seems to have been to destroy the influence of the deputy and the effect of his victory by showing what his opponents had effected and could effect if only their hands were not tied by the action of a superior who was leagued with the papists and the enemies of the crown any one acquainted with the miserable intrigues and petty jealousies revealed by the official correspondence of the period can have no difficulty in believing that the authors of this report would have had little scruple in departing from the truth though brown like his masters cromwell and cramner was inclined to push forward rapidly with his radical schemes of reform yet well aware of the state of feeling in dublin and throughout the country he feared to give offence by proceeding at once to extremes at first he contented himself with issuing the beads or a form of prayer for the king as supreme head of the church for prince edward for the deputy council and nobles and for the faithful departed encouraged however by the wholesale attack on images and pilgrimage shrines begun in england fifteen thirty eight he determined to undertake a similar work in ireland in the same year 
but such a work proved to be so distasteful to the people that he was obliged to deny that he had any intention of pulling down the image of Our Lady of Trim or the Holy Cross in Tipperary, though in his letter to Cromwell he admitted that his conscience would right well serve him to oppress such idols. In August of the same year, Lord Butler reported to Cromwell that the vicar of Chester announced in the presence of the deputy, the archbishop, and several members of the council that the king had commanded that images should be set up again and worshipped as before, whereupon the deputy remained silent. But some of the others answered that if the vicar were not protected by the presence of the deputy, they would put him fast by the heels, as he deserved grievous punishment. In October, Lord Grey, the Archbishop of Dublin, and others attended the sessions at Trim for the trial of a bishop and of a Franciscan friar, and, to the no small indignation of the Archbishop, Lord Grey visited the shrine of Our Lady of Trim to pray before the image. The encouragement given to Brown and his friends at Cromwell's instructions, December 1538, strengthened them to continue their campaign for the plucking down of idols and the extinguishing of idolatry. The shrine of Our Lady at Trim was destroyed, the staff of Jesus was burned publicly, the cross of Ballybogan was broken, and a special commission was established to search for and to destroy images, pictures, and relics. Even the deputy, who was accused of favoring idols and papistry, had already despoiled the Cathedral of Down, the Monastery of Cali, and the Collegiate Church of Galway. Though, in all probability, this action was taken not so much out of contempt for the practices of the Church, as with the hope of raising money to pay his troops and of securing the favor of the king. In England, Henry the Eighth had turned his attention almost immediately after the separation from Rome to the suppression of the monasteries and religious houses. This step was undertaken by him, partly because the religious orders were the strongest and most energetic supporters of the Pope, and partly, also, because he wished to enrich the royal treasury by the plunders of the goods and possessions of the monasteries. In England, however, some form of justice was observed but in Ireland no commission was appointed to report on the condition of the monasteries or convents, and no opportunity was given them to defend themselves against the slanderous statements of officials who were thirsting to get possession of their lands and their revenues. According to the estimate given by de Burgo, there were in Ireland at the time of Henry the Eighth, 231 houses of the canons regular of St. Augustine, 36 houses belonging to the Premonstratensians, twenty-two of the Knights of St. John, fourteen to the Trinitarians, or Cratched Friars, nine to the Benedictines, forty-two to the Cistercians, forty-three to the Dominicans, sixty-five to the Franciscans, twenty-six to the Hermits of St. Augustine, twenty-five to the Carmelites, and forty-three belonging to various communities of nuns. Though in many particulars the summary is far from being accurate, it may be taken as giving a fairly correct idea of the number of religious houses at the period. Many of these institutions were possessed of immense wealth, derived for the most part from lands and church patronage. According to a return drawn up in 1536, the annual revenue of the religious houses in Meath was set down at £900 Irish money, in Dublin at £900, in Louth at £600 and in Kildare at £255. If steps were taken to suppress immediately the houses within these four shires, it was reckoned that the king might secure an annual revenue of £3,000. But if the communities concerned got warning of the danger, it was thought that the king would lose £1,000 of this. By Henry's orders, steps were taken in 1536 to secure the approval of Parliament for the suppression of the monasteries, but though the Abbey of St. Wollstone, near Leakslip, belonging to the canons regular of St. Victor, was suppressed. Both the spiritual and the lay peers, together with the proctors of the clergy, offered a strenuous opposition to the attack on the religious establishments. They knew better than the English officials the work that was being done by many of these institutions for religion, education, and hospitality, as well as for the comfort of the poor and the infirm. In October 1537, however, an act was passed for the suppression of Bechtive, St. Peter's beside Trim, Dusk, Dulek, Homepatrick, Boltinglass, Togmolin, Dumbrody, Tintern, and Ballybogan. Their lands, houses, and possessions generally were to be vested in the king, and a pension was to be secured to the abbots and priors. Together with these, eight abbeys mentioned in a special commission under the great seal were suppressed. 
the other religious houses alarmed by the course of proceedings both in england and at home began to cut down the timber on their properties to dispose of their goods to hide their valuable church plate and to lease their farms urgent appeals were sent to cromwell from archbishop brown and others requesting that a commission should be issued instantly for the suppression of the monasteries and convents henry the eighth and cromwell were nothing loath to accede to these demands particularly as some of the mendicants had been very zealous in defence of the rights of the pope and accordingly a royal commission was addressed to the archbishop of dublin john allen chancellor william brabazon vice-treasurer robert cowley master of the rolls and thomas cusick empowering them to undertake the work of suppression april fifteen thirty nine from information of trustworthy persons it was stated it being manifestly apparent that the monasteries abbeys priories and other places of religious or regulars in ireland are at present in such a state that in them the praise of god and the welfare of man are next to nothing regarded the regulars and nuns dwelling there being so addicted partly to their own superstitious ceremonies partly to the pernicious worship of idols and to the pestiferous doctrines of the romish pontiff that unless an effective remedy be promptly provided not only the weak lower order but the whole irish people may be speedily infected to their total destruction by such persons to prevent such a calamity the king resolved to take into his hands the religious houses and to disband the monks and nuns for which purpose he commanded the commissioners to notify his wishes to the heads of the religious houses to receive their resignations and surrender of their property to offer to those who surrender willingly a benefice or a pension, and to apprehend and punish such as adhere to the usurped authority of the Roman pontiff, and contumaciously refuse to surrender their houses. It should be noted that, from the terms of this commission, it is clear that no serious abuses or irregularities could have been charged against the religious houses, else in the decree condemning them to extinction, something more serious would have been alleged to their charge than adherence to their own superstitious ceremonies to the worship of idols and to the roman pontiff a month later allen brabazon and cowley were appointed to survey and value the rents and revenues of the dissolved monasteries to issue leases for twenty-one years of both their spiritualities and temporalities to reserve for the king the plate jewels and ornaments and to grant to the monks and nuns pensions for their maintenance although many members of the privy council in ireland had petitioned more than once for such a commission yet when rumours reached dublin that it had been granted a request was forwarded from the council to cromwell begging him to spare st mary's abbey dublin christ's church grace dew connell kells county kilkenny and jerpoint on the ground amongst others that in them young men and children both gentlemen children and others both of mankind and womankind be brought up in virtue learning and in the english tongue and behaviour to the great charge of the said houses that is to say the womankind of the whole englishry of this land for the more part in the said nunnery and the mankind in the other said houses this petition received but scant consideration and no wonder because although the archbishop of dublin had agreed to it he wrote on the same day to cromwell asking him for the lands of grace due and according to a letter addressed to Cromwell by another prominent Irish official, the deputy at that very time had obtained from the abbot of St. Mary's leases of all the good lodgings in the monastery and of the farms at Ballet Bog Hill and Port Marnock, on an agreement evidently meant to defraud the king. Hardly had the commission been received than Brown and his companions went to work in good earnest to carry out the task entrusted to them. The superiors of most of the monasteries and convents situated within the pale or in the territories dominated by the Ormond faction, surrendered their houses at the first summons. Not even the Abbey of St. Mary's, which petitioned for mercy on the ground that it kept open house for poor men, scholars, and orphans, was spared, nor the Priory of Connell, which boasted that though it lay among the wild Irish, it had never any brethren unless they belonged to the very English nation. During the years 1539, 1540, and 1541, nearly all the monasteries and convents in the territories within the jurisdiction of the king were suppressed amongst the communities and institutions that suffered were st mary's and the abbey of st thomas the martyr the carmelite dominican and franciscan houses of dublin the hospital of st john and the augustinians and franciscans of nos the priories of connell and clane the hospital of castle dermot the dominicans of athy the franciscans of new abbey 
the Carmelites of Cloncurry, the Abbey of Baltinglass, and the College of Maynooth, the Priory of St. John in Kilkenny, together with the houses of the Franciscans and Dominicans, and the Hospital for Lepers near the same city, Jerpoint, Innistog, Kells, County Kilkenny, the Carmelites of Leyland Bridge, Noctoffer, Thurles, Clonmel, the Augustinians of Cullen, Tipperary, Fethard, the Franciscans of Cashel and Clonmel, the Monastery of Dusk, Hoare Abbey, Kilcoole and Inoslana, Mellifont, the Abbey of the Blessed Virgin Mary near Trim, and of Kells, the Priories of St. Fechan at Four, and of Mullingar, the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem at Kilmanham, together with several other religious houses at Luth, Dundalk, Drogheda, Waterford, and Carlow. At the same time, most of the convents within the English sphere of influence surrounded their houses and possessions, amongst the last to do so being the celebrated convent of Grace Dieu. As a rule, whenever a house was suppressed, a pension was assigned to the superior to be paid out of the tithes of some of the ecclesiastical livings in the gift of the monastery or priory. The amount of the pension depended to some extent upon the value of the property, which was owned by the particular house. The abbot of St. Thomas the Martyrs, Dublin, received forty-two pounds Irish, the abbot of Mellonfont, forty pounds, the prior of four, fifty pounds, the abbot of Jerpoint, ten pounds, the prioress of Grace Dieu, six pounds, the abbess of Grain, four pounds, and the prioress of Tolman Fetchen, one pound, six shillings, eight pence, etc. Grants were also made to the members of the suppressed communities, but very frequently these were very small. Of the community of Mellonfont, one received four pounds, two, three pounds, six shillings, eight pence, two, two pounds, thirteen shillings, four pence, six, two pounds, and two, one pound, while five of the community at Granard received thirteen shillings, four pence, and some from other institutions received only four pence. Many of the superiors and religious merely threw off the habit of their order to become secular clergymen and to accept a rectory or vicarage in some of the churches over which their community had enjoyed the rights of patronage. Long before the commission for suppression arrived, the scramble for a share in the plunder had begun. In this contest, the deputy, Archbishop Brown, and the principal members of the Privy Council led the way. John Aylin, master of the rolls, was the first to profit by the spoliation of the religious houses by getting possession of the property of St. Wollstone's, 1536. Lord Grey secured for himself the goods and possessions of the convent of Grain. The Earl of Ormond and the Butler family generally enriched themselves out of the lands of the monasteries situated in the southeastern portion of Ireland, as did also a host of hungry officials and gentlemen in different parts of Ireland, such as the Cowleys, Aylins, St. Leaguers, Luttrells, Plunkets, Dillons, Nugents, Prestons, Birminghams, Townleys, Aylmers, Flemings, Weisses, Eustaces, Ribazons, etc. Even Patrick Barnwell, who had resisted so strenuously the suppression of the monasteries in 1536, could not resist the temptation of sharing in the plunder. He secured for himself a large portion of the lands and advowsons of the Convent of Grace to you. In this way, the Anglo-Irish nobles were bribed into acquiescence with the king's religious policy, and were enabled to transmit to their descendants immense territories, over which they were to rule as hereditary landlords, long after the origin of their title had been forgotten. Similarly, in order to put an end to the opposition of the city authorities, which had good ground to complain of the suppressions of houses that were doing so much in the cause of charity and education, large grants were made to the corporations of Dublin, Waterford, Limerick, Clonmel, etc. Wealthy merchants who had money to invest were not slow in coming forward to secure leases of portions of the monastic land, and thereby to lay the foundations of a new so-called aristocracy. The gold and silver ornaments, the sacred vessels, the bells, and the church plate generally were sold for the benefit of the king, but the officials were never particularly careful about making the proper returns. From a partial account given by the commissioners in 1541, it appeared that from the sale of the jewels, reliquaries, pictures, and goods of the monasteries, they had received over £2,500 Irish, of which they had given close on £500 to the superiors, servants, etc., and retained £375 as travelling expenses. With the submission of the Earl of Desmond, O'Brien of Thomond, O'Donnell, etc., a more determined campaign was initiated for the total destruction of the religious houses, and particularly of those belonging to the mendicants, 
not merely in the Pale, but throughout Ireland. A special commission was issued, August 1541, to the Earl of Desmond, and others, to take inventories of, to dissolve, and to put in safe custody all religious houses in Limerick, Cork, Kerry, and Desmond. In return for his activity, the Earl of Desmond was rewarded with several grants of monastic land, and even O'Brien did not think it beneath them to share in the plunder. In some places, as for instance in Monaghan, the Franciscan friars were put to death. But in the Irish districts generally, the decree of suppression was not enforced, and even in the English portions of the country, the suppression of the monasteries did not mean the extinction of the monks. The Franciscans and Dominicans, in particular, seemed to have been almost as numerous at the end of the reign of Henry VIII as they had been before he undertook his campaign against Rome. The whole story of these sad years is summarized in a striking, if slightly exaggerated, fashion by the four masters. A heresy and new heir, they say, sprang up in England through pride, vainglory, avarice, and lust, and through many strange sciences, so that the men of England went into opposition to the Pope and to Rome. They styled the king the chief head of the Church of God in his own kingdom. New laws and statutes were enacted by the king and council according to their own will. They destroyed the orders to whom worldly possessions were allowed, namely the monks, canons, nuns, the crouched friars, and the four mendicant orders, namely the friars minor, the friars preachers, the Carmelites, and the Augustinians and the lordships and livings of all these were seized for the king. They broke down the monasteries and sold their roofs and their bells, so that from Aaron of the Saints to the Ikean Sea, there was not one monastery that was not broken and shattered, with the exception of a few in Ireland, of which the English took no notice or heed. They afterward burned the images, shrines, and relics of the saints of Ireland and England. They likewise burned the celebrated image of Mary at Trim, which used to perform wonders and miracles to heal the blind, the deaf, the crippled, and persons affected with all kinds of disease. They burned the staff of Jesus, which was in Dublin, and which wrought miracles from the time of St. Patrick, and had been in the hands of Christ while he was among men. They also appointed archbishops and bishops for themselves, and though great was the persecution of the Roman emperors against the church, scarcely had there ever come so great a persecution from Rome as this so that it is impossible to narrate or tell its description unless it should be narrated by one who saw it. The analyst might have added a fact noticed by a distinguished Protestant historian that, instead of bestowing there, of the monasteries, incomes on the amelioration of the church, or expending them in providing for the religious or secular improvement of the people, in any other way, caring little apparently for the impoverishment of the church, he, Henry the Eighth misapplied those revenues for the purposes of promoting his own gratification or enriching his favorites. End of chapter 8, part 1Chapter 8, Part 2 of History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Very early in his reign, Henry VIII had dreamt of the complete subjugation of Ireland, but it was only after the successful overthrow of the Geraldine Rebellion, 1534-5, that the realization of these dreams seemed to be within measurable reach. The boldness and military genius of Lord Leonard Grey bade fair to bring all Ireland within the sphere of English jurisdiction, until the religious crisis arose to complicate the issues. Many of the Irish princes took offense at the doctrine of royal supremacy, the attack on images, pictures, pilgrimages, relics, etc., and at the desperate efforts that were being made to drive out entirely the monks and nuns. During the years 1537 and 1538, rumors of a great confederation reached the ears of the English officials. It was represented that Con O'Neill, Manus O'Donnell, O'Brien of Thomond, the de Burgos of Connaught, and the Earl of Desmond had joined hands to protect the young Garrett Fitzgerald and to defend the authority of the Pope. Messengers, it was said, were passing constantly from Ireland to Scotland and from Scotland to Rome. It was reported in 1539 that the Irish princes regarded Henry VIII as a heretic who had forfeited all title to the Lordship of Ireland, that they were determined to uphold the authority of the Pope, 
that they expected help from the emperor from france and from scotland and that if an invasion were attempted not even the anglo-irish of the pale could be relied upon on account of their attachment to the pope and to the geraldines but the successful expeditions against both the north and south undertaken by the deputy in fifteen thirty nine seems to have put an end to all concerted defence and to have reduced the irish princes to a state of utter helplessness one after another they hastened to make their submission to accept titles and honours and money from the king and to consent to hold their territories by royal patent already in fifteen thirty four the earl of ormond had accepted the religious policy of henry the eighth and the hope of scoring a triumph over his old rivals, the Geraldines. Three years later, 1537, MacGillapatrick of Ossory promised faithfully to abolish the usurped jurisdiction of the Pope, to have the English language spoken in his territories, and to send his son to be brought up with a knowledge of the English language and customs. In return for this he received a royal grant of his land and possessions, was created baron of Colthill and Castleton, and was promised a seat in the House of Lords, a favour which he obtained in 1543, when he was appointed a peer, with the title of Baron of Upper Ossory. Brian O'Connor of Offaly and his rival, Cahir, made their submission in March 1538. They renounced the jurisdiction of the Pope, agreed to hold their lands from the King, and to abandon all claims to tribute or black rent from their neighbours of the Pale. Brian O'Connor was created Baron of Offaly. He was followed in his submission by the Earl of Desmond, 1541, MacWilliam Burke, O'Brien of Thomond, Manus O'Donnell, August 1541, and finally by Con O'Neill, 1542. All these, together with a host of minor chieftains and dependents, renounced the authority of the Pope, accepted regrants of their lands from the king, begged for English titles, and did not think it beneath their dignity to accept gifts of money and robes. Con O'Neill became Earl of Tyrone. His son Matthew, Baron of Dungannon, O'Brien, Earl of Thomond, his nephew Dono, Baron of Ibricken, MacWilliam Burke, Earl of Clan Rickard, while knighthoods were distributed freely among the lesser nobles. Although there may have existed in the minds of the Irish chieftains a certain amount of confusion about the temporal and spiritual jurisdiction of the Pope, especially as the popes seem to have claimed a peculiar sovereignty in ireland yet it is impossible to suppose that they could have acted in good faith in signing the documents of submission to which they attached their signatures that they recognized the dangerous and heretical tendencies of henry's religious policy is evident enough from the correspondence of the years fifteen thirty seven to thirty nine and that they never made any serious efforts to carry out the terms of these agreements must be admitted it is quite possible that like the noblemen of england they were personally willing to acquiesce in henry the eighth's religious policy for the sake of securing good terms for themselves but that they found it impossible to do anything on account of the opposition of the vast body of the people henry the eighth recognized that he was not in a position to enforce his authority in case of o'brien o'donnell o'neill mcwilliam burke etc and hence he advised his officials to seek to win these over by kindness and persuasion rather than by force in particular they were to endeavour to persuade them discreetly to suppress the religious houses in their territories but at the same time no attempt was to be made to press them over much in any vigorous sort o'brien of thomond and desmond were not unwilling to share in the plunder of the monasteries but as a rule the condition of affairs as regards religion was but slightly affected by the submissions of the chieftains the new deputy anthony st leger fifteen forty was well fitted to profit by the military successes of lord grey as a royal commissioner three years before he had ample opportunity of knowing the condition of ireland the characters of the principal leaders and the inducements by which they might be tempted to acknowledge the authority of the king of england he relied upon diplomatic rather than military pressure and he was so completely successful that the privy council could report in fifteen forty two that ireland was at peace already in fifteen thirty seven Aylin, the master of the rules had called the attention of the royal commissioners to the fact that many of the irish regarded the pope as the temporal sovereign of ireland and the king of england only as lord of ireland by virtue of the papal authority and advised them that henry should be proclaimed king of ireland by an act of parliament this advice was approved warmly by staples bishop of meath fifteen 
1538, and was endorsed by the deputy and council in a letter addressed to Henry VIII in December 1540. The suggestion was accepted by the king, who empowered St. Leisure to summon a parliament to give it effect, 1541. Parliament met in June 1541. How many members attended the House of Commons, or what particular districts were represented, is not known for certain, but in all probability it was only from the eastern and southern counties and cities that deputies were appointed. In the House of Lords there were present two archbishops, together with twelve bishops, the earls of Ormond and Desmond, and a number of viscounts, lords, and barons, nearly all of whom belonged to the Anglo-Irish faction. O'Brien of Thoman did not attend, but he sent deputies to represent him. O'Donnell and O'Neill held themselves aloof from the proceedings, and Dono O'Brien, McWilliam Burke, Cahir McCart Cavanagh, O'Reilly, Phelan Roe O'Neill of Clandeboy, and Cadal O'More attended in person, but were not allowed to take an active part in the proceedings or to vote. A bill was introduced by St. Leger, bestowing on Henry the Eighth the title of King of Ireland, and was read three times in the House of Lords in one day. The next day it was passed by the House of Commons. It was agreed that the monarch should be styled Henry the Eighth by the grace of God, King of England, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith and of the Church of England, and also of Ireland, on earth the supreme head. The proclamation, it was reported, was received with joyous acclamation in Dublin, where a modified general amnesty was declared in honor of the happy event. The report of what had taken place produced undoubtedly a great effect on those princes who still held aloof, so that before the end of the year 1542, even Con O'Neill had made an ignominious peace with the government. While the questions of royal supremacy and the jurisdiction of the Pope were being debated in Parliament, 1536-7, the bishops and proctors of the clergy incurred the wrath of Brown and the English officials generally by their courageous resistance to the new proposals, showing thereby that they had no sympathy with the anti-Roman measures. Nor is there any reason to suppose that any considerable body of them adopted a different attitude, though the submission of their English brethren could not have failed to produce some effect on them, particularly as some of them were Englishmen themselves, and many of them must have received their education at some of the English universities. In addition to Brown, who boasted of being only a king's bishop, the only men who can be proved to have taken an active part in propagating the new views were Edmund Staples of Meath, and Richard Nangle, the bishop whom Henry the Eighth endeavoured to intrude into Clonfort, 1536. The former of these was an Englishman, appointed by the Pope, 1529, at the request of Henry the Eighth. As might have been expected, he took the side of the king against the Earl of Kildare, and when the struggle began in Ireland between the friends and the opponents of royal supremacy in Ireland, he joined the former. Like so many of the other reformers, he showed his anxiety for the gospel by taking to himself a wife, and by appropriating for his own use the goods of the church. But there is no evidence that his efforts produced any effect on the great body of his clergy. Richard Nangle, of Clonfort, found himself opposed by Roland de Burgo, the bishop provided by the Pope to the See of Clonfort, February 1539. Brown announced that he intended personally to carry the light of the gospel wherever English was understood, and that he had secured a suffragan in the person of Dr. Nangle, Bishop of Clonfort, to set forth God's word and the king's cause in the Irish tongue. Owing to the state of open hostility existing between Brown and Staples, the archbishop did not regard the latter as a fellow laborer, but evidently at this period these were the only three bishops on whom any reliance could be placed by Henry VIII. Similarly, in a document drawn up in 1542, entitled Certain Devices for the Reformation of Ireland, Brown and Staples alone were mentioned as favouring the gospel, or as capable of instructing the Irish bishops of this realm, causing them to relinquish and renounce all popish or papistical doctrine, and to set forth within each of their dioceses the true word of God. But though none of the Irish bishops appointed by the Pope, with a single exception of Staples of Meath, took any active steps to assist the king, Few of them entered the list boldly in defense of the Roman See, and many of them, like their English brethren, tried to temporize in the hope that the storm might soon blow past. Edmund Butler, the illegitimate son of Sir Piers Butler, afterwards Earl of Ormond, seems to have joined with the rest of his family in acknowledging royal supremacy. He took a seat in the Privy Council, 
acted as intermediary between the government and the Earl of Desmond, signed as a witness the document by which the latter renounced the authority of the Pope, accepted for himself portions of the property of the suppressed Franciscan friary at Cashel, and was present at the Parliament of 1541. Hugh of Servalin of Clogger was appointed by the Pope in 1535, but he went to London in 1542 as chaplain to Con O'Neill, surrendered his bulls of appointment, took the oath prescribed by Henry VIII, and accepted a grant by royal patent of his diocese, together with a pension of forty pounds a year. Needless to say, he was repudiated by the Pope, who appointed another to take his place, and was driven from his see. John Quinn of Limerick was reported by Lord Grey to have taken the oath of royal supremacy in 1538, but the deputies' leanings towards Rome, even on this journey, were reclaimed so frequently by his opponents on the council that it would be difficult to believe him did not the name of the Bishop of Limerick appear amongst the witnesses to the submission of the Earl of Desmond. Though his attitude at this period was at least doubtful, it is certain that he stood loyal to Rome once he discovered the schismatical tendency of the new movement, since it was found necessary by the government to attempt to displace him in 1551 by the appointment of one who was likely to be more pliable. The fact that some of the bishops surrendered the religious houses of which they were commendatory priors, as, for example, Edmund Nugent of Kilmore, Milo Barron of Ossory, and Walter Wellesley of Kildare, and accepted pensions from the king as a compensation for the loss they sustained by the suppression of the monasteries, creates a grave suspicion of their orthodoxy, though it does not prove that they accepted royal supremacy. Barron was undoubtedly in close communication with the government officials, and Nugent seems to have been removed by the Pope. Again, several of the bishops, Roland de Burgo of Clomfort, Florence Kerwin of Clonmacnoise, Eugene McGuinness of Down and Connor, and Thady Reynolds of Kildare, surrendered the bulls they had received from Rome and accepted grants of their diocese from the king. Such a step, however, affords no decisive evidence of disloyalty to the Holy See. For years a sharp controversy had been waged between the kings of England and the Pope regarding the temporalities of bishoprics. The popes claimed to have the right of appointment to both the spiritualities and the temporalities, and gave expression to these claims in the bulls of appointment. The kings, on their part, asserted their jurisdiction over the temporalities, and to safeguard their rights, they insisted that the bishop-elect should surrender the papal grant in return for a royal grant. Such a custom was well known before any schismatical tendencies had made themselves felt in England, and compliance with it would not prove that the bishops involved looked upon the king as the source of their spiritual jurisdiction. The main point to be considered in case of the bishops, who surrendered their monasteries or their bulls, is what kind of oath, if any, were they obliged to take. If they consented to swear the form of renunciation prescribed for Irish bishops by the king, their orthodoxy could not well be defended. But it is possible that as Henry the Eighth did not wish to press matters to extremes with the Irish princes, he may have adopted an equally prudent policy in case of the bishops, and contented himself with the oath of allegiance. Fully cognizant of the importance of winning the bishops to his side, Henry the Eighth took care to appoint his own nominees as soon as a vacancy occurred. By doing so, he hoped to secure the submission of the clergy and people, and to obtain for himself the fees paid formerly to Rome. During the ten years between 1536 and 1546, he appointed Dominic Turry to Cork, Richard Nangle to Clonfort, Christopher Bakken, already Bishop of Kilmacduel, to Tuam, Alexander Devereux to Ferns, William Mee to Kildare, Richard O'Farrell, late prior of Granard, to Ardall, Aenys O'Herman, or Heffernan, late preceptor of Aeney, to Emley, George Dowdle, late prior of Ardy, to Armagh, Connaught O'Sigal, a chaplain of Manus Adano to Elfin, and Cornelius Odea, a chaplain of O'Brien of Thoman to Killalo. Though there can be little doubt that some of these received their appointments as a reward for their acceptance of royal supremacy, it is difficult to determine how far they were committed to the religious policy of Henry the Eighth. It is certain that none of them, with the possible exception of Nangle, took an active part in favouring the cause of the Reformation in Ireland, once they understood the real issues at stake, and that the fact of their being opposed in every single case by a lawful bishop appointed by the Pope rendered it impossible for them to do much, however willing they might have been to comply with the wishes of the king. 
During this critical period in Irish history, Pope Paul III was in close correspondence with several of the Irish bishops and lay princes. Time and again the officials in Ireland complain of the Rome runners, of the provisions made by the Pope to Irish bishoprics, of the messengers passing to and fro between Ireland and Rome, and of the Pope's cooperation in organizing the Geraldine League in 1538 and 1539. It should be noted, however, that the silly letter, attributed by Robert Ware to Paul III, wherein he is supposed to have warned O'Neill that he and his counsellors in Rome had discovered from a prophecy of St. Lazarian that whenever the church in Ireland should fall, the church of Rome should fall also, is a pure forgery, published merely to discredit the Pope and the Roman See. Undoubtedly, Paul III was gravely concerned about the progress of a movement that threatened to involve Ireland in the English schism, and was anxious to encourage the bishops and princes to stand firm in their resistance to royal supremacy. In 1539, reports reached Rome that George Cromer, the Archbishop of Armagh, who had resisted the measures directed against the Pope during the years 1536-38, to 38, had yielded. And as a result, the administration of the see was committed, 1539, to Robert Watchope, a distinguished Scotch theologian, then resident in Rome. What proofs were adduced in favor of Cromer's guilt are not known, but it is certain that the official correspondence of the period will be searched in vain for any evidence to show that Cromer accepted, either in theory or in practice, the ecclesiastical headship of Henry the Eighth. He held aloof from the meetings of the Privy Council, never showed the slightest sympathy with the action of the Archbishop of Dublin, and though his name appears on some of the lists of the spiritual peers in the Parliament of 1541, the official port of St. Leger, makes it certain that he did not attend. It is quite possible that the Archbishop did not find himself in agreement with the political schemes whereby the Irish princes and the King of Scotland were to join hands for the overthrow of English authority in Ireland, and on this account the King of Scotland was desirous of having him removed to make way for his agent at the Roman court. The new administrator of Ramal, Robert Watchup, though suffering from weak sight, was recognized as one of the ablest theologians of his day. He took a prominent part in the religious conference at Worms, 1540, and at the Diet of Ratisbon, 1541. He attended the Council of Trent during its earlier sessions and rendered very valuable assistance, particularly in connection with the decrees on justification. The date of his consecration cannot be determined with certainty. Probably he was not consecrated until news of the death of Cromer, 1543, reached Rome. In 1549 he set out for Scotland, and apparently landed on the coast of Donegal, in the hope of inducing O'Neill and O'Donnell to cooperate with the French and the Scots. His efforts were not, however, crowned with success. Finding himself denounced to the government by O'Neill and by George Dowdle, who had been appointed to the See of Armagh by the king, he returned to Rome, where he was granted faculties as legate to Ireland, but he died in a few months before he could make any attempt to regain possession of his diocese. Before the death of Cromer, Henry the Eighth, against the wishes of some members of his council in Ireland, who favoured the nomination of the son of Lord Delvin, had selected George Dowdle, late prior of R.D., to succeed him in Armagh. Dowdle went to London in company with Con O'Neill, and received from the king a yearly pension of twenty pounds, together with the promise of the Archbishopric of Armagh. Though he must have given satisfactory assurances to the king on the question of royal supremacy, Dowdle was still in his heart a supporter of Rome, and as shall be seen, he left Ireland for a time rather than agree to the abolition of the Mass and the other sweeping religious innovations that were undertaken in the reign of Henry the Sixth. At the urgent request of Robert Watchup, Paul III determined to send some of the disciples of St. Ignatius to Ireland to encourage the clergy and people to stand firm in defense of their religion. St. Ignatius himself drew up a set of special instructions for the guidance of those who were selected for this important mission. The two priests appointed for the work, Pascasius Broet and Alphonsus Salmeron, together with Franciscus Zapata, who offered to accompany them, reached Scotland early in February 1541, and, having fortified themselves by letters of recommendation from the King of Scotland, addressed to O'Neill and others, they landed in Ireland about the beginning of Lent. Their report speaks badly for the religious condition of the country at the period. They could not help noting the fact that all the great princes, with one exception, had renounced the authority of the Pope, and had refused to hold any communications with them. 
that the pastors had neglected their duty, and that the people were rude and ignorant, though at the same time not unwilling to listen to their instructions. In many particulars this unfavorable report was well founded, especially in regard to the nobles, but it should be remembered that these Jesuits remained only a few weeks in the country, that they were utterly unacquainted with the manners and customs of the people, and that it would have been impossible for them to have obtained reliable information about the religious condition of Ireland in the course of such a short visit. It should be noted, too, that they placed the responsibility for the failure of their mission on the King of Scotland, who failed to stand by his promises. During the last years of Henry the Eighth's reign, St. Leisure, continued his efforts to reduce the country to subjection, not by force, but by persuasion. The religious issue was not put forward prominently, and with the exception of grants of monastic lands and possessions, very little seems to have been done. The deputy's letters contained glowing reports of his successes. In, in the course of the warm controversy that raged between him and John Aylin, the Chancellor during the years 1546 and 1547, the various reports forwarded to England are sufficient to show that outside the pale the English authorities had made little progress. Although St. Leger was able to furnish a striking testimony from the Council as to his success, and although a letter was sent by the Irish princes in praise of Henry the Eighth, 1546, proofs are not wanting that Henry's policy had met with only partial success. According to a letter sent by Archbishop Brown in 1546, the Irish people were not reconciled to English methods of government, and according to the Chancellor, the King's writ did not run in the Irish districts. The Irishmen who pretended to submit did not keep to their solemn promises. They still followed their own native laws, regardless of English statutes, and the King could not get possession of the abbeys or abbey lands situated within their territories. Even the council, which sought to defend the deputy against these attacks, was forced to admit that His Majesty's laws were not current in the Irish districts. One of the last steps taken by the council, at the suggestion of Henry VIII, was the appointment of a vice-regent in spirituals, for the clergy, to grant dispensations, as they were granted in England by Cranmer, so as to prevent the Irish from having recourse to Rome for such grants. Henry the Eighth died with the knowledge that he had done more than any of his predecessors for the subjugation of Ireland. The policy that was devised, writes Cusack, Lord Chancellor of Ireland, for the sending of the Earls of Desmond, Thomond, Clan Rickard, and Tyron, and the Baron of Upper Ossory, O'Carroll, MacGenis, and others into England, was a great help of bringing those countries to good order, for none of them who went into England committed harm upon the King's Majesty's subjects. The winning of the Earl of Desmond was the winning of the rest of Munster, with small charges. The making of O'Brien an Earl made all that country obedient. The making of MacWilliam, Earl of Clan Rickard, made all that country during his time obedient as it is now. The making of MacGillapatrick, Baron of Upperossery, hath made his country obedient, and the having their lands by Dublin is such a gauge upon them as they will not forfeit the same through willful folly. As far as religion was concerned, however, there was very little change. The Mass was celebrated and the sacraments were administered as before. Here and there some of the bishops and clergy might have been inclined to temporize on the question of royal supremacy, but whatever documents they might have signed, or whatever appointments they might have accepted from Henry's agents, the vast body of the princes, bishops, clergy, and people had no desire to separate themselves from the universal church. Henry the Eighth had, however, rendered unintentionally an immense service to religion in Ireland by preparing the way for the destruction of royal interference in Episcopal and other ecclesiastical appointments, and of the terrible abuse of lay patronage that had been the curse of the Catholic Church in Ireland for centuries. All these abuses having been transferred to the small knot of English officials and Anglo-English residents who coalesced to form the Protestant sect, the Catholic Church was at last free to pursue her peaceful mission without let or hindrance from within. The accession of Edward the Sixth made no notable change in Irish affairs. The deputy, St. Leger, was retained in office, as were also most of the old officials. Some new members, including George Dowdle, Archbishop of Armagh, were added to the council, and arrangements were made for the collection of the revenues from the suppressed monasteries and religious houses. A royal commission was issued to the deputy, the Lord Chancellor, and the Bishop of Meath, to grant faculties and dispensations in as ample a manner as the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
from the terms of this commission it is clear that the royal advisers were determined to derive some financial profit from the royal supremacy the fee for dispensations for solemnizing marriage without the proclamation of the bans was fixed at six shillings eight pence about three pounds four shillings for marriage within the prohibited times at ten shillings for marriage within the prohibited times and without bans at thirteen shillings four pence and for marriages to be celebrated without the parish church of the contracting parties at five shillings similarly an order was sent that the plate and ornaments of st patrick's cathedral should be dispatched by some trustworthy messenger to bristol there to be delivered to the treasurer of the mint this command must not have been carried out completely because seven months later january fifteen forty eight the dean of st patrick's was requested to deliver over for the use of the mint the one thousand ounces of plate of crosses and such like things that remained in his hands from the very beginning of edward's reign the protector set himself to overthrow the catholic church in ireland by suppressing the mass and enforcing the lutheran or rather the calvinist teaching regarding transubstantiation and the real presence of christ in the eucharist the injunctions of edward the sixth and the homilies of cramner were dispatched for the guidance of the archbishop of dublin and of those who like him were supposed to favor religious innovations in like manner the english communion service fifteen forty eight and the first book of common prayer fifteen forty nine were made obligatory in those districts where the english language was spoken or understood as in england the great subject of controversy in ireland during the early years of edward's reign was the blessed eucharist a scotch preacher had been sent into ireland during the year fifteen forty eight to prepare the way for the abolition of the mass by attacking the real presence of christ in the sacrament of the altar the archbishop of dublin who had been noted previously for his radical tendencies objected to such doctrines and complaints were forwarded against him to the council he was charged with having leased or otherwise disposed of the greater portion of the property of his diocese to his children and favourites with having failed to set forth his majesty's injunctions and homilies with having calumniated the deputy and held secret communications with the earl of desmond and other irish princes and with having neglected to preach a single sermon between november fifteen forty seven and september fifteen forty eight when he took occasion to inveigh against the scotch preacher who condemned the abuse of the bishop of rome's masses and ceremonies about the same time the deputy felt obliged to reprove the treasurer of christ's church for having refused to allow the english communion service to be followed in that church and to warn him of the punishment in store for him if he persisted in his obstinacy but if brown were somewhat backward in adapting himself to the new theories his rival staples of meath who had prided himself hitherto on his conservative tendencies hastened to the relief of the government he went to dublin to support the scotch preacher in his attack on the mass and the blessed eucharist but if we are to believe his own story his stay in dublin was hardly less agreeable than was the welcome that awaited him on his return to meath his friends assured him that the country was up in arms against him a lady whose child he had baptized and named after himself sought to change the name of her baby for she would not have him bear the name of a heretic a gentleman would not permit his child to be confirmed by one who had denied the sacrament of the altar many people who heard that the bishop was going to preach at navan the following sunday declared their intention of absenting themselves lest they should learn heresy a clergyman of his own promotion came to him in tears and having asked permission to speak his mind freely informed him that he was detested by the people since he had taken the side of the heretics and preached against the eucharist and saints that the curses poured out upon him were more numerous than the hairs of his head and that he would do well to take heed as his life was in danger sir edward bellingham succeeded st leger as deputy and arrived in may fifteen forty eight during the early months of his term of office he was busily engaged against the o'connors of offaly the o'carrolls and others who threatened the pale once more his efforts were crowned with considerable success and during the year fifteen forty nine he found himself in a position to push forward with the religious campaign from inquiries made he learned that in all munster thoming connaught and ulster the monasteries and other religious establishments remained and that they followed still the old religious practices he wrote to the secretary of the protector asking him to inform his master of the lack of good shepherds in ireland to illuminate the hearts of the flock of christ with his most true and infallible word 
taking care at the same time to recommend the protector to appoint the clergymen who had been brought over from england to vacant bishoprics so that the public funds might be relieved by the withdrawal of their pensions the mayor and corporation of kilkenny were ordered to see that the priests of the city should assemble to meet the deputy and members of the council they promised that all the clergy should be present without fail but as shall be seen the instructions of sir edward bellingham and his colleagues produced but little effect even in the very stronghold of the ormonds fifteen forty nine walter cowley was sent on a commission into the diocese of cashel to abolish idolatry papistry the mass sacrament and the like but he complained that the archbishop instead of being present to assist him tarried in dublin although he had been warned that his presence was required the truth is that though the archbishop as one of the butlers was willing to go to great lengths in upholding the policy of edward the sixth he had no intention of taking part in a campaign against the mass or the blessed eucharist the latter written by this prelate february fifteen forty eight in which he praised highly the conduct of walter cowley who played such a prominent part in the suppression of the monasteries and the seizure of ecclesiastical property is often quoted as a proof that he was strongly in favour of the reformation but such a statement could be made only by one who has failed to understand the difference between ormondism and protestantism and the relations of both cowley and the archbishop to the former bellingham was recalled to england in fifteen forty nine and soon after his departure new disturbances broke out in ireland desmond and o'brien were regarded as unreliable a union between the two great rival families of the ormonds and the desmonds was not improbable and to make matters worse news arrived in dublin that robert watchup the papal archbishop of armagh had arrived in the north to bring about a league between o'donnell o'neill the scotch and the french fifteen fifty dowdle who had been introduced into armagh by royal authority reported the presence of his rival in Innishowen, and o'neill and manus o'donnell pledged themselves to resist the invaders a council hastened to thank the northern chieftains for their refusal to hold correspondence with the french emissaries who had accompanied watchup and warned them that the french intended to reduce the irish to a state of slavery and that the french nobility were so savage and ferocious that it would be much better to live under the turkish yoke than under the rule of france in july fifteen fifty st leger was sent once more as deputy to ireland he was instructed to set forth god's service according to our the king's ordinances in england and all places where the inhabitants or a convenient number of them understand that tongue where the inhabitants did not understand it the english is to be translated truly into the irish tongue till such time as the people might be brought to understand english but as usual the financial side of the reformation was not forgotten the deputy was commanded to give orders that no sale or alienation be made of any church goods bells or chantry and free chapel lands without the royal assent and that inventories were to be made in every parish of such goods ornaments jewels and bells of chantry or free chapel lands and of all other lands given to any church lest some lewd persons might embezzle the same on his arrival in dublin st leger found affairs in very unsatisfactory condition i never saw the land he wrote so far out of good order for in the forts there are as many harlots as soldiers and there was during these three years no kind of divine service neither communion nor yet other service having but one sermon made in that space which the bishop of meath made who had so little reverence at that time as he had no great haste since to preach there rumours were once more afloat that the french and scotch were about to create a diversion in ireland a large french fleet was partially wrecked off the irish coast and some of the geraldine agents in paris boasted openly that the irish princes were determined to either stand or die for the maintenance of religion and for the continuance of god's service in such sort as they had received it from their fathers while st leger was not slow in taking measures to resist a foreign invasion he did not neglect the instructions he had received about introducing the book of common prayer in place of the mass he procured several copies of the english service and sent them to different parts of the country but instead of having it translated into irish he had it rendered into latin for the use of those districts which did not understand english and the hope possibly that he might thereby deceive the people by making them believe that it was still the mass to which they had been accustomed apparently however the new liturgy met with a stubborn resistance 
In Limerick, although the city authorities were reported to be favourable, the bishop, John Quinn, refused to give his consent to the proposed change, and throughout the country generally the deputy was forced to confess that it was hard to plant the new religion in men's minds. He requested that an express royal command should be addressed to the people generally to accept the change, and that a special commission should be given to himself to enforce the liturgy. The formal order for the introduction of the English service was forwarded to St. Leisure in February 1551, and was promulgated in the beginning of March. Bishop Quinn of Limerick was forced to resign the temporalities of his see to make way for William Casey, who was expected to be more compliant. A number of bishops and clergy were summoned to meet in conference in Dublin to consider the change. At this conference the reforming party met with the strongest opposition from the primate of Armagh. Although George Dowdle had accepted the primatial see from the hands of the king and had tried to unite loyalty to Rome and to Henry VIII, he had no intention of supporting an heretical movement, having for its object the abolition of the mass. From the very beginning of the protector's rule, he had adopted an attitude of hostility to the proposed changes, as is evident from the friendly letter of warning addressed to him by the Lord Deputy Bellingham. The primate defended steadfastly the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome, and refused to admit that the king had any authority to introduce such sweeping reforms by virtue of his office. Finding that his words failed to produce any effect on the deputy, he left the conference, together with his suffragans, except staples of Meath, and repaired to his own diocese to encourage the people and clergy to stand firm. St. Leger, then, handed the royal commission to Brown, who declared that he submitted to the king, as Jesus Christ did to Caesar, in all things just and lawful, making no question why or wherefore, as we own him our true and lawful king. Though St. Leger pretended to be a strong supporter of the new religion, Yet, according to Archbishop Brown, he contented himself with the formal promulgation of the royal orders. He himself, on his arrival in Ireland, assisted publicly at Mass in Christ's Church, to the comfort of his, too many like Papists, and to the discouragement of the professors of God's Word. He allowed the celebration of Mass, holy water, candlemas candles, and such like, to continue in the diocese of the primate, and elsewhere without protest or punishment. He seemed, even, to take the side of the primate at the council board, and sent a message to the Earl of Tyrone, to follow the counsel and advice of that good father, sage senator, and godly bishop, my lord primate, in everything. He went so far as to present the Archbishop of Dublin with a number of books written in defense of the Mass and transubstantiation, and when the Archbishop ventured to remonstrate with him on his want of zeal for God's word, the only reply he received was, Go to, go to, your matters of religion will mar all. St. Leger's main object was the pacification of the country and the extension of English power, both of which, he well knew, would be endangered by an active campaign against the Mass. St. Leger was recalled, and Sir James Crofts, who had been sent on a special commission to Ireland a few months earlier, was appointed deputy in his place, April 1551. His instructions in regard to the Book of Common Prayer and the inventory of the confiscated church plate were couched in terms similar to those given to his predecessor. Anxious from the beginning to conciliate Primate Dowdle, he forwarded to him a respectful letter, June 1551, calling his attention to the respect paid by Christ himself and St. Peter to the imperial authority, offering his services as mediator between the primate and his opponents, Brown and Staples, and warning him of the likelihood of much more serious changes which he, the deputy, pledged himself, if possible, to resist. To this communication the primate sent an immediate reply, in which he offered to meet his opponents, in conference, though he could hold out no hope of agreement, as their judgments, opinions, and consciences were different. The conference took place at St. Mary's Abbey, in the presence of the deputy. The Archbishop of Dublin, Staples of Meath, and Thomas Lancaster, who had been intruded into the Sea of Kildare by royal authority, attended to defend the new teaching against the primate. The subjects discussed were the Mass and the Blessed Virgin. Staples took the leading part on the side of the reformers, and, as Dowdle had anticipated, no agreement could be arrived at. The primate appealed to the terms of the oath of loyalty to the Pope, taken by both himself and his opponents at their consecration, but Staples had no difficulty in proclaiming that he refused to consider himself bound by this oath. 
The meeting broke up without any result. Dowdle, having forwarded a declaration to the Lord Chancellor that he could never be bishop where the Holy Mass was abolished, fled from Ireland. Brown wrote immediately to the Earl of Warwick, beseeching him to confer on Dublin all the primatial rights enjoyed hitherto by Armagh, while the deputy sought for instructions about the vacant see of Armagh, in November 1551. Dowdle was deprived of his diocese, and the primacy was transferred to Dublin, 1551. Still, Cross was forced to admit that the Reformation was making but little progress in Ireland. The bishops and clergy gave him no support, and in spite of all he could do, the old ceremonies were continued. He besought his friends in England to send over reliable men from England to fill the vacant bishoprics, and to set forth the king's proceeding, or if they could not do that, to send some learned men to remain with him, by whose counsel he might better direct the blind and obstinate bishops. The sees of Armagh, Cashel, and Ossory were then vacant, and, as a deputy pointed out, it was of vital importance to the reformers that reliable priests should be appointed. Cranmer nominated four clerics for the see of Armagh, from whom the king selected Richard Turner, a vicar in Kent, but he declined the honour, preferring to run the risk of being hanged by rebels than to go to Armagh, where he should be obliged to preach to the walls and the stalls, for the people understand no English. Cramner tried to reassure him by reminding him that if he will take the pains to learn the Irish tongue, which with diligence he may do in a year or two, then both his doctrines shall be more acceptable not only unto his diocese, but also throughout all Ireland. Notwithstanding this glorious prospect, Turner remained obdurate in his refusal, and at last Armagh was offered to and accepted by one new Goodacre. Cashel was, apparently, considered still more hopeless, and as nobody upon whom the government could rely was willing to take the risk, the see was left vacant during the remainder of Edward the Sixth reign. Though Cross was strongly in favour of the new religion, he had the temerity to suggest that Thomas Leverus, the tutor and former protector of the young heir of Kildare, should be appointed to Cashel or Ossory. For learning discretion and good living, he wrote, he is the meekest man in this realm, and best able to preach both in the English and the Irish tongue. I heard him preach such a sermon as, in my simple opinion, I heard not in many years. But as Leverus was well known to be not only a Geraldine, but also a strong papist, the deputy's recommendation was set at naught, and the see of Ossery was conferred on John Bale. The latter was an ex-Carmelite friar, who, according to himself, was won from the ignorance and blindness of papistry by a temporal lord although, according to others, his wife Dorothy had as great a hand in that happy work as the Lord. On account of his violent and seditious sermons, he was thrown into prison, from which he was released by Cromwell, with whom he gained great favour by a scurrilous and abusive plays directed against the doctrines and practices of the church. On the fall of his patron in 1540, Bale found it necessary to escape with his wife and children to Germany, whence he returned to England after the death of Henry the Eighth. He was a man of considerable ability, with little regard for truth if he could increase the enemies of popery, and so coarse and vulgar in his language and ideas that his works have been justly described by one whose Protestantism cannot be questioned as a dunghill. The consecration of Goodacre and Bale was fixed for February 1553, and the consecrating prelates were to be Brown, Lancaster, who had been intruded by the king into Kildare, and Eugene Maginus of Down. At the consecration ceremony itself, a peculiar difficulty arose. Although the first book of common prayer had been legalized in Ireland by royal proclamation, the ordinal and the second book of common prayer had never been enforced by similar warrant, and their use was neither obligatory nor lawful. Bale demanded, however, that they should be followed. When the Dean of Christ's Church insisted on the use of the Roman ordinal, he was denounced by the bishop-elect as an ass-headed dean and a blockhead who cared only for his belly and when Brown ventured to suggest that the ceremony should be delayed until a decision could be sought, he was attacked as an apicure, whose only object was to take up the proxies of any bishopric to his own gluttonous use. The violence of Bale carried all before it, even to the concession of common bread for the communion service. Goodacre was by English law the Archbishop of Armagh, but the threatening attitude of Shane O'Neill prevented him from ever having the pleasure of seeing his own cathedral. Bale was, however, more fortunate. He made his way to Kilkenny, where he proceeded to destroy the images and pictures in St. Canisses, and to rail against the Mass and the Blessed Eucharist, 
but only to find that his own chapter, the clergy, and the vast majority of the people were united in opposition to him. End of chapter 8, part 2Chapter 9, Part 1 of The History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Church in Ireland during the reigns of Mary and Elizabeth, 1553-1603. The death of Edward VI, 6 July 1553, and the accession of Queen Mary put an end for the time being to the campaign against the Catholic Church. The party of the Earl of Northumberland made a feeble attempt in Ireland, as they had done in England, to secure the succession for Lady Jane Grey, but their efforts produced no effect. On the 20th July, the Privy Council in England sent a formal order for the proclamation of Queen Mary, together with an announcement that she had been proclaimed already in London as Queen of England, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith and on earth supreme head of the churches of England and Ireland. This command was obeyed promptly in Dublin and in the chief cities in Ireland. In Kilkenny, Lord Mountgarrett and Sir Richard Health ordered that a mass of thanksgiving should be celebrated, and when Bale refused to allow such idolatry, they informed the clergy that they were no longer bound to obey the bishop. Mary was proclaimed in Kilkenny, 20th August, and on the following day the clergy and people took possession of the Cathedral of St. Canice. Crowds of the citizens proceeded to attack the palace of the bishop, so that it was only with the greatest difficulty that the mayor of Kilkenny was able to save his life by sending him to Dublin at night, under the protection of an armed escort. From Dublin, Bale succeeded in making his escape to Holland, from which he proceeded to Basel, where he spent his time in libeling the Catholic religion and the Irish clergy and people. Shortly after the coronation of Queen Mary, Sir Thomas St. Leger was sent over to Ireland as deputy, with instructions that he was to take steps immediately for the complete restoration of the Catholic religion. Primate Dowdle was recalled from exile and restored to a see of Armagh. The primacy, which had been taken from Armagh in the previous reign, owing to the hostile attitude adopted by Dowdle towards the religious innovations, was restored, and various grants were made to him to compensate for the losses he had sustained. In April 1554, a royal commission was issued to Dowdle and William Walsh, formerly prior of the Cistercian Abbey at Bechtive, to remove the clergy who had married from their benefices. In virtue of this commission, Brown of Dublin, Staples of Meath, Thomas Lancaster of Kildare, and Travers, who had been intruded into the See of Leland, were removed. Bale of Ossory had fled already, and Casey of Limerick also succeeded in making his escape. O Servalin of Clogger, who had been deposed by the Pope, was driven from his diocese, and an inquiry was set on foot at Lambeth Palace before Cardinal Pole to determine who was the lawful Archbishop of Tuam. Christopher Bodkin, Bishop of Kilmacdua, had been appointed to Tuam by the King in 1536, while two years later Arthur O'Frigal, a canon of Rapo, received the same see by papal provision. At the inquiry before Cardinal Pole, it was proved that though Bodkin had contracted the guilt of schism, he had done so more from fear than from conviction, that he had been always a stern opponent of heresy, and that in the city and diocese of Tuam the new opinions had made no progress. Apparently, as a result of the inquiry, an agreement was arranged whereby Bodkin was allowed to retain possession of Tuam. The other bishops were allowed to retain their sees without objection, a clear proof that their orthodoxy was unquestionable. In place of those who had been deposed, Hugh Kerwin, an Englishman, was appointed to Dublin, William Walsh, one of the royal commissioners, to Meath, Thomas Leverus, the former tutor of the young Garrett Fitzgerald, to Kildare, Thomas O'Fihill, an Augustinian hermit, to Leland, and John O'Tonnery, a canon regular of St. Augustine, to Ossory, while John Quinn of Limerick, who had been forced to resign, the See of Limerick during the reign of Edward the Sixth, was apparently restored. The selection of Kerwin to fill the Archiepiscopal See of Dublin was particularly unfortunate, However learned he might have been, or however distinguished his ancestry, he was not remarkable for the fixity of his religious principles. During the reign of Henry the Eighth, he had acquired notoriety by his public defense of the royal divorce, as well as by his attacks on papal supremacy, though, like Henry, he was a strong upholder of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and of transubstantiation. 
like a true courtier he changed his opinions immediately on the accession of queen mary and he was rewarded by being promoted to dublin and appointed lord chancellor of ireland fifteen fifty five the cathedral chapter of st patrick's that had been suppressed was restored to its pristine state new dignitaries and canons were appointed and much of the possessions that had been seized were returned the mass and catholic ceremonies were restored without any opposition in those churches in dublin and leinster into which the english service had been introduced a provincial synod was held in dublin by the new archbishop fifteen fifty six to wipe out all traces of heresy and schism primate dowdle had convoked previously a synod of the northern provinces at drogheda to undertake a similar work in this assembly it was laid down that all priests who had attempted to marry during the troubles of the previous reign should be deprived of their benefices and suspended that the clergy who had adopted the heretical rites in the religious celebrations and in the administration of the sacraments should be admitted to pardon in case they repented of their crimes and could prove that their fall was due to fear rather than conviction that all the ancient rites and ceremonies of the church in regard to crosses images candles thuribles canonical hours mass the administration of the sacraments fast days holy days holy water and blessed bread should be restored that the book of common prayer etc should be burned and that the primate and the bishops of the province should appoint inquisitors in each diocese to whom the clergy should denounce those who refused to follow the catholic worship and ceremonies arrangements were also made to put an end to abuses in connection with the bestowal of benefices on laymen and children with the appointment of clerics to parishes and dignities by the holy see on the untrustworthy recommendation of local noblemen with the excessive fees charged by some of the clergy with the neglect of those whose duty it was to contribute to repairs of the parish churches and with the failure of some priests to wear a becoming clerical dress in july fifteen fifty six lord fitzwalter was sent to ireland as deputy our said deputy and council according to the royal instructions shall by their own good example and all other good means to them possible advance the honour of almighty god the true catholic faith and religion now by god's great goodness and special grace recovered in our realms of england and ireland and namely they shall set forth the honour and dignity of the pope's holiness and apostolic see of rome and from time to time be ready with our aid and secular force at the request of all spiritual ministers and ordinaries there to punish and repress all heretics and lollards and their damnable sects opinions and errors they were commanded too to assist the commissioners and officials whom cardinal pole as papal legate intended to send shortly to make a visitation of the clergy and people of ireland on the arrival of the new deputy in dublin he went in state to christ church to assist at mass after the celebration of which he received the sword of state from his predecessor before the altar and took the oath in presence of the archbishop that done the trumpets sounded and drums beat and then the lord deputy kneeled down before the altar until the te deum was ended the new deputy was instructed to take measures for summoning a meeting of parliament in the following year to give legal sanction to the restoration of the catholic religion and to deal with the ecclesiastical property that had been seized possibly in the hope of securing some of these again for the church a commission was issued to the archbishop of dublin the bishop of kildare and a number of clerics and laymen to inquire concerning the chalices crosses ornaments bells and other property belonging to the parish churches or chapels in the country of the city and county of dublin and of sales made thereof to any person or persons the price in whose hands they then remained and also in whose possession were the houses lands and tenements belonging to those churches similar commissions were issued to others for the counties of drogheda and louth kildare carlow wexford kilkenny meath westmeath waterford tipperary limerick cork and for the county of connaught in june fifteen fifty seven the irish parliament met a bull of absolution from the penalties of heresy and schism was read by the archbishop of dublin on bended knees while the lord deputy officials and members both peers and commoners knelt around him when this ceremony was finished all retired to the cathedral where the te deum was sung in thanksgiving and all pledged themselves as a sign of their sincere repentance to abolish all the laws that had been passed against the holy see the acts prejudicial to the rights of the pope enacted since the year fifteen twenty nine were abolished 
the title of supreme head of the church, it was declared, never was or could be justly or lawfully attributed or acknowledged to any king or sovereign governor, nor in any wise could or might rightly, justly or lawfully, by the king or sovereign governor of the same realms, be claimed, challenged, or used. All bulls, dispensations, and privileges obtained before the year 1529, or at any time since, or which shall hereafter be obtained from the see of Rome, not containing matter contrary or prejudicial to the authority, dignity, or preeminence, royal or imperial, of these said realms, or to the laws of this realm, were allowed to be put in execution, used, and alleged in any civil court in Ireland and elsewhere. The jurisdiction of the bishops was restored. The laws against heresy passed in the reign of Richard the Second and Edward the Fourth were renewed, and the payments of first fruits was suppressed. Care was taken, however, to avail of the dispensation granted by the Holy See, whereby those who had obtained possession of the property of churches and monasteries should not be disturbed, although it was enacted that none of the laymen who had obtained such grants could plead the rights of exemption enjoyed by some of their former owners against the jurisdiction of the bishops, and that notwithstanding the statutes of Mortmain, those who then held manors, tenements, personages, tithes, pensions, or other hereditaments, might bequeath or devise them to any spiritual body, corporate in the kingdom, such clause to have the force of law for twenty years. From no quarter was the slightest opposition offered to the restoration of Catholic worship, and consequently there was no need to have recourse to persecution. There was no persecution of the Protestants of Ireland by fire or torture during this reign. In truth, the Reformation, not having been sown in Ireland, there was no occasion to water it by the blood of martyrs, insomuch that several English families, friends to the Reformation, withdrew into Ireland as into a secure asylum, where they enjoyed their opinions and worship in privacy without notice or molestation. Yet in spite of this tolerant attitude of both the officials and people of Ireland, an absurd story, first mentioned in a pamphlet printed in 1681, is still to be found in many books dealing with Mary's reign. According to this story, the Queen appointed a body of commissioners to undertake a wholesale persecution in Ireland, and she entrusted this document to one of the commissioners, a certain Dr. Cole. On his way to Ireland, the latter tarried at Chester, where he was waited upon by the mayor, to whom he confided the object of his mission. The landlady of the inn, having overheard the conversation, succeeded in stealing the commission and replacing it by a pack of cards. Dr. Cole reached Dublin and hastened to meet the Lord Deputy in Council. After he had made a speech relating upon what account he came over, he presents the box unto the Lord Deputy, who causing it to be opened that the secretary might read the commission, there was nothing but a pack of cards, with a knave of clubs uppermost. Dr. Cole assured them that, he had a commission, but knew not how it was gone. Then the Lord Deputy made answer, Let us have another commission, and we will shuffle the cards in the meanwhile. The messenger returned promptly to England, and coming to the court, obtained another commission, but staying for a wind at the waterside, news came unto him that the Queen was dead, and thus God preserved the Protestants of Ireland. This ridiculous fabrication was first referred to in a pamphlet written by that well-known forger, Robert Ware, in 1681, and was reprinted in his Life of Archbishop Brown, 1705. Its acceptance by later writers, in spite of its obvious silliness, and unsupported as it is by the official documents of the period, or by any contemporary authority, can be explained only by their religious prejudices. But though Mary restored the Mass and reasserted the jurisdiction of the Pope, her political policy in Ireland differed little from that of her father or her brother. She was as determined as had been Henry the Eighth to bring the country under English law, and to increase thereby the resources of the treasury. It is true that she allowed the young Garrett Fitzgerald, who had found a refuge in Rome, to return to the country, that she restored him to his estates, and honored him with a seat at the Privy Council. Brian O'Connor of Offaly was also released from prison and allowed to revisit his territories. During the time St. Leger held office, he followed the old policy of strengthening English influence by conciliation rather than by force. But the Earl of Sussex was of a different mind. He marshaled his forces and made raids into the Irish districts for the princes and inhabitants of which he entertained the most supreme contempt. It was during the reign of Mary that the plan of the English plantations was first put into force by the removal of the native Irish from large portions of Leeks and Offaly to make room for English settlers. And yet, in spite of the warlike expeditions of Sussex, the country went from bad to worse, 
so that primate Dowdle could write to the Privy Council in England, 1557, that this poor realm was never in my remembrance, in worse case than it is now, except the time only that O'Neill and O'Donnell invaded the English Pale, and burned a great piece of it. The North is as far out of frame as it was before, for the Scots beareth as great rule as they do wish, not only in such lands as they did lately usurp, but also in Clandeboy. The O'Moores and O'Connors have destroyed and burned leaks, and awfully saving certain forts. On the death of Queen Mary in November 1558, her sister Elizabeth succeeded to the English throne. Although she had concealed carefully her Protestant sympathies, and had even professed her sincere attachment to the old religion during the reign of her predecessor, most people believed that important changes were pending. As soon as news of her early proclamation reached Ireland early in December, the small knot of officials, who had fallen into disgrace during the reign of the late queen, hastened to offer their congratulations, and to put forward their claims for preferment. Sir John Aylin, formerly Lord Chancellor and Chief Commissioner for the dissolution of the monasteries, wrote to Cecil to express his joy at the latter's promotion, enclosed, a token, and reminded him of what he, Aylin, had suffered during the previous five years. Sir John Bagenall, ex-governor of Leeks and Offaly, recalled the fact that he had lost heavily and had been obliged to escape to France for resisting papal supremacy. He petitioned for a free farm worth fifty pounds a year. Bishop Staples, in a letter to Cecil, took pains to point out that he had been deprived of his see on account of his marriage, and had incurred the personal enmity of Cardinal Pole, because he resumed to pray for his old masters, Henry the Ace Soul. For some time, however, no change was made, and Catholic worship continued even in Dublin, as in the days of Queen Mary. The Lord Deputy Sussex went to England in December 1559, and entrusted the sword of state to the Archbishop of Dublin and Sir Henry Sidney, both of whom took the oath of office before the high altar in Christ Church, after Mass had been celebrated in their presence. But the strong anti-Catholic policy of the new government soon made itself felt in England, and though the ministers were more guarded as far as Ireland was concerned, it was felt that something should be done there to lessen the influence of Rome. In the instructions issued to the Lord Deputy, July 1559, he was told that the deputy and council shall set the service of Almighty God before their eyes, and the said deputy and all others of that council, who be native-born subjects of this realm of England, do use the rites and ceremonies which are by law appointed, at least in their own houses. In the draft instructions as first prepared, a further clause was added, that others native of that country be not otherwise moved to use the same, than with their own contentment, they shall be disposed, neither therein doth her majesty mean to judge otherwise of them than well and yet for the better example and edification of prayer in the church it shall be well done if the said counsellors being of that country born shall at times convenient cause either in their own houses or in the churches the litany in the english tongue to be used with the reading of the epistle and gospel in the same tongue and the ten commandments Although Cecil struck out this clause with his own hand, it helps to show that the government feared to push things to extremes in Ireland. On the return of the Earl of Sussex, he paid the usual official visit in state to Christ's Church, where apparently the English litany, probably that prescribed by Henry the Eighth, was sung after the Mass. In connection with this celebration, a story was put in circulation by Robert Ware in 1683 that the clergy, dissatisfied with the change in liturgy, determined to have recourse to a disgraceful imposture to prevent further innovations. On the following Sunday, when the archbishop and deputy assisted at Mass, one of their number, having inserted a sponge soaked in blood into the head of the celebrated statue of the Redeemer, blood began to trickle over the face of the image. Suddenly during the service, a cry was raised by the trickster and his associates, Behold, our Savior's image sweats blood! Several of the common people, wondering at it, fell down with their beads in their hands and prayed to the image, while Lee, who was guilty of deception, kept crying out all the time, How can he choose but sweat blood, whilst heresy is now come into the church? Amidst scenes of the greatest excitement, the archbishop caused an examination to be made. The trick was discovered. Lee and his accomplices were punished by being made to stand upon a table with their legs and hands tied for three Sundays, with the crime written upon paper and pinned to their breasts. And to complete the story, a recent writer adds, the Protestants were triumphant, the Roman party confounded, 
and Kerwin's orders to have the statue broken up were obeyed without demur. Needless to say, there is no foundation for such a tale. It first saw light in that collection of gross inventions, The Hunting of the Romish Fox, published by Robert Ware in 1683, and is unsupported by any contemporary witnesses. It was not known to Sir Robert Ware, from whose papers the author pretended to borrow it. It was not known to Sir Dudley Loftus, who devoted himself to the study of Irish history, and who, as nephew of Elizabeth's Archbishop of Dublin, would have had exceptional opportunities of learning the facts. Nor was it known to Archbishop Parker, to whom, according to Ware, a full account was forwarded immediately. The author of it was employed to stir up feeling in England and Ireland, so as to prevent the accession of James II, and as a cover for his forgeries, he pretended to be using the manuscripts of his father. For so far the Catholic religion was the only one recognized by law in Ireland, and consequently, when Elizabeth instructed the deputy to see that her English-born subjects in Ireland should use the English service in their private houses, she took care to promise that none of them should be impeached or molested for carrying out her commands. But her deputy was instructed to summon a parliament in Ireland, to make such statutes as were lately made in England, mutatis mutandis. The Parliament met in Dublin on the 11th of January, 1560. According to the returns, 76 members, representing several counties and boroughs, were elected. Dublin, Meath, Westmeath, Louth, Kildare, Carlow, Kilkenny, Waterford, Wexford, and Tipperary were the only counties represented, each of them having returned two members. Of the boroughs represented, 17 were situated in Leinster, 8 in Munster, 2 in Athenry, in Galway, in Connaught, and one only, namely, Carrick Fergus, was situated in Ulster. Twenty-three temporal peers were summoned to take their seats, all of whom belonged to Anglo-Irish families, except O'Brien of Thomond and MacGillapatrick of Upper Ossery. According to the record preserved in the Rolls Office, three archbishops and seventeen bishops took their seats, the only absentees being Clogger, Derry, Raffo, Kilmore, Dromore, Clonmacnoise, Achenry, Kilmacdu, Cofenera, and Mayo. Armagh was vacant, primate Dowdle having died in August 1558, and his successor not having been appointed by Rome till February 1560. But for many reasons, it is impossible to believe that the twenty bishops mentioned in this list were present at the Dublin Parliament. At best, it is only a rather inaccurate count of those who were summoned to take their seats, as is shown by the fact that for seven of the sees no names of the bishops are returned, and that Down and Connor are represented as having sent two bishops, although both sees were united for more than a century. If it be borne in mind that according to the returns in the state paper office, four archbishops and nineteen bishops are represented as having attended the Parliament of 1541, although in his official report to the king, the deputy stated expressly that only two archbishops and twelve bishops were present, and also that gross errors have been detected in the list of spiritual peers, supposed to have been in attendance at the Parliaments of 1569 and 1585. It will be obvious to any unprejudiced mind that the return for the Parliament of 1560 cannot be accepted as accurate. No reliable account of the proceedings of the Parliament of 1560 has as yet been discovered. It met on the 11th of January, was adjourned on the following day till the 1st of February, when it was dissolved. It is more probable, however, that it lasted till the 12th of February. According to the Loftus manuscripts, the Parliament was dissolved, by reason of its aversion to the Protestant religion and their ecclesiastical government. At the very beginning of this Parliament, according to another distinguished authority, Her Majesty's well-wishers found that most of the nobility and commons were divided in opinion about the ecclesiastical government, which caused the Earl of Sussex to dissolve them and to go over to England to consult Her Majesty about the affairs of this kingdom. This latter statement is confirmed by the fact that the Earl of Sussex certainly left Ireland in February 1560, and yet, according to the accounts that have come down to us, it was this assembly that gave Protestantism its first legal sanction in Ireland. It abolished papal supremacy, restored to the Queen the full exercise of spiritual jurisdiction, as enjoyed by Henry VIII and Edward VI, and joined on all persons holding ecclesiastical or secular offices the oath of royal supremacy under pain of deprivation imposed the penalty of forfeiture of all goods for the first offence on those who spoke in favour of the pope the punishment laid down for premunere in case of a second such offence and death for the third offence and enjoined the use of the book of common prayer in all the churches of the kingdom 
Any clergyman who refused to follow the prescribed form of worship was liable to forfeit one year's revenue and to be sent to prison for the first offence, to total deprivation and imprisonment at will for the second, and for the third to perpetual imprisonment. The laity were obliged to attend the service under threat of excommunication and of a fine of twelve pence to be levied off their goods and chattels by the church wardens. The first fruits were restored to the crown, and the formality of canonical election of bishops was abolished. For the future, in case of a vacancy, the right of appointment was vested directly in the sovereign. In view of the fact that the cities and counties from which the members were returned resisted stubbornly the introduction of the English service, that most of the lay peers clung tenaciously to the mass, some of them, like the Earl of Kildare, being charged with this crime a few months after the dissolution of Parliament, and that the bishops, with one or two exceptions, opposed the change, the wonder is how such measures could have received the sanction of Parliament. According to a well-supported tradition, they reached the statute book only by fraud, having been rushed through on a holiday on which most of the members thought that no session would be held. Later on, when objection was taken to such a method, the deputy, it is said, silenced the resistors by assuring them that they were mere formalities which must remain a dead letter. It is sometimes said that the Irish bishops of the period acknowledged Elizabeth's title of supreme governor in spirituals, and abandoned the Mass for the Book of Common Prayer. Nothing, however, could be farther from the truth. With the single exception of Kerwin, from whom nothing better could have been expected, considering his past variations, it cannot be proved for certain that any of the bishops proved disloyal to their trust. There is some ground for suspicion in case of Christopher Bodkin of Tuam and Thomas O'Fihil, both of whom were represented as having taken the oath, but the strong recommendation of the former to the Holy See by the Jesuit, Father David Wolfe, and the fact that the latter is consistently passed over by contemporary writers in their enumeration of the Protestant bishops, show clearly that their lapse, if lapse there might have been, was more or less involuntary. The fact that some of the bishops, as, for example, Roland Fitzgerald of Cashel, Lacey of Limerick, Walsh of Waterford, de Burgo of Clonfort, Devereux of Ferns, Ophiho of Leyland, and Bodkin of Tuam, were appointed on government commissions, does not prove that they had ceased to be Catholics, just as the appointment of Brown on a similar commission during the reign of Queen Mary does not prove that he had ceased to be a Protestant. That the Irish bishops remained true to the faith is clear from some of the official papers of the period. In 1564, two of the commissioners, who had been appointed to enforce the acts of royal supremacy and uniformity of worship, reported that there were only two worthy bishops in Ireland, namely Adam Loftus, who had been intruded into Armagh, but who dared not visit his diocese, and Brady, who had been appointed by the Queen to Meath. The rest of the bishops, they say, are all Irish. We need say no more. In the following year it was announced that Kerwin of Dublin, Loftus, and Brady were the only bishops zealous in setting forth God's glory in the true Christian religion, and in 1566 Sir Henry Sidney reported that, with the exception of Loftus and Brady, he found none others willing to reform their clergy or to teach any wholesome doctrine or to serve their country or commonwealth as magistrates. In a document drawn up by one of Cecil's spies in 1571, the bishops of the province of Armagh, Cashel, and Tuam are all described as Catholici et Confederati, while in the province of Dublin, Loftus, Daly, Cavanagh, and Gaffney, the three latter of whom had been intruded by the Queen into Kildare, Leyland, and Ossory, are described as Protestants, as is also Devereux of Ferns, about whose orthodoxy there may be some doubt, though unfortunately there can be very little about his evil life. Hardly had the acts of royal supremacy and uniformity been passed, when a commission was addressed to a number of judges and officials to administer the oath of supremacy. Of the bishops within the sphere of English jurisdiction at this period, Kerwin had already given his adhesion to these measures. William Walsh of Meath promptly refused, as did also Thomas Leverus of Kildare, February 1560. Later on, when the Lord Deputy returned from London, another attempt was made to induce these bishops to change their minds, but without success. In reply to the Deputy, the Bishop of Kildare declared that all jurisdiction was derived from Christ, and since Christ did not deem it right to confer spiritual authority on women, not even on his own blessed mother, how, he asked, could it be believed that the Queen of England was the supreme governor of the church? Thereupon the deputy threatened him with deprivation and the consequent loss of his revenues, unless he made a submission. But the bishop reminded him of the words of sacred scripture, 
what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world if he suffer the loss of his own soul he was driven from the sea and for a time taught a private school in the county limerick but he returned to his diocese where he died near nass fifteen seventy seven the bishop of meath continued to oppose the religious policy of the government in fifteen sixty five he was summoned once more by the commissioners but he openly protested before all the people the same day that he would never communicate or be present where the service should be ministered for it was against his conscience and against god's word as he was a man of great credit among his countrymen upon whom in causes of religion they wholly depend he was thrown into prison where he languished in great suffering till fifteen seventy two when he contrived to make his escape to france later on funds were supplied by the holy see to enable him to continue his journey to spain he died amongst his brethren the cistercians at alcala in fifteen seventy seven john o'tonery too who had been appointed to ossory after the precipitate flight of bale seems to have given offence to the government though the latter preferred to devote himself to historical studies after the accession of elizabeth rather than to entrust himself to the tender mercies of the people of kilkenny his rival does not seem to have been regarded by the government as a lawful bishop of ossory his name does appear on the list of ecclesiastical commissioners appointed in fifteen sixty four but this seems to have been a mistake on the part of the officials or possibly a bait thrown out to induce o'tonnery to make his submission at any rate it is certain that in fifteen sixty one the bishopric of ossory was returned as vacant and it was suggested that the appointment should be conferred on the dean of kilkenny and in july fifteen sixty five before the death of o'tonnery and the instructions drawn up for sir henry sidney and corrected by cecil her majesty is made to say that the bishopric of ossory has been long vacant as this can refer only to the death of bale who died in fifteen sixty three it is clear that o'tonnery was bracketed with walsh and leverous as far as elizabeth's ministers are concerned had it been possible for the government to do so similar measures would have been taken against the bishops in the other parts of ireland but faced as it was with shane o'neill in the north and a threatening confederation of the whole geraldine forces in the south it was deemed prudent not to precipitate a crisis by violent anti-catholic propaganda in those parts of the country not yet subject to english influence commissioners were appointed to administer the oath of supremacy to the bishops the judges and higher officials to the justices of the peace etc in kildare fifteen sixty and to the officials in west meath but unless bishops could be found willing to take the place of those who refused to accept the new laws no progress could be made Kerwin of Dublin, following his old rule of accepting the sovereign's religion as a true one, submitted to the Act of Supremacy and the Act of Uniformity. In accordance with the Queen's instructions, he removed the pictures and statues from Christ's Church and St. Patrick's, blotted out the paintings and frescoes on the walls, so as to cover up all signs of idolatry, and to prepare a background for carefully assorted scriptural texts. He was not, however, happy in his new position. He petitioned to be transferred from Dublin to Hereford, basing his claim on the fact that he was the man that of his coat hath surly stood to the crown, either in England or Ireland. But his petition was not granted. Two years later Adam Loftus, who though nominally Archbishop of Armagh, feared to visit his diocese, charged Curran with serious crimes, which he was ashamed to particularize, and probably as a result of this the Queen instructed her deputy to induce him to resign on the promise of an annual pension of two hundred pounds. 1563. But Kerwin, fearing that the leaving of the archbishopric and not receiving another might lead people to believe that he was deprived, stood out boldly for better terms. Hugh Brady, the Queen's Bishop of Meath, then proceeded to attack him. According to him, everybody in Dublin, from the archbishop to the petty canons, were dumb dogs, living enemies to the truth, neither teaching nor feeding any save themselves, and disguised dissimilars. As this did not produce any effect, he wrote once more, demanding that the authorities should call home the old unprofitable workmen, a petition in which he was supported by Adam Loftus. Their prayers were heard at last, and Kerwin was translated to Oxford. When the news of his recall was announced to him, he merely expressed the wish that he could get the last half-year's rent of the bishopric of Oxford, and that he should be allowed to change quickly so that he might provide fire for the winter and hay for his horses. The see of Armagh, which was vacant by the death of Primate Dowdle, was conferred by the Pope on Don at Otige, February 1560. The latter was consecrated at Rome and arrived in Ireland probably towards the end of the same year. 
In the summer of 1561 he was present at Armagh with the army of Shane O'Neill, whom he encouraged to go forward boldly against the forces of the deputy. Needless to say, such a primate was not acceptable to Elizabeth, who determined to appoint one Adam Loftus, then a chaplain to the Earl of Sussex. Loftus was a young man only twenty-eight years of age, who had made a favourable impression on the Queen, as well by his beauty as by his learning. Letters were dispatched immediately to the chapter of Armagh, commanding the canons to elect him, but as they refused to obey the order, nothing remained except to appoint him by letters patent, 1562. As he dared not visit the greater part of his diocese, he applied for and received the deanship of St. Patrick's, Dublin, and about the same time he became a suitor for his brother, that he might get the rectory of Dunboyne. In 1563, Elizabeth thought of changing him to Kildare, and in 1566 the deputy recommended him for Meath, believing that he would thankfully receive the exchange, and willingly embase his estate to increase so much his revenue but Loftus had set his heart on securing the Archbishop of Dublin. Time and again he made the most damaging charges against Kerwin, so as to secure his removal, although when the removal was arranged he learned to his surprise that the authorities intended to promote not himself but his fellow labourer, Hugh Brady of Meath. In April 1566, when he thought that Brady had no chance of succeeding to Dublin, he had recommended him for the appointment, but in September, when he learned that there was danger of his recommendation being followed, he wrote to Warren Cecil that, if it would please his honour to pause a while, he could show such matter as he would, except it were for the church of God's sake, be loath to utter by any means, but least of all by writing, upon knowledge whereof the matter, he knows, should go no further. Brady, having learned that Loftus had gone to England, wrote to Cecil, to put him on his guard against believing any charges against him that might be made by the primate. He returned in November without having succeeded, only to find that Shane O'Neill had overrun his diocese, so that it was not worth more than twenty pounds a year. He petitioned to be allowed to resign, for, he said, neither is it, Armagh, worth anything to me, nor am I able to do any good in it, for that altogether it lieth among the Irish." At last, in 1567, his wishes were granted, and he became Archbishop of Dublin. But he was still dissatisfied, as the diocese, according to him, was worth only four hundred pounds Irish a year, over thirty thousand pounds, and had only two hundred and forty acres of mensal land. He insisted that he should be allowed to hold with it the deanship of St. Patrick's, a request, however, that was refused peremptorily by the Queen. In Dublin he continued the same policy of grabbing everything for himself, his relatives, and dependents, until at last the chapter, weary of his importunities, obliged him to promise not to ask for anything more. Fortunately, his guarantee was entered in the records, as he appeared soon again to solicit one last favour. In place of Dr. Walsh of Meath, who refused to take the oath of supremacy, Hugh Brady was appointed, 1563. In his letter to Cecil, he complained that the payment of his fees and the expenses of the consecration would beggar him, that he was opposed by both the clergy and laity of his diocese in such a stubborn way that he would rather be a stipendiary priest in England than Bishop of Meath in Ireland, and that unless Her Majesty pardoned the debts she was claiming, he must lose all hope, as he was very poor, and obliged to entertain right royally. For these people, he wrote, will have the one or the other, I mean, they will either eat my meat and drink, or else myself. The relations existing between Loftus of Ramal and the Bishop of Meath were of the most strained kind. When Brady learned that Loftus had been made Dean of St. Patrick's, he addressed an indignant protest to Cecil. But as both Loftus and himself aspired to become Archbishop of Dublin, both united to attack Kerwin, so as to secure his removal. Grave charges were made by Loftus against Brady in 1566, but once he had attained the object of his desires, namely his promotion to Dublin, he had no scruple in attaching his name to a very laudatory commendation of Brady's labours and qualifications, 1567. A certain Dr. Craig was appointed by Elizabeth to Kildare in opposition to Dr. Leverus. The new bishop was far from being content with the honour that had been conferred upon him. 
writing to his patron, Lord Robert Dudley, he complained that he was in continual and daily torment owing to the fact that he was bishop in a diocese where he could neither preach to the people nor could the people understand, and where he had no one to assist him. He succeeded in securing for himself the deanship of St. Patrick's in Dublin, and was a strong suitor for the bishopric of Meath. Not content with his revenues, he sold most of the Episcopal lands in Kildare, so that he reduced the diocese to a most shameful state of poverty. Finally, he went over to England to petition the Queen for a remission of his fees, but he was thrown into the Marshalsea prison, from which he was released only a few months before his death. Donald Cavanaugh was appointed by the Queen to Leyland, 1567, where he devoted himself principally to enriching himself by disposing of the diocesan property, and John Devereux, who, according to Loftus, was most unfit, owing to the fact that he had been deprived of the deanship of Ferns, for confessed whoredom, was appointed Bishop of Ferns, 1566. With men such as these in charge of the new religious movement, it was almost impossible that it could succeed. In spite of the various royal commissions appointed between the years 1560 and 1564 to secure submission to the acts of supremacy and uniformity, the people still clung tenaciously to the old faith. Though Elizabeth and her advisers were anxious to destroy the Catholic religion in Ireland, they deemed it imprudent to do so immediately in view of the threatening attitude of O'Neill and of several of the other Irish and Anglo-Irish nobles. In case of the act of uniformity, it had been laid down expressly that in places where the people did not understand Irish, the service might be read in Latin. And as not even the people in Kildare knew English at this time, it followed that outside of Dublin the Book of Common Prayer was not obligatory. Indeed, outside Dublin, Meath, Kildare, and portion of Armagh, very little attempt seems to have been made to put these laws into execution. From the draft instructions drawn up for Sir Henry Sidney in 1565, it is perfectly clear that outside the Pale Territory, zealous measures had not been taken to enforce the new doctrines, and that even within the Pale, the authorities were not inclined to press matters to extremes. In the various agreements concluded between Shane O'Neill and Elizabeth, O'Neill was not called upon to renounce the Pope. It was thought to be much more prudent to pursue a policy of toleration until the English power could be placed upon a sound footing, and that if this were once accomplished, the religious question could be settled without much difficulty. Although the Lord Deputy was empowered to punish those who refused to attend the English service by imprisonment, 1561, he was obliged to report in the following year that the people were without discipline and utterly devoid of religion that they came to divine service as to a May game, that the ministers were held in contempt on account of their greediness and want of qualifications, the wise fear more the impiety of the licentious professors than the superstition of their erroneous papists, and that nothing less than the parliamentary decree rigorously enforced could remedy the evil. The commissioners who had been appointed to enforce the religious innovations reported in 1564 that the people were so addicted to their old superstitions that they could not be induced to hear the new gospel, that the judges and lawyers, however, had promised to enforce the laws, that they had cautioned them not to interfere with the simple multitude at first, but only with one or two boasting mass men in every shire, and that with the exception of Kerwin, Loftus, and Brady, all the rest of the bishops were Irish, about whom it was not necessary to say anything more. In a document presented to the Privy Council in England by the Lord Deputy and Council of Ireland, 1566, a good account is given of the progress and results of the so-called Reformation. They reported that Kerwin, Loftus, and Brady were diligent in their pastoral office, but that, howbeit it, the work, goeth slowly forward within their said three dioceses, by reason of the former errors and superstitions, inveterated and leavened in the people's hearts, and in, on account of, want of livings sufficient for fit entertainment of well-chosen and learned curates amongst them, for that these livings of cure, being most part appropriated benefices in the Queen's Majesty's possession, are let by leases to farmers, with allowance or reservation of very small stipends or entertainments for the vicars or curates, besides the decay of the chancels, and also of the churches universally in ruins, and some wholly down. And out of their said diocese, the remote parts of Munster, Connaught, and other Irish countries and borders thereof, order cannot yet so well be taken, nor the residue, till the countries be first brought into more civil and dutiful obedience. In Dublin, where it might be expected that the government could enforce its decrees, 
the people refused to conform, and even in 1565, after several commissions had finished their labors, it was admitted that the canons and clergy of St. Patrick's were still papists. From Meath, the Queen's bishop received such a bad reception that he declared he would much rather have been a stipendiary priest in England than Bishop of Meath. Oh, what a sea of trouble, he wrote, have I entered into, storms rising on every side. The ungodly lawyers are not only sworn enemies to the truth, but also for the lack of due execution of law, the overthrowers of the country. The ragged clergy are stubborn and ignorantly blind, so as there is left little hope of their amendment. The simple multitude is through continual ignorance hardly to be won, so as I find, angustiae undique. But while Brady was involved in a sea of difficulties, the Catholics of Meath rallied round their lawful bishop, Dr. Walsh. According to the report of Loftus, who ordered his arrest, 1565, he was one of great credit amongst his countrymen, and upon whom, as touching causes of religion, they wholly depended. Loftus petitioned to be recalled from Armagh, because it was not worth anything to him, nor was he able to do any good in it, since it lay among the Irish, and Craik, who was appointed to Kildare, announced that he could not address the people because they were not acquainted with the English language, nor had he any Irish clergyman who would assist him in spreading the new gospel. In 1564, several bodies of commissioners were appointed to visit certain portions of Leinster, Munster, and Connaught, to enforce the acts of supremacy and uniformity, and about the same time a royal proclamation was issued enforcing the fine of twelve pence for each offence on those who refused to attend Protestant service on Sundays and holy days. Whether these commissioners acted or not is not clear, but undoubtedly the commissioners appointed for the pale made a serious attempt to carry out their instructions. They brought together juries chosen out of the parishes situated within the sphere of English influence, and upon the return of their several verdicts they found many and great offences committed against Her Majesty's laws and proceedings, but among all their presentiments they brought nothing against the nobility and chief gentlemen who yet have contemned Her Majesty's most godly laws and proceedings, more manifestly than any of the rest, and therefore they determined to call them before them and to minister to them certain articles, unto which they required the nobility to answer upon their honours and duty without oath. The rest of the gentlemen answered upon their oaths, and when they brought their several answers, they found by their own confession that the most part of them had continually, since the last Parliament, frequented the Mass and other services and ceremonies inhibited by Her Majesty's laws and injunctions, and that very few of them ever received the Holy Communion, or used such kind of public prayer and service as is presently established by law. Whereupon, Loftus added, I was once in mind, for that they be so linked together in friendship and alliance, one with another, that we shall never be able to correct them by the ordinary course of the statute, to assess upon every one of them, according to the quality of their several offences, a good round sum of money to be paid to your majesty's use, and to bind them in sure bonds, and recognizances ever hereafter dutifully, to observe your majesty's most godly laws and injunctions. But for that they be the nobility and chief gentlemen of the English pale, and the greatest number too. I thought fit not to deal any further with them, until your majesty's pleasure were therein especially known. So long as your majesty required the noblemen of the pale to fight against Shane O'Neill and the other Irish chieftains, she was too prudent to insist on strict acceptance of her religious innovations. In 1560, Pius IV determined to send a special commissary into Ireland in the person of the Irish Jesuit, Father David Wolfe, who was a native of Limerick, highly recommended to the Holy See by the general of the society. The commissary was instructed to visit and encourage the bishops, clergy, and chief noblemen of the country to stand firm. He was to draw up a list of suitable candidates for bishoprics, to reorganize some of the religious houses and hospitals, and to establish grammar schools where the youth of the country might receive a sound education. He left Rome in August 1560 and arrived in Cork in January 1561. According to his report, the people flocked to him in thousands to listen to his sermons, to get absolution, and to procure the revalidation of invalid marriages. For so far, he was able to assure the Roman authorities, heresy had made no progress among the masses. From Cork he went to Limerick, and from Limerick he journeyed through Connaught. During the course of this journey, he learned a great deal that was favorable about Bodkin, the Archbishop of Toom, and Roland de Burgo of Clonfort. He visited the greater part of the country, with the exception of the Pale, and, as he found it impossible to go there, 
he empowered one of the priests to absolve from reserved cases, particularly from the crimes of heresy and schism. In 1568 he was arrested and thrown into prison, together with Archbishop Cree of Armagh. Pius V instructed his nuncio in Spain to request the good offices of Philip II to procure their release, but apparently the representations of the Spanish government were without effect. In 1572, however, Father Wolf succeeded in making his escape from prison, and before setting sail for Spain, he had the happiness of receiving the humble submission of William Casey, who had been promoted to the See of Limerick by Edward VI. From Tarbet, the papal commissary sailed for Spain. Later on, he returned once more to Ireland, and was active in assisting James Sotomaris. He is supposed to have died in Spain in 1578 or 1579. Father Wolf had been instructed specially to recommend to the Holy See those priests whom he deemed qualified for appointment to vacant bishoprics. This was a matter of essential importance, and as such he devoted to it his particular care. Thomas O'Hurley was appointed to Ross, 1561. Don McCongale, or McGongale, the companion of his journeys, was appointed to Raffo, 1562. The Dominicans O'Hart and O'Crean were provided to the sees of Achenry and Elfin in the same year at his request, and during the time he remained in Ireland his advice with regard to episcopal nominations was followed as a rule. He was instructed also to establish grammar schools throughout the country, and he was not long in Ireland till he realized the necessity of doing something for education, and above all for the education of candidates for the priesthood. In 1564 he obtained from Pius IV the bull Dum Exquisita, empowering himself and the Archbishop of Armagh to erect colleges and universities in Ireland on the model and with all the privileges of the Universities of Paris and Louvain. For this purpose they were empowered to apply the revenues of monasteries and of benefices, and to make use of the ecclesiastical property generally. Unfortunately, owing to the disturbed condition of the country, and the subsequent arrest of both the archbishop and the papal commissary, it was impossible to carry out this scheme. In the earlier sessions of the Council of Trent, the archbishop of Armagh had taken a leading part. When the council opened for its final sessions in January 1562, Ireland was represented by O'Hurlihy of Ross, McCongale of Raffo, and O'Hart of Achenry. Nor were these mere idle spectators of the proceedings. They joined in the warm discussions that took place regarding the sacrifice of the Mass, communion under both kinds, the source of Episcopal jurisdiction, and of the Episcopal obligation of residence, the erection of seminaries, and the matrimonial impediments. It is said that it was mainly owing to their exertions that the impediment of spiritual relationship was retained. After their return, attempts were made to convoke provincial synods to promulgate the decrees of the Council of Trent. In 1566, apparently some of the prelates of Connaught assembled and proclaimed them in the province of Tuam. In 1587, the bishops of Clogger, Derry, Raffo, Down and Connor, Ardal, Kilmore, and Achenry, together with a large number of clergy, met in the diocese of Clogger for a similar purpose, and in 1614 they were proclaimed for the province of Dublin by a synod convoked at Kilkenny. In 1560, and for several years after, the state of affairs in Ireland was so threatening that Elizabeth and her advisers were more concerned about maintaining a foothold in the country than about the abolition of the Mass. In the north, Shane O'Neill had succeeded on the death of his father, 1559, and seemed determined to vindicate for himself, to the fullest, the rights of the O'Neill over the entire province of Ulster. The Earl of Kildare refused to abandon the Mass, and was in close correspondence both with his kinsman, the Earl of Desmond, and with several of the Irish chieftains. It was feared that a great Catholic confederation might be formed against Elizabeth, and that Scotland, France, Spain, and the Pope might be induced to lend their aid. Instructions were therefore issued to the Lord Deputy to induce the Earl of Kildare to come to London, where he could be detained, and to stir up the minor princes of Ulster to weaken the power of O'Neill. But attaining men like the earls of Kildare, Desmond, and Ormond, in London, by stirring up rivalries and dissensions amongst Irishmen, and above all by getting possession of the children of both the Anglo-Irish and Irish nobles and bringing them to England for their education, it was hoped that Ireland might be both Anglicized and Protestantized. The most urgent question, however, was the reduction of Shane O'Neill. 
At first Elizabeth was inclined to come to terms with him, but the Earl of Sussex, in the hope of overcoming him by force, had him proclaimed a traitor, and advanced against him with a large force, 1561. He seized Armagh, took possession of the cathedral, and converted it into a strong fortress. O'Neill soon appeared, accompanied by the lawful archbishop, who exhorted the Irish troops to withstand the invader. The English army suffered a bad defeat, and after the failure of several attempts to reduce O'Neill by force, the deputy determined to try other methods. He hired an individual named Neil Gray to murder O'Neill, and acquainted Elizabeth with what he had done. But O'Neill was fortunate enough to elude the assassination. At length, O'Neill was induced to go to England, 1562, where he was forced to agree to certain terms. But, as he discovered that he had been deceived throughout the entire negotiations, he felt free on his return to assert his claims to Ulster. Elizabeth was not unwilling to yield to nearly all his demands, even to the extent of removing Loftus from the Archbishopric of Armagh, and allowing the appointment of O'Neill's own nominee. The Earl of Sussex, however, was opposed to peace having been forced against his will to come to terms with o'neill fifteen sixty three he determined to have recourse once more to the method of assassination a present of poisoned wine was sent to o'neill by the deputy as a token of his good will and it was only by a happy chance that o'neill and his friends were not done to death the new deputy sir henry sidney succeeded in stirring up o'donnell and the other ulster princes against o'neill by promising them the protection of england Having been defeated in battle by O'Donnell in 1567, Shane fled for aid to the Scots of Antrim, on whom he had inflicted more than one severe defeat, and while with them he was set upon and slain. By his disappearance the power of the Irish in Ulster was broken, and the way was at last prepared for subduing the northern portion of Ireland. In the south of Ireland the young Earl of Desmond was in a particularly strong position, but, unfortunately, he was personally weak and vacillating, and by playing off the Earl of Ormond against him, Elizabeth was able to keep him in subjection to England, to use him against Shane O'Neill, and to prevent him from taking part in a national or religious confederation. In 1567, the Earl was arrested and sent to London, where he was detained as a prisoner. Although the Lord Deputy allowed himself to be received at Limerick by Bishop Lacey, with full Catholic ceremonial, Still, the appointment of Protestant commissioners to administer the territories of Desmond and the intrusion of a Queen's Archbishop into the See of Cashel, 1567, made it clear that the government was determined to force the new religion on the people. About the same time, the Pope took steps to strengthen the Catholics of Munster by appointing Maurice Fitzgibbon, commendatory abbot of a Cistercian monastery in Mayo, to the vacant See of Cashel. The new archbishop was in close correspondence with the Desmond party in Ireland and with Philip II of Spain. On his arrival in Ireland, 1569, he found that James Fitzmaurice, the cousin of the Earl of Desmond, was organizing a confederation to defend the Catholic religion. McCarthy Moore, the O'Briens of Thomond, the sons of the Earl of Clanrickard, and Sir Edmund Butler had promised their assistance. The new archbishop came to Cashel, took possession of his cathedral in spite of the presence of the royal intruder, and even went so far as to force the latter to attend a solemn mass in the cathedral. This is the only foundation for the story that he suffered personal violence to McCogwell, or that he captured him and brought him a prisoner to Spain. The Earl of Sydney mustered his forces to proceed against the rebels, and the Earl of Ormond was sent over from England to detach his brother, Sir Edmund Butler, from his alliance with the Desmonds. The Archbishop of Cashel was dispatched into Spain to seek the assistance of Philip II, 1569, and he brought with him a document purporting to be signed by thirteen archbishops and bishops, and by most of the leading Irish and Anglo-Irish nobles in Leinster, Munster, and Connaught, asking the King of Spain to assist them in their defense of the Catholic religion, and offering to accept as their sovereign any Spanish or Burgundian prince whom Philip II might wish to nominate. The fact that the Pope had published in February 1570 the bull Regnans and Excelsis, announcing the excommunication and deposition of Queen Elizabeth, served to encourage the Catholics of Munster. But notwithstanding this sentence, the Archbishop failed to obtain any effective assistance, either from Spain or from the Pope. Undaunted by the ill success of his agent, Fismaris issued a proclamation addressed to the prelates, princes, and lords of Ireland, 
announcing that he had taken up arms against the heretical ruler who had been excommunicated and deposed by the pope that a large body of english catholics were in rebellion or ready to rise that he had been appointed by the pope captain-general of the irish catholic forces and that it behooved them to rally to his standard to defend the catholic faith to suppress all false teachers and schismatical services and to deliver their country from heresy and tyranny fitzmaurice was however disappointed in his hopes the earl of ormond hastened over to ireland to hold the butler territories for the queen many of his confederates deserted him or were overthrown and after a long struggle he was overcome and obliged to make his submission fifteen seventy three to seventy four end of chapter nine part one Chapter 9, Part 2 of The History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In 1575, James Fitzmaurice fled from Ireland to seek assistance from some of the Catholic rulers of the continent. His petitions met, however, with scant success in Paris, Lisbon, and Madrid, and it was only from Pope Gregory the Thirteenth that he received any promise of men in arms. Already an English adventurer named Stuckley had been intriguing with the Pope to obtain a small army and fleet for a descent upon Ireland, and the celebrated English theologian and controversialist Nicholas Sander, who was working at the Roman court on behalf of the English exiles, also favoured the attempt. The expedition started in 1578, but when Stuckley, who was in supreme command, reached Lisbon, he joined his forces with those of the King of Portugal in an attack on the Moors in the course of which he was killed and his army was destroyed by the exertions of sander and of the nuncio at madrid fitzmaurice was enabled to fit out a small ship and in fifteen seventy nine accompanied by sander as papal representative he arrived at dingle at once he addressed an appeal to the people to join him in fighting for the faith against a heretical sovereign so terrified were the vast body of the noblemen by the punishments inflicted on them already and by the fear of losing all their property in case of another defeat that the proclamation met with only a poor response ormond joined sir william pelham against the rebels as did also several of the old enemies of the geraldines fitzmaurice himself was killed early in the campaign by the burkes of castle connell and although the earl of desmond at last decided to take up arms there was no longer any hope of success for years the war was carried on with relentless cruelty by pelham and afterwards by lord grey to wilton the crops and the cattle were destroyed in the hope of starving out the scattered followers of desmond and a force composed of spaniards and italians were butchered after they agreed to surrender the fortress of dunanore Viscount Boltinglass hastened to take up arms against a deputy, and with the assistance of Fiat McHugh O'Byrne, he inflicted a severe defeat on Lord Grey at Glenmalure, 1580. But in the end the rebellion was completely suppressed, and the Earl of Desmond was taken and murdered, 1583. Two years before, Nicholas Sander, the papal representative, died in a wood near Limerick, after having received the last sacraments at the hands of the Bishop of Killaloe after the death of shane o'neill elizabeth's ministers deemed it advisable to summon a second parliament fifteen sixty nine unfortunately no list of the members returned for the boroughs and counties has been preserved but from the account that has come down to us of the opening debates it is clear that the most elaborate precautions were taken to pack the assembly new boroughs which had not been recognized hitherto as corporations were created the sheriffs and deputies appointed by the government returned themselves as fit and proper persons to sit in parliament and in a large number of cases english officials and lawyers who had never seen the constituencies they were supposed to represent were returned by the sheriffs at the instigation of the deputy and his agents from the list of peers it would seem as if twenty-three archbishops and bishops took their seats but the list is so full of glaring inaccuracies that it cannot be relied upon at best it represents merely the number who were entitled to sit and was based entirely on the list drawn up for the parliaments of fifteen forty one and fifteen sixty when parliament met james stanihurst recorder of dublin was appointed speaker from the beginning it was evident that in spite of all his efforts the government party was likely to meet with serious opposition 
sir christopher barnwall took strong exception to the methods that had been adopted to pack the assembly but though the judges when appealed to upheld his objections on two counts they decided against him on the vital question namely the selection of english officials who had never seen the constituencies they were supposed to represent backed by the decision of the judges the lord deputy and the speaker bore down all opposition an act was passed for the attainder of Shane O'Neill, for the suppression of the title, the O'Neill, and for securing to Her Majesty the County Tyrone, and other counties and territories in Ulster. The spiritual peers resisted strongly a proposal for the erection of schools to be supported out of the ecclesiastical property, but in the end the measure was passed. It enacted that the free school should be established in each diocese at the expense of the diocese, that the salary should be paid by the bishops and clergy, that the schoolmasters should be Englishmen, or at least of English extraction, and that their appointment should be vested in the Lord Deputy, except in the dioceses of Armagh, Dublin, Meath, and Kildare, in which the nomination of the teachers should rest in the hands of the archbishop or bishop. The exceptions clearly indicate that only the royal bishops could be relied upon to carry out the educational policy of the government, and this was brought out even more explicitly by the act empowering the deputy to appoint to all ecclesiastical dignities in Munster and Connaught. A bill for the repair of the churches at the public expense was thrown out in the House of Commons. The gradual extension of English influence in both the North and the South enabled Elizabeth and her advisers to throw off the mask of toleration and to take more active measures for enforcing the new religion. Already Bishop Walsh of Meath had been thrown into prison, 1565, from which he escaped in 1572 and fled to Spain. Bishop Leverus, who had been driven from his see in Kildare, though on account of the influence of his patron, the Earl of Kildare, he was permitted to end his days in his own diocese. Bishop Lacey of Limerick was reported by the Lord Deputy, 1562, as a stubborn and disobedient man in causes of religion, and as having committed offences whereby he had forfeited his bishopric by the laws of the realm. For some time Limerick was regarded as vacant, but the threatening attitude of the Geraldines made it impossible to interfere with its bishop, and when the Lord Deputy visited the city in 1567, he even allowed himself to be received by the bishop with full Catholic ceremonial. When, however, the power of the Southern Confederation was broken, Bishop Lacey was deprived of his see as far as royal letters patent could do it, and William Casey, the nominee of Edward the Sixth, was placed in possession. The latter had made a submission to the Pope, and had declared his sorrow for his crimes in the presence of David Wolfe. Though apparently he had fallen once again, he was distrusted by those who had appointed him, as was shown by the fact that a Scotchman named Campbell was set over him in 1585, to attend to the spiritual functions of the bishopric. The Pope appointed Donat Otige, Archbishop of Armagh, in 1560, and on his death Richard Cree was designated as his successor. The latter was a native of Limerick, who had graduated at Louvain, and at the time he was nominated by David Wolfe for an Irish archbishopric, he kept a school in his native diocese. Having been consecrated in Rome in 1564, he arrived in Ireland towards the end of that year, only to be arrested and thrown into prison, from which he managed to make his escape at Easter, 1565. He returned to his diocese, but he soon found himself in conflict with Shane O'Neill. The archbishop was an Anglo-Irishman, who stood for loyalty to the queen, and who regarded O'Neill and his followers as both rebels and, in a sense, savages. Instead of encouraging O'Neill's men to maintain their struggle, he preached on the duty of obedience, whereat O'Neill was so enraged that he was at first inclined to drive the primate from Armagh. He burned the cathedral of Armagh, not, however, as is sometimes represented, in hatred of the archbishop, but because it had been used as a fortress by the English. The relations between the spiritual and temporal ruler of Ulster improved, and Cree addressed a petition to the deputy to be allowed to continue the Catholic services in the churches, 1566. He was captured once again early in 1567 and put upon his trial. The jury having refused to find a verdict against him, both they and the accused were committed to prison in Dublin Castle. The archbishop eluded his guards once again, and it was only after the Earl of Kildare had promised that his life should be spared that his whereabouts were discovered. In 1567 he was lodged in the Tower of London, in which he was kept a close prisoner, though he still contrived to communicate with Rome and with his diocese. 
despite the intercession of the spanish ambassador and notwithstanding the fact that he suffered from grievous bodily infirmities he remained a prisoner till his death in october fifteen eighty five as a guarantee had been given by the earl of kildare that his life would be spared it was not deemed prudent to execute him but according to well-authenticated evidence his death was brought about by poison thomas o'herlihy was appointed bishop of ross on the recommendation of father wolf in fifteen sixty one and after having been consecrated he attended the council of trent on his return to ireland he took an active part in encouraging james fitzmaurice and was deputed to accompany the archbishop of cashel to seek for aid from philip the second of spain he was captured in fifteen seventy one and sent to the tower of london where he was kept prisoner for about three years and a half he came back once again to his diocese and laboured strenuously not merely in ross but in various districts in the south till his death in fifteen seventy nine or fifteen eighty maurice fitzgibbon archbishop of cashel went to spain as the representative of the southern geraldines and their allies having failed to get any help from philip the second he endeavoured at various times to interest the king of france the duke of anjou and the duke of alva in irish affairs though he was certainly in scotland where he was arrested in fifteen seventy two it is doubtful if he ever returned to his diocese according to one authority he was captured in munster and kept a prisoner in cork till his death in fifteen seventy eight but it is more probable that he died at oporto after the suppression of the geraldine uprising and after the decree of excommunication had been issued against elizabeth still more violent measures were taken against the bishops and clergy the franciscan bishop o'healy was taken together with another member of his order at kilmalock and both were put to death fifteen seventy eight or fifteen seventy nine edmund tanner who had been appointed to cork in fifteen seventy four and entrusted with special faculties for the provinces of dublin and cashel was arrested shortly after his arrival in ireland and was thrown into prison he succeeded however in escaping and he continued his labours in various parts of munster and leinster till his death in fifteen seventy eight or fifteen seventy nine nicholas skirrett a graduate of the collegium germanicum in rome was appointed to tuum in october fifteen eighty he was thrown into prison after his arrival in ireland and having succeeded in escaping from his captors he made his way into spain he died at lisbon in fifteen eighty three or fifteen eighty four maurice mcbrien was appointed to emley in fifteen sixty seven on the recommendation of father wolf during the earlier stages of the desmond rebellion he took active steps to promote the catholic confederation at this period it is not improbable that he went to spain to solicit the cooperation of philip the second but he returned to ireland was captured in fifteen eighty four and two years later he died in prison in dublin peter power or de la Porre, was provided to ferns by the pope in fifteen eighty two he was arrested and while in prison was induced to make his submission but on his release stricken with sorrow for the weakness he had shown he boldly confessed his error and was arrested once more how long he was detained is not certain but it is clear from a letter of the bishop of killalo that he was treated with the utmost severity he died in spain in fifteen eighty seven in fifteen eighty one dermot o'hurley was appointed to the archbishopric of cashel he had been a distinguished student of louvain and was then a professor of canon law at rheims hardly had he reached ireland when the government spies were on his track for some time he remained in the vicinity of Drogheda, and then he withdrew to the castle of the baron of slane from which he proceeded through cavan and longford to his diocese having learned however that the baron of slane was in danger for having afforded him assistance he surrendered himself to his persecutors he was brought to dublin in the course of which he admitted that he was an archbishop appointed by the pope but he denied that he had come to ireland to stir up strife or to encourage treasonable conspiracies on one occasion at least he was subjected to horrible torture to extract from him some damaging emissions at the advice of walsingham his feet and legs were encased in tin boots and he was held over a fire as he still refused to submit he was tried by court-martial and condemned in june fifteen eighty four he was hanged in dublin edmund mcgarren who was translated from Ardal to Armagh in 1587, devoted himself earnestly to the task of inducing the Catholic princes of Ulster to defend their religion in their territories. He was slain during a battle between Maguire of Fermanagh and the English in 1593. 
Redmond O'Gallagher, Bishop of Derry, was specially active throughout the whole province of Ulster, and so powerful were his protectors that for years the government agents were afraid to arrest him. But in the end he was slain, together with three of his priests, by soldiers from the Lao Foyle garrison, 1601. In the early years of Elizabeth's reign, the government, for motives of prudence, abstained from adopting violent measures to promote the change of religion. But after 1570 there was a decided change, and particularly after 1580 the persecution was carried on with great bitterness. Many of the clergy, both secular and regular, were put to death. Among the latter, the few Jesuits who had come into the country to help to carry on the work begun by Father David Wolfe, the Franciscans, and the Dominicans, were pursued with relentless severity. Sometimes they were put to death by the soldiers without any form of trial, sometimes they were executed according to the proclamations of martial law, and sometimes they were allowed a form of trial. But the fact that they were priests was sufficient to secure their conviction. Several laymen were put to death for refusing to change their religion, for harboring priests, or for having studied in some of the Catholic colleges on the continent. Although Henry VIII had succeeded in destroying many of the religious houses, Still, in a great part of the north, west, and south of Ireland, the law had not been enforced, and even in the districts where the English held sway, several of the monasteries enjoyed a precarious existence, partly owing to the kindness of certain nobles, partly also to royal exemptions. But with the gradual subjugation of the country during the reign of Elizabeth, more determined measures were taken for the suppression of such institutions. According to a return presented to the authorities in London, 1578, Thirty-four abbeys and religious houses, with their very good lands belonging to them, never surveyed before 1569, were seized, as were also seventy-two abbeys and priories concealed from Her Majesty. From a revenue return presented in 1593, it can be seen that the suppression of these houses and the seizure of their property helped considerably to strengthen the royal exchequer. From the possessions in Ireland that belonged formerly to religious houses in England, the Queen received annually, in round numbers, five hundred and thirty-eight pounds. From the lands belonging to St. John of Jerusalem, seven hundred and seventy-six pounds. From those of the Monastery of Thomastown, five hundred and fifty-one pounds. From the possessions of St. Mary's Abbey, Dublin, three hundred and twenty-nine pounds. And from the monasteries and other religious houses in Ireland, four thousand seven hundred and sixteen pounds. The destruction of the monasteries did not, however, mean the extinction of the mendicant orders. They still continued to maintain themselves in the country, so that during the worst days of the 17th century, the Franciscans and Dominicans were to be reckoned with as the most dangerous opponents of the religious policy of the English government. Only in case of one bishop, the notorious Miller McGrath, was Elizabeth able to secure submission. He was a Franciscan friar who, having been sent to Rome to petition that the vacant see of Down and Connor should be conferred on Shane O'Neill's brother, took steps to secure the appointment for himself, 1565. Finding on his return that he could not hope to get any revenue from his diocese on account of the opposition of O'Neill, he made a submission to the Queen, 1567, and received as his reward the Diocese of Clogger, and later on the Archbishopric of Cashel, 1570. For the greater part of his term of office, as Archbishop, he held the sees of Waterford and Lismore, and when he resigned from them in 1607, he obtained a grant of Achenry in Killala. While pretending to be scandalized by the toleration shown to Catholics, and especially to Catholic officials, and to be anxious that the laws should be enforced with the utmost rigor, he took measures to warn the clergy whenever there was danger of arrest. On one occasion, when he was in London, Having learned that a raid was contemplated against the priests, he wrote to his wife to warn Bishop McGraw of Cork to go into hiding at once, and to send away the priest who had taken refuge in his own palace at Cashel, lest he should get into trouble. He was denounced by the officials in Dublin as a traitor, a drunkard, and a despoiler of the goods of the church. He sold or leased the properties of his diocese, kept a large number of benefices in his own hands solely for the sake of the revenue, appointed his own sons, his daughter, and his daughter-in-law to parishes to provide them with an income, built no schools, and allowed the churches to go into ruins. His children made no secret of the fact that they were Catholics, and the archbishop himself seemed to think that though Protestantism had been useful to him in life, the old religion would be preferable at death. In 1608, faculties had been granted to Archbishop Kearney of Cashel for absolving McGrath from the guilt of heresy and schism. 
Some years later he besought a Franciscan friar to procure his reconciliation with Rome, promising that for his part, if the Pope required it, he would make a public renunciation of Protestantism. This request of his was recommended warmly to the Holy See by Monsignor Bentivoglio and Renuncio at Brussels. But the love of the Archbishop for the revenues of Cashel and of his other bishoprics and benefices seems to have proved stronger than his desire for pardon, for he continued to enrich himself and his friends at the expense of the state church till his death in 1622. It was believed by his contemporaries that on his deathbed he abjured his errors and was reconciled with the church by one of his former religious brethren. The destruction of the religious houses and collegiate churches during the reigns of Henry the Eighth, Edward the Sixth, and Elizabeth dealt a heavy blow to Irish education. Here and there, through the country, clergy and laymen contrived to teach schools and to give their pupils a sound knowledge of the classics, as well as of the language, literature, and history of their country. But the theological colleges were closed. Oxford and Cambridge were no longer safe training places for Irish ecclesiastics, and unless something could be done at once, there was grave danger that when the bishops and clergy, who were then at work, passed away, they would leave none behind them to take their places. Fortunately, the close and direct communications between Ireland and the Catholic nations of the continent suggested the possible method of preventing such a calamity by the establishment, namely, of Irish colleges in Rome, France, Spain, and the Netherlands. These institutions owed their existence to the efforts of Irish bishops and priests, and to the generous assistance of the popes and the sovereigns of Spain and France. They were supported by the donations of individual benefactors, by grants from the papal treasury or the royal treasuries of Spain and France, and by the fees paid by students, some of whom were wealthy enough to bear their own expenses, while others of them were ordained priests before they left Ireland, so that they might be able to maintain themselves from their honoraria for masses. In Spain, Irish colleges were established at Salamanca, Seville, Alcala, Santiago de Capistola, and Madrid. The college at Salamanca was founded by Father Thomas White, S.J., a native of Clonmel, with the approval of Philip II, in 1592 under the title of El Real Colegio de Nobles Irlandeses. The King of Spain provided a generous endowment, and the control of the college was entrusted to the Jesuits. Shortly after its foundation, complaints were made in the names of O'Neill and O'Donnell that the administrators of the college showed but scanty attention to the claims of students from Ulster and Connaught. 1602, a complaint which seems to be justified by the rules of matriculation on which the names of very few students from these provinces are to be found. Those who presented themselves at Salamanca took an oath to return to labor in the Irish mission after the completion of their studies, and to enable them to do this, a certain sum of money was granted to them from the royal treasury of Spain to cover the expenses of the journey to Ireland. Many of the most distinguished of the Irish bishops and priests during the 17th century were men who had graduated at Salamanca. The College of Compostela was founded in 1605 and was endowed partly by Philip III and was placed in charge of the Jesuits. It served as an auxiliary to Salamanca and its students were sent there for their theological training. The College of the Immaculate Conception at Seville owed its origin, 1612, to some of the Irish secular clergy. It was endowed very generously by Philip III, who placed the Jesuits in control of it in 1619. To help to provide for the support of the students, the Irish merchants, who carried on a brisk trade with Seville and Cadiz at this period, bound themselves to bestow on the college a certain percentage on every cask of wine they shipped, while Paul V granted permission to the fishermen of the province of Andalusia to fish on six Sundays or holidays, on condition that they devoted the results of their labors to the support of the Irish College. The College at Madrid was founded by Father Theobald Stapleton, 1629, and was used principally as a hospice for the reception of Irish priests, who had completed their studies, and who came to the Spanish capital to receive the money, guaranteed by the king to enable them to return to Ireland. In 1657, George de Paz y Silveria, who was related on his mother's side to the Macdonalds of Antrim, founded a college at Alcala, principally for students from the north of Ireland. According to the directions of the founder, the election of the rector was vested in the hands of the student body, a regulation that led to grave disorders, and finally to the closing of the college. The Irish College at Lisbon owed its existence to the activity of the Jesuits, notably of Father John Holing. It was opened in 1593, 
but it was only two years later that owing to the kindness of a spanish nobleman a permanent residence was acquired over which father white s j was placed as rector the community of irish dominican fathers was opened at lisbon as was also a convent of dominican nuns irish students received a friendly welcome not merely in spain but also in the spanish netherlands from the middle of the sixteenth century several ecclesiastical students from ireland fled to louvain for their education but it was only in sixteen twenty three that archbishop mcmahon of dublin succeeded in founding a separate institution the celebrated collegium pastorali for the training of secular priests for the irish mission out of his own private resources he founded six burses in the college and at his earnest request six others were endowed by the propaganda the college was formally approved by urban the eighth in sixteen twenty four and nicholas aylmer was placed over it as its first rector though many of the ablest of the irish bishops and priests of the penal times were educated in the pastoral college still ireland is even more indebted to another irish establishment at louvain the irish franciscan college of st anthony of padua at the petition of florence conry archbishop of tuam himself a franciscan and a devoted supporter of the northern chiefs Philip III recommended the project of an Irish Franciscan college to his representative in the Netherlands, and conferred on the institution a generous endowment. With the blessing and approval of Paul V, the college was opened formally in 1609, and so great was its success that it soon became the leading centre of Irish missionary activity. Here Irish scholars like John Colgan, Hugh Ward, Father Mooney, Bonaventure O'Husey, Hugh McCalwell, etc., found a home and from the Louvain Irish printing press were issued a large number of catechisms, religious treatises, and historical works that did incalculable service for religion and for Ireland. Another very important institution at Louvain was the Irish Dominican Priory, known as the Holy Cross, founded in 1608. A seminary for the education of secular priests was opened at Antwerp in 1629 as a result of the exertions and generosity of Father Lawrence Sedgrave and his nephew Father James Talbot. It was supported from the revenues bestowed upon it by its founders, from the grants of the papal nuncio at Brussels, and from the donations of Irishmen, laymen as well as clerics. At Tournay, a seminary for Irish priests was founded by Father Christopher Cusack, and its students attended lectures in the college belonging to the Jesuits. Nearly all the Irish establishments in the Netherlands continued their work until they were destroyed during the troubled period that followed on the outbreak of the French Revolution. In France, too, Irish students found a welcome and a home. Colleges set apart entirely for their use were opened in Paris, Douai, Lille, Bordeaux, Toulouse, and Nantes. The Irish college in Paris may be said to date from the year 1578, when Father John Lee and a few companions from Ireland took up their residence in the College Montagu. Later on, a friendly nobleman, John de la Scopier, placed a special house at their disposal, and Father Lee became the first rector of the new seminary, which was recognized officially by the University of Paris in 1624. Later on, the College des Lombards was acquired, as is also the present house in the Rue des Hollandes. The College in Paris was favored especially by the Irish bishops, as is evident from the fact that in the year 1795, more than one-third of the Irish clerical students on the continent were receiving their training in the French capital. The seminary in Douai was founded by Father Ralph Cusack in 1577. At that time, Douai belonged to the Spanish Netherlands, and the Irish seminary participated in the boundless generosity of the kings of Spain. The Irish seminary at Lille was founded also by Father Cusack, and was placed under the control of the Capuchins. Though it was intended principally for the use of students from the province of Leinster, special attention was devoted to the Irish language, without a knowledge of which no person could be appointed rector. The seminary at Bordeaux was founded in 1603 by Father Diarmuid McCarthy, a priest of the Diocese of Cork, and later on it received special grants and privileges from the Queen Regent, Anne of Austria. The same kind benefactress provided a home for the Irish students at Toulouse, 1659, while a few years later a seminary for the Irish students was established at Nantes. Very early in Elizabeth's reign, the question of providing priests for the Irish mission engaged the earnest attention of the Roman authorities. Gregory the Thirteenth had arranged for the establishment of an Irish college in Rome, and had provided the means for its support. But as an expedition was then being prepared to aid James Fitzmaurice in his struggle in Ireland, the project was postponed, and the money was devoted to the purposes of the war. 
In 1625, the Irish bishops addressed a petition to the Holy See, praying for the establishment of an Irish college in Rome. Cardinal Ludovisi, then Cardinal Protector of Ireland, supported strongly this petition. He secured a home for the accommodations of a few students, and in 1628 the college was opened. In his will, the Cardinal provided generously for the endowment of the college, and he also expressed a wish that it should be entrusted to the care of the Jesuits. They entered into control in 1635 and directed the affairs of the college till a short time before the suppression of the society. Elizabeth and her advisers were not slow to see the danger of allowing Irish youth to be educated in Rome, France, or in the territories of the King of Spain. For years the English government had been advised to take measures for the establishment of a good system of English schools as the best means of conquering the country. It was suggested that with the suppression of the monasteries and the wholesale confiscation of their possessions, something might be done by Henry VIII or Edward VI for the cause of education. But these hopes were doomed to speedy disappointment. The revenues of the religious houses, which had provided centers of learning for the boys and girls of the country, found their way into the royal treasury or into the pockets of the dishonest commissioners, and no educational establishments were erected in their place. The deputy did indeed inform the canons of St. Patrick's Dublin that their church should be converted to a better use, namely a university, but the promise was made only to induce them to surrender without a struggle. The valuable church plate, crosses, etc., were melted down and handed over to the mint. At the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth, a proposal was made to carry out the promise of Henry VIII by converting St. Patrick's into a university. Archbishop Kerwin objected strongly to such a suggestion, nominally on the ground that a university would only serve as an excuse for the Irish rebels to send their sons to the capital to learn the secrets of the Pale, but in reality because he feared that the project would interfere with his own income. At various times and in various forms the plan was brought forward once more. Sir John Perrot was anxious to signalize his term of office as Lord Deputy by the establishment of a university in Dublin, but Archbishop Loftus, who as Archbishop of Armagh had supported the conversion of St. Patrick's into a university, having changed his mind once he had secured his own transference to Dublin, opposed warmly the project of the Deputy. When, however, he had succeeded in saving St. Patrick's for his relatives and dependents, he brought forward another proposal, namely, that the Corporation of Dublin should hand over the site of the old monastery of All Hallows for the establishment of a university. The Corporation agreed to this proposal, and in 1592 a charter was granted by Elizabeth. An appeal was then issued for subscriptions, and in a short time about £2,000 was collected, many of the Anglo-Irish Catholics being amongst the subscribers. In 1593, Trinity College was opened for the reception of students. Though care had been taken by the Archbishop when discussing the subject with the Corporation of Dublin, most of the members of which were still Catholic, and by the Deputy when appealing for funds for the erection of the buildings, not to raise the question of religion, yet Trinity College was intended from the beginning to be a bulwark of Protestantism as well as of English power in Ireland. Elizabeth had already done much to forward the cause of the new religion by getting possession of the children of the Anglo-Irish or Irish nobles and bringing them to England to be reared up as Protestants and as Englishmen. And it was hoped that Trinity College, supported by the diocesan schools, would do for the better class of the nation what Oxford and Cambridge were doing for the unfortunate children of the chiefs who were kidnapped in the name of religion and statesmanship. The new college set itself to carry out exactly the wishes of its founders, and in return for its compliancy, it received large endowments from the English crown, mainly by grants of confiscated territories in different parts of Ireland. Yet in spite of all the measures that were taken, commissions, fines, executions, bestowal of honors and appointments, diocesan schools, and kidnapping of children, the Reformation made but little progress. The truth is that Elizabeth's representatives in Ireland had not the power to enforce her wishes in regard to religion, nor did Elizabeth herself desire to stir up a general insurrection by attempting to punish the lay nobles for their flagrant disregard of her ordinances. Thus, in 1585, Walsingham sent over express instructions to the Protestant Archbishop of Armagh, Long, that the gentlemen of the Pale were to be excused from taking the oath of allegiance and in 1591 Sir George Carew informed Lord Deputy Fitzwilliam that the Queen was displeased with him because she feared that he was too forward in dealing with matters of religion, 
and that he, Carew, had attempted to excuse a deputy by pointing out that on account of the forbearance of the government, they of the pale were grown insolent. At one time Elizabeth wrote to the deputy and council, blaming them for neglecting to push forward the interests of the new religion, 1599, while the very next year she instructed Lord Mountjoy not to interfere by any severity or violence in matters of religion, until the power of England was established so firmly that such interference could be effective. The reason for this wavering attitude is not difficult to understand. Elizabeth feared that a general attack upon religion as such would be the best means of inducing all the Catholic noblemen to forget their personal rivalries and unite in one great national confederation. Such a turn of events might have proved disastrous to English interests in Ireland, and hence care was taken to allow a certain measure of toleration to the noblemen, and to explain away the punishments inflicted on the clergy, as having been imposed not on account of religion, but on account of their traitorous designs. This is brought out very clearly in a letter of Sir George Carew to the Privy Council in 1600. The citizens of Waterford had been reported for their complete and open disregard of the new religion, and Carew was charged with the work of punishing such disobedience. He wrote that he would handle the matter of religion as nicely as he could, and that he would endeavour to convict the leaders of the movement of treason, because, he added, if it do appear in the least that any part of their punishment proceeds for matter of religion, it will kindle a great fire in this kingdom. In 1576, Hugh Brady, the Protestant Bishop of Meath, reported to the Lord Deputy that the condition of the established church was lamentable, that the priests, though deprived of their livings, continue to maintain themselves on the voluntary offerings of the people, that the churches have fallen into a state of decay, that no ministers were at hand who could address the people in their own language, and that to remedy this state of affairs, Englishmen should be sent over as bishops to organize the new religious body, and Scotchmen should be requested to act as preachers. When such a state of affairs existed in the Pale Districts, it is easy to see that Protestantism had as yet made little progress among the Irish people. Two years later, Lord Justice Drury and Sir Edward Fighton, treasurer, announced to the Privy Council that on their arrival in Kilkenny, the Protestant Bishop of Ossory reported to them that not only is the chiefest men of that town, as for the most part they are bent to popery, refused obstinately to come to the church, and that they could by no means be brought to hear the divine service there with their wives and families, as by her majesty's injunctions they are bound to do, but that almost all the churches and chapels or chancels within his diocese were utterly ruined and decayed, and that neither the parishioners nor others that are bound to repair them and set them up could by any means be won or induced to do so. The Lord Justice and his companion called the chief men of Kilkenny before them and bound them in recognizances of forty pounds each, that they and their wives should duly every Sunday and holiday frequent the church and hear the divine service. Waterford was equally bad. In 1579, Sir William Pelham reported that Marmaduke Middleton, who had been appointed bishop by Elizabeth, had met with a bad reception in Waterford, partly through the contemptuous and obstinate behavior of the mayor and his brethren of that city, and partly by the clergy of that church. The dean of Waterford had made himself particularly disagreeable, and on account of his behavior, Pelham recommended that he ought to be deprived of his dignity as an example to the citizens who were the most arrogant papists that live within this state. Bishop Middleton was most anxious to get himself removed from Waterford, where he feared that his life was in danger. He reported that Waterford was given over to Rome runners and friars, that clergy and people were united to prevent Her Majesty's most godly proceedings, that Rome itself held no more superstition than the city over which he ruled, and that most of the Protestant incumbents were little better than Woodkern. Even towards the end of Elizabeth's reign, Waterford was still, as it had been when she ascended the throne, strongly Catholic. The Privy Council in England warned Sir George Carew that though the evil disposition of the Irish people in most places of that kingdom, and especially of the inhabitants of Waterford, in matters of religion, was perfectly well known, and though great toleration had been shown them, lest they should have an excuse to rise in rebellion, yet something must be done to repress the presumption and insolency of the people. For it had been announced by the Archbishop of Cashel, Magrath, that in Waterford there are certain buildings, erected under colour and pretence of almshouses or hospitals, but that the same are in very deed, intended and publicly professed to be used for monasteries and such like houses of religion, and that friars and popish priests are openly received and maintained in them and exercised their service of the Mass openly, and usually in many places, 
as if they were in no awe or fear of any exception to be taken thereunto it is noteworthy however as indicating the extent of english influence at that time in ireland that the members of the privy council warned the president of munster that they do not think it convenient that any extraordinary course should be taken or any disturbance made to inquire after or to punish them for their masses or any other popish superstitions unless they show thereby openly to the world an insolent contempt for her majesty's authority in fifteen ninety seven when lord borough was sent over as lord deputy elizabeth instructed him to discreetly inquire of the state of religion whereof we are informed she wrote there hath been notorious negligence and that the orders of religion are in few parts of our realm there observed and that which is to be lamented even in our very english pale multitudes of parishes are destitute of incumbents and teachers and in the very great towns of assembly numbers not only forbear to come to the church or divine service but are even willingly winked at to use all manner of popish ceremonies she ordered him to examine into the cause of this general defection to see what have the ecclesiastical commissioners been doing all these years and to forward his views as to how this general defection might be reformed in some convenient sort and not thus carelessly suffered as though she had granted toleration to popery three years later sixteen hundred sir george carew furnished a very gloomy report on the progress of the new religion if the spaniards do come hither he wrote i know no part of the kingdom that will hold for the queen and the cities themselves will revolt with the first for it is incredible to see how our nation and religion is maligned and the awful obedience that all the kingdom stands in unto the romish priests whose excommunications are a greater terror unto them than any earthly horror whatsoever and until of late although the townsmen have ever been obstinate papists yet pro forma the mayors and aldermen would go to the church but now not so much as the mayors will show any such external obedience and by that means the queen's sword is a recusant which in my judgment is intolerable nevertheless i do not think it good to insist much upon it in this troublesome time as for masses and such slight errants here they are of no great estimation i am not over curious to understand them so as they be not used contemptuously and publicly in derogation of the queen's laws but the mayors of the cities and corporate towns to be let run in so manifest contempts i do not wish nor is it strange that the new religion had made such little progress in ireland apart from the fact that the irish people were thoroughly catholic at heart the means adopted to bring about their apostasy was not of such a kind as to ensure success the english sovereigns their officials in dublin and a section of the anglo-irish nobles aimed at getting possession of the ecclesiastical property and patronage and once they had attained their object they had but scant regard for the claims of religion englishmen were sent over as archbishops or bishops who could not preach in a language that the people could understand and who had no other desire than to enrich themselves their children and their relatives archbishop brown has set an example in this direction which example was not lost on his successor adam loftus who was so greedy in petitioning for appointments that his chapter was forced to demand from him a pledge that he would look for nothing more archbishop long of armagh fifteen eighty four to eighty nine wasted the property of the diocese to such an extent that his successor had barely an income of one hundred and twenty pounds a year and not a house to give him shelter miller mcgrath enriched himself out of cashel emley waterford and lismore killala and achenry twenty of the parishes of emley were held by himself twenty-six by his sons daughters and near relations nineteen were left vacant men fitter to keep hogs and to serve in church were pointed to some livings and in the two dioceses cashel and emley there was not one preacher or good minister to teach the subjects their duties to god and his majesty craig of kildare cavanagh of ossory and allen of ferns were accused of alienating the diocesan property of their respective sees with the single exception of brady the protestant bishop of meath against whom loftus declared he could bring such charges as he would be loath to other hardly one of the men appointed by elizabeth to irish bishoprics was worthy of his position loftus was an impecunious courtier mcgrath had no religion except to make money and indulge his passion for strong drink knight the scotchman who was sent to cashel to watch him was removed on account of public drunkenness devereux was appointed to ferns although according to loftus he had been deprived of his deanship on account of confessed immorality 
Richard Dixon was deprived of his see within one year after his appointment by the Queen for manifest adultery, and Marmaduke Middleton of Waterford, having been translated to St. David's, was accused of grave misdemeanors, the most serious of which was the publication of a forged will, and was degraded by the High Commission Court. With such men in charge of the work of reforming the clergy and people of Ireland, it is no wonder that the Reformation made so little progress. The men into whose hands the property and patronage of the church had passed took no steps to look after the repair of the church buildings or to provide clergy to preach the new religion. In some cases their neglect was due to the fact that they themselves were Catholic in their sympathies, and in other cases because they did not want to incur any expenses. As a consequence, the churches were in ruins and roofless, and no religious service of any kind was provided. Few English ministers of good standing in their own country cared to come to Ireland, except possibly in the hope of securing a bishopric in the Pale Districts, and as a consequence, the men who came were of some bad note, on account of which they were obliged to leave their own country. Hence, in order to provide ministers to spread the new gospel, it was necessary to ordain those who were willing to receive orders as a means of making their living. It is no wonder, therefore, that Edmund Spencer described the Irish Protestant clergy of the period as bad, licentious, and most disordered. Whatever disorders, he writes, you see in the Church of England, you may find in Ireland, and many more, namely, gross simony, greedy covetousness, incontinence, careless sloth, and generally all disordered life in the common clergymen. And besides all these, they have their particular enormities, for all Irish ministers that now enjoy church livings are in a manner mere laymen, saving that they have taken holy orders. But otherwise they go and live like laymen, follow all kinds of husbandry, and other worldly affairs, as other Irishmen do. They neither read the scriptures, nor preach to the people, nor administer the communion. A good account of the motley crowd who had been enlisted to carry out the work of reform is given by Andrew Trollope, himself an English lawyer and a Protestant. Although he referred particularly to Munster, his account may be taken as substantially correct for the rest of Ireland. In truth, he wrote, such they, the clergy, are as deserve not living or to live, for they will not be accounted ministers but priests. They will have no wives. If they would stay there, it were well, but they will have harlots. And with long experience and some extraordinary trail of those fellows, I cannot find whether the most of them love lewd women, cards, dice, or drink best, and when they must of necessity go to church, they carry with them a book of Latin of the common prayer set forth and allowed by her majesty. But they read little or nothing of it, or can well read it, but they tell the people a tale of Our Lady, or St. Patrick, or some other saint, horrible to be spoken or heard, and intolerable to be suffered, and do all they may to allure the people from God and their prince and their due obedience to them both, and persuade them to the devil and the Pope. The Lord Deputy sent a report to England in 1576 on the lamentable state of the Church in Ireland. There are, he wrote, within this diocese, Meath, 224 parish churches, of which number 105 are appropriated to sundry possessions, no parson or vicar resident upon any of them, and a very simple or sorry curate, for the most part appointed to serve them, among which number of curates only eighteen were found able to speak English, the rest being Irish ministers, or rather Irish rogues, having very little Latin and less learning and civility. In many places the very walls of the churches are thrown down, very few chancels covered, windows or doors ruined or spoiled. If this be the state of the church in the best peopled diocese and best governed country of this your Rome, as in truth it is, Easy is it for your majesty to conjecture in what case the rest is, where little or no reformation, either of religion or manners, hath yet been planted, and continued among them. If I should write unto your majesty what spoil hath been, and is of the archbishoprics, of which there are four, and of the bishoprics, whereof there are above thirty, partly by the prelates themselves, partly by the potentates, their noisome neighbours, I should make too long a libel of this my letter." But your majesty may believe it upon the face of the earth, where Christ has professed, there is not a church in so miserable a case. Spencer drew a sharp contrast between the Catholic clergy and the ministers of the new gospel. It is great wonder, he wrote, to see the odds which are between the zeal of the popish priests and the ministers of the gospel. 
for they spare not to come out of Spain from Rome and from Rheims by long toil and dangerous travelling hither, where they know peril of death awaiteth them, and no reward or riches are to be found, only to draw the people unto the church of Rome. Whereas some of our idle ministers, having a way for credit and estimation thereby opened unto them, and having the livings of the country offered unto them without pains and without peril, will neither for the same, nor any love of God, nor zeal of religion, nor for all the good they may do by winning souls to God, be drawn forth from their warm nests, to look out into God's harvest. But though the attempts to seduce Ireland from the Catholic faith had failed to produce any substantial results, yet there could be no denying the fact that Elizabeth had gone further to reduce the country to subjection than had any of her predecessors. The overthrow of the Geraldines and their allies in the south, the plantation of English undertakers in the lands of the Earl of Desmond, the seizure of McMahon's country, and the attempted plantation of Clandeboy, the appointments of presidents of Munster and Connaught, the reduction of several counties to Shirelands, the nomination of sheriffs to enforce English law, and the establishment of garrisons in several parts of the country, made it clear to any thoughtful Irishman that unless some steps were taken at once, the complete reduction of their country was only a matter of a few years. In the north, Hugh O'Neill, son of Matthew O'Neill, was looked upon as the most powerful nobleman of the province. Like his father, he had been in his youth an English O'Neill, and for that reason he was created Earl of Tyrone. 1585, and was granted most of the territories of Shane the Proud. But he distrusted the English, as he was distrusted by them. The treacherous seizure of Hugh O'Donnell, the planting of an English garrison at Portmore, along the Blackwater, and the warlike preparations begun by Sir Henry Bagenall, made it evident to him that the government aimed at the complete overthrow of the Irish chieftains. Having strengthened himself by alliances with Hugh O'Donnell, Maguire, and the principal nobles of the North, he rose in arms, seized the fortress of Portmore, laid siege to Monaghan, and inflicted a very severe defeat on the English forces at Clontibret, 1595. Whatever might have been his ulterior object, O'Neill put the question of religion in the forefront. Already it had been noted by the English officials that O'Neill, though brought up in England, was attached to the Romish Church. In their negotiations with the government, after the defeat of the English forces at Clontibret, both O'Neill and O'Donnell demanded that all persons have free liberty of conscience. Similar demands were made by the other chieftains of Ulster, and later on by all the Irish nobles in Connaught, Leinster, and Munster. In reply to these demands, the commissioners announced that in the past the Queen had tolerated the practice of the Catholic religion, and so in likelihood she will continue the same. When the report of these negotiations reached England, Elizabeth was displeased. The request for liberty of conscience was characterized as disloyal. O'Neill was to be informed that this had been a later disloyal compact made betwixt him and the other rebels, without any reasonable ground or cause to move them thereunto, especially considering there hath been no proceedings against any of them to move so unreasonable and disloyal a request as to have liberty to break laws, which Her Majesty will never grant to any subject. Though the negotiations were continued for some time, neither side was anxious for peace. Elizabeth and her officials strove to secure the support of the Anglo-Irish of the Pale and of a certain section of the Irish nobles. Unfortunately, she was only too successful. Most of the Anglo-Irish nobles, though still devoted to the Catholic faith, preferred to accept toleration at the hands of Elizabeth rather than to fight side by side with O'Neill for the complete restoration of their religion. O'Neill and O'Donnell turned to Spain and Rome for support. From Spain they asked for arms, soldiers, and money to enable them to continue the struggle. From the Pope they asked also for material assistance, but in addition they demanded that he should republish the bull of excommunication and deposition issued against Elizabeth by Gregory the Thirteenth, that he should declare their war to be a religious war in which all Catholics should take the side of the Irish chiefs, that he should excommunicate the Catholic noblemen who had taken up arms in defense of the Queen, that he should grant them the full rights of patronage enjoyed in Ulster by their predecessors, and that he should appoint no ecclesiastics to vacant sees without their approval. These requests were supported strongly at Rome by Peter Lombard, 1601, who was appointed later an Archbishop of Armagh, and as a result, Clement VIII determined to send a nuncio to Ireland in the person of Ludovico Mansoni, 1601. Philip III of Spain at last consented to dispatch a force into Ireland, but instead of landing in the north, where O'Neill and O'Donnell were all-powerful, 
the spanish exhibition under command of don juan del aquila arrived off kinsale and took possession of the town september sixteen o one for the three years preceding the arrival of the spaniards the northern chiefs had been wonderfully successful they had defeated marshal bagenal at the yellow ford fifteen ninety eight had overthrown the forces of sir conyers clifford at the curlew mountains fifteen ninety nine and had upset all the plans of the earl of essex who was sent over specially by elizabeth to reduce them to subjection hardly however had the spaniards occupied kinsale when they were besieged by the new deputy lord mountjoy and by carew the president of munster an urgent message was dispatched by them requesting o'neill and o'donnell to march to their assistance and against their own better judgment they determined to march south to the relief of their allies even still had they been satisfied with hemming in the english forces as o'neill advised they might have succeeded but instead of adopting a waiting policy they determined to make an attack in conjunction with the spanish force as a result they suffered a complete defeat sixteen o two O'Neill conducted the remnant of his army towards Ulster. O'Donnell was dispatched to seek for further help to Spain, from which he never returned, and Aquila surrendered Kinsale and other fortresses, garrisoned by Spaniards. Carew laid waste the entire province of Connaught, while Mountjoy marched to Ulster to subdue the northern rebels. The news of the death of O'Donnell in Spain, the desertion of many of his companions in arms, and the total destruction of the cattle and crops by Mountjoy forced O'Neill to make overtures for peace. An offer of terms was made to him, and good care was taken to conceal from him the death of Queen Elizabeth. He decided to meet Mountjoy and to make his submission. 1603. End of chapter 9. Part 2. Chapter 10, Part 1 of History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Church in Ireland during the Reign of the Stuarts, 1604-1689. The news of the death of Queen Elizabeth and of the accession of James I came as a welcome relief to the great body of the Catholics of Ireland. As the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and in a sense the descendant of the Irish kings of Scotland, he was regarded with favour both within and without the pale. While king of Scotland, he had been in communication with the Pope, with the Catholic sovereigns of the continent, and with O'Neill, and even after he had been proclaimed in London, he promised some of the leading Catholic lords that they might expect at least toleration. Without, however, waiting for any such promises, the Catholics in the leading cities of the East and South made open profession of their religion. In Kilkenny, Thomastown, Waterford, Wexford, Cashel, Cork, Limerick, etc., they took possession of the churches, abolished the Protestant service wherever it had been introduced, and restored the Mass. James White, Vicar General of Waterford, made himself especially conspicuous as the leader in this movement in the southeastern portion of Ireland. Lord Mountjoy was in a difficult position. He was uncertain as to the religious policy of the king, but in the end he determined to suppress the Catholic movement by force. He marched south to Kilkenny and thence to Waterford, where he had an interview with Dr. White. Everywhere the churches were restored to the Protestants, though it was hinted that the Mass might still be celebrated privately as in the days of Elizabeth. In Cork the condition of affairs was much more serious, and it was necessary to bring up the guns from Hobbeline before the mayor and citizens could be induced to submit. Reports came in from all sides that the country was swarming with Jesuits and seminary priests, that they were stirring up the people to join hands with the King of Spain and to throw off their allegiance to James I. These rumors were without foundation, as is shown by the fact that most of the towns and cities in Leinster and Munster, which were noted as specially Catholic, had not stirred a finger to help O'Neill in his war against Elizabeth. But they were put in circulation to prejudice the mind of King James against his Irish Catholic subjects, and to wean him away from the policy of toleration, which he was said to favour. Loftus, Archbishop of Dublin, and Jones, Bishop of Meath, hastened to warn the king against the policy of toleration. They threw the whole blame of the late war on the Jesuits and seminary priests, and cast doubts upon the loyalty of the Catholic noblemen of the Pale. They called upon His Majesty to make it clear, even in the morning of his reign, that he was ready to maintain the true worship and religion of jesus christ to let the people understand that 
he will never permit and suffer that which in his godly zeal he so much abhors to devise some means of preventing the plots and aims of jesuits and seminary priests who come daily from beyond the seas teaching openly that a king wanting the pope's confirmation is not a lawful king to send over some learned and discreet preachers to the principal cities and towns and to compel the people by some moderate coactions to come to church to hear their sermons and exhortations as a means of spreading the new gospel amongst the irish people it was recommended that a learned ministry be planted and that the abuses of the clergy be reformed that all bishops jesuits seminary priests and friars should be banished from the kingdom that no lawyer be admitted to the bar or to the privy council unless they attended the protestant service and that all sheriffs, mayors, justices of the peace, recorders, judges, and officials be forced to take the oath of supremacy. Loftus and Jones insisted, furthermore, that Catholic parents should be forbidden to send their children to Douay and Reims, and should be compelled to send them to the Protestant diocesan schools. They reported that, although the Bishop of Meath had opened a school in Trim, at great expense to himself, only six scholars attended, and that when the teachers began to use prayers in the school and to show themselves desirous of bringing their pupils to church the pupils departed and the teachers though graduates of the university were left without any work to do as james showed great reluctance to take any active measures against the catholics bronker the president of munster lyons protestant bishop of cork and the other members of the council of munster issued a proclamation fourteenth august sixteen o four ordering all jesuits seminaries and massing priests of what sort soever as are remaining within one of the corporate towns of the province to leave before the last day of september and not to return for seven years any persons receiving or relieving any such criminals were threatened with imprisonment during his majesty's pleasure and with a fine of forty pounds for every such offence and whosoever should bring to the lord president and council the bodies of any jesuits seminaries or massing priests were promised a reward of forty pounds for every jesuit six pounds three shillings four pence for every seminary priest and five pounds for every massing priest fearing however that his action might be displeasing to the king bronker took care to write to cecil though the cities of the south were crowded with seminary priests who said mass publicly in the best houses even in the hearing of all men and that he had delayed taking action till they began to declare boldly that his majesty was pleased to tolerate their idolatry sir john davies a native of wiltshire who was made solicitor-general for ireland on account of his poetical talent was not opposed to the policy of repression but at the same time he held firmly that until the protestant church in ireland was itself reformed there could be no hope of converting the irish people writing to cecil february sixteen o four he is informed he says that the churchmen for the most part throughout the kingdom are mere idols and ciphers and such as cannot read if they should stand in need of the benefit of their clergy and yet the most of those whereof many be serving men and some horse boys are not without two or three benefices apiece for the court of faculties doth qualify all manners of persons and dispense with all manner of non-residences and pluralities the churches are ruined and fallen to the ground in all parts of the kingdom there is no divine service no christening of children no receiving of the sacraments no christian meeting or assembly no not once in a year in a word no more demonstration of religion than among tartars or cannibals in his opinion there was no use in asking the bishops of the pale to hold an inquiry into the abuses for they themselves were privy to them but if the business is to be really performed let visitors be sent out of england such as never heard a cow speak and understand not that language that they may examine the abuses of the court of faculties of the simoniacal contracts of the dilapidations and desertion of the churches that they may find the true value of the benefices and who takes the profits and to whose uses to deprive these serving men and unlettered kern that are now incumbents and to place some of the poor scholars of the college who are learned and zealous protestants to bring others out of that part of scotland that borders on the north of ireland who can preach the irish tongue and to transplant others out of england and to place them within the english pale at last yielding to the advices that poured in on him from all sides james i determined to banish the jesuits and seminary priests in the hope that when they were removed the people might be induced to submit and to insist on compliance with the terms of the act of uniformity he issued a proclamation fourth july sixteen o five denying the rumour that he intended 
to give liberty of conscience or toleration of religion to his Irish subjects, and denouncing such a report as a libel on himself, as if he were more remiss or less careful in the government of the Church of Ireland than of those other churches whereof he has supreme charge. He commanded all Jesuits, seminary priests, or other priests whatsoever, made and ordained by any authority derived or pretended to be derived from the See of Rome, to depart from the kingdom before the end of December. All priests who refused to obey, or who ventured to come into Ireland after that date, and all who received or assisted such persons, were to be arrested and punished, according to the laws and statutes of that realm, and all the people were exhorted to come to their several parish churches or chapels to hear divine service every Sunday and holiday, under threat of being punished for disobedience. The royal proclamation produced little or no effect. The Jesuits and seminary priests remained, and even increased in numbers, by new arrivals in the continental colleges, and from England, where the law was more strictly enforced. Nor could the leading citizens, the mayors and the aldermen of the principal cities, be forced to come to church, because they preferred to pay the fine of twelve pence prescribed in the Act of Uniformity for each offence. The government officials determined, therefore, to have recourse to more severe, if less legal, remedies. They selected a certain number of wealthy citizens of Dublin, addressed to each of them an individual mandate in the king's name, ordering them to go to church on a certain specified Sunday, and treated disobedience to such an order as an offence punishable by common law. Six of the aldermen were condemned to pay a fine of one hundred pounds, and three citizens fifty pounds, one half of the fine to be devoted to the repairing of decayed churches or chapels or other charitable use the other half to go to the royal treasury in addition to this they were condemned to imprisonment at the will of the lord deputy and declared incapable of holding any office in the city of dublin or in any other part of the kingdom twenty second november sixteen o five a few days later other aldermen and citizens of dublin were brought before the irish star chamber and having been interrogated why they did not repair to their parish churches they replied that their consciences led them to the contrary. They were punished in a similar manner. Thus, two methods were adopted for enforcing obedience to the act of uniformity. One, the infliction on the poor of the fine of twelve pence, prescribed for each offence by the law of 1560. The other, the promulgation of individual mandates, disobedience to which was to be punished by the court of Star Chamber. The noblemen of the Pale, alarmed by such high-handed action, presented a petition against the measures taken for the suppression of their religion, praying that the toleration extended to them hitherto should be continued. In reply to their petition, the Viscount Gormanston, Sir James Dillon, Sir Patrick Barnwall, and others were committed as prisoners to the castle, and others of the petitioners were confined to their houses in the country, and bound to appear before the Star Chamber at the opening of the next term. December 1605. Sir Patrick Barnwall, the first gentleman's son of quality that was ever put out of Ireland to be brought up in learning beyond the seas, was the ablest of the Catholic palesmen, and was sent into England at the request of the English authorities. The appeal of these Catholic lords, backed as it was by the danger of a new and more general rebellion, was not without its effects in England. In January 1607, the Privy Council in England wrote to Sir Arthur Chichester, Lord Deputy, that although the reformation of the people of Ireland, extremely addicted to popish superstition by the instigation of the seminary priests and Jesuits, is greatly to be wished, and by all means endeavoured, still a temperate course ought to be preserved. There should be no question of granting toleration, but at the same time there should be no startling of the multitude by any general or rigorous compulsion. The principal men in the cities, who show themselves to be the greatest offenders, should be punished. The priests and friars should be banished, but no curious or particular search should be made for them. Viscount Gormanston and his companions should be released under recognizances, except Sir Patrick Barnwall, who was to be sent into England. The Dublin aldermen should be treated in a similar manner, but should be obliged to pay the fines and the Protestant clergy should be exhorted to take special pains to plant the new religion, where the people have been least civil. But Chichester, Davies, Brownker, and their companions had no intention of listening to the counsels of moderation. They continued to indict the poorer classes according to the clauses of the Act of Uniformity, and to cite the wealthier citizens before the Star Chamber for disobedience to the royal mandates. 
In Waterford, Sir John Davies reported, We proceeded against the principal aldermen by way of censure at the council table of the province for their several contempts against the king's proclamations and the special commandments of the Lord President under the council seat of Munster. Against the multitude we proceeded by way of indictment upon the statute of two Elizabeth, which giveth only twelve pence for absence from church every Sunday and holiday. The fines imposed at the table were not heavy, being upon some fifty pounds apiece, upon others forty pounds, so that the total sum came to but four hundred pounds. But there were so many of the commoners indicted, that the penalty given by the statute, twelve pence, came to two hundred forty pounds, or thereabouts. Punishments of a similar kind were inflicted in New Ross, Wexford, Clonmel, Cashel, Ugal, Limerick, Cork, and in all the smaller towns throughout Munster. In Cork the mayor was fined one hundred pounds, and in Limerick more than two hundred of the burgesses were indicted, the fines paid by these being given for the repair of the cathedral. Steps were also taken in Connaught to enforce attendance at the Protestant service. Five of the principal citizens of Galway were summoned before the court and fined in sums varying from forty pounds to twenty pounds, and punishments of a lesser kind were inflicted in other portions of the province. In Drogheda, the greatest number of the householders, together with their wives, children, and servants, were summoned and fined for non-attendance at church. In Meath, West Meath, Longford, Kings County, and Queens County, the government officials were particularly busy. But though here and there a few of the prominent citizens and of the poorer classes were driven into public conformity by fear of punishment, the work of winning over the people to Protestantism made little progress. In Cashel, the commissioners reported, 1606, that they found only one inhabitant who came to church, and even the Archbishop's McGrath, own sons and sons-in-law, dwelling there, were noted as obstinate recusants. Bronker, president of Munster, was particularly severe in his repressive measures, so much so that on his death, 1606, his successors were able to announce that almost all the men of the towns were either prisoners or upon bonds and other contempts. But they added the further information that many of those who had been comfortable in his time had again relapsed. The Protestant Bishop of Cork complained, 1607, that in Cork, Kinsale, Ugal, and in all the country over which he had charge, no marriages, christenings, etc. were done except by popish priests for seven years that the country was run over by friars and priests who were called fathers, that every gentleman and lord of the country had his chaplains, that massing is in every place, idolatry is publicly maintained, God's word and his truth is trodden down underfoot, despised, railed at, and contemned of all, the ministers not esteemed, no, not with them that should reverence and countenance them. The professors of the gospel, he added, may learn of these idolaters to regard their pastors, Sir John Davies, with his usual keen insight, placed the blame for the comparative failure of the Protestant clergy. If our bishops and others that have care of souls, he wrote, 1606, were but half as diligent in their several charges as these men, the Jesuits and seminary priests, are in the places where they haunt. The people would not receive and nourish them as now they do. But it is the extreme negligence and remissness of our clergy here which was first the cause of the general desertion and apostasy and is now again the impediment of reformation the catholics had protested continually against the proceedings under royal mandates as illegal and their protests were brought before the english privy council by sir patrick barnwall who had been sent over to london as a prisoner the judges in england condemned the proceedings in ireland as unwarrantable and without precedent Barma was allowed to return to Ireland in 1607, and the new method of baggering or Protestantizing the wealthier class of Irish Catholics was dropped for the time. The king had been advised, too, to enforce the oath of supremacy in case of all officials of the crown. Though in the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth something had been done in that direction, yet in later times, owing to the dangerous condition of the country, Catholic officials were not called upon to renounce the Pope. As a result, when James ascended the throne, many of the judges were Catholic, as were, also, the great body of the lawyers. In response to the advice from Ireland that judges who refused to attend church and to take the oath should be dismissed, and that recusant lawyers should be debarred from practicing in the courts, James instructed the council to induce John Everard, a justice of the common pleas, to resign or conform. The mayors and aldermen of the cities, too, had never taken the oath of supremacy, in 1607 the Lord Deputy and Council of Ireland informed the Privy Council in England that, 
most of the mayors and principal officers of cities and corporate towns, and justices of the peace of this country, both refused to take the oath of supremacy, as is requisite by the statute, and for an instance, the party that should this year have been mayor of Dublin, avoided it to his very great charges, only because he would not take the oath. The contention, apparently, was that the mayors, not being crown officials, were not bound to take the oath, but the lawyers decided against such a view, and steps were taken to imprison those mayors who refused, and to destroy the charge of recusant corporations. Still, in spite of the attempted banishment of the clergy, the enforcement of attendance at church by fines, and the punishment inflicted on the officials who refused to take the oath, the deputy and council were forced to admit that they had made no progress. The people, they wrote, 1607, in many places resort to mass, now in greater multitudes, both in town and country, than for many years past. And if it chance that any priest known to be factious and working be apprehended, both men and women will not stick to rescue the party. In no less multitudes do these priests hold general councils and conventicles together many times about their affairs. And, to be short, they have so far withdrawn the people from all reverence and fear of the laws, and loyalty towards his majesty, and brought their business already to this pass, that such as are conformed and go to church are everywhere derided, scorned, and oppressed by the multitude, to their great discouragement and to the scandal of all good men. Although the persecution of James I was violent, the Catholics were well prepared to meet the storm. The Jesuits had sent some of their best men to Ireland, including Henry Fitzsimmon, who was thrown into prison, and after a long detention sent into exile. Christopher Holywood, James Archer, Andrew Moroni, Barnabas Kearney, etc., and although there were complaints that their college in Salamanca showed undue favor to the Anglo-Irish, this college, as well as the other colleges abroad, continued to pour priests into Ireland, both able and willing to sustain the Catholic religion. The Dominicans and Franciscans received great help from their colleges on the continent, so that their numbers increased rapidly, and they were able to devote more attention to instructing the people. As in England, the young generation of priests, both secular and regular, sent out from the colleges in France, Spain, and the Netherlands, were much more active and more determined to hold their own than those who preceded them. They were in close touch with Rome, where their agents kept the papal court informed of what was going on in Ireland. Clement VIII hastened to send his congratulations to James I on his accession to the throne, and to plead with him for toleration for his Catholic subjects. James White, Vicar General of Waterford, wrote, 1605, to inform Cardinal Baronius of the measures that had been taken to suppress the Catholic religion, and to offer his good wishes to Paul V. The latter forwarded a very touching letter, in which he expressed his sympathy with the Irish Church, commended the fidelity of the Irish people, and exhorted them to stand firm in the face of persecution. The only weak point that might be noted at this period was the almost complete destruction of the Irish hierarchy. O'Dovany of Down and Connor, Brady, the Franciscan Bishop of Kilmore, and O'Boyle of Raffo were the only bishops remaining in the province of Ulster since the murder of Redmond O'Gallagher of Derry. Peter Lombard had been appointed Archbishop of Armagh, 1601, but he never visited his diocese. In the province of Leinster, Matthew de Oviedo, a Spanish Franciscan, had been appointed to Dublin, 1600, and had come to Kinsale with the forces of Spain. He returned to plead for a new expedition to Ireland. Another Spanish Franciscan, Francis de Ribera, had been appointed to Leyland, 1587, and he died in 1604 without having done any work in his diocese. The rest of the seas in Leinster were vacant. In Munster, David O'Kearney was named Archbishop of Cashel, 1603, and soon showed himself to be a man of great activity and fearlessness. Dermot McCraw of Cork had been for years the only bishop in the province, and had exercised the functions of his office, not merely in the south, but throughout the province of Leinster. In the province of Tuam, all the sees were vacant. Wherever there was no bishop in residence, care was taken to appoint vicars. In Dublin, Bernard Moriarty, who acted as vicar, was arrested in the Franciscan convent in Montefernin in 1601, and died in prison from the wounds he received from the soldiers. Robert Laylor, who acted in the same capacity, was arrested, tried, and banished in 1606. Although the Earl of Tyrone had been restored to his estates and had been received graciously by the king, 1603, he was both distrusted and feared by the government. Sir Arthur Chichester, 
who had come to act as Lord Mountjoy's deputy in 1605, and who was appointed Lord Lieutenant on the death of the latter, 1607, was determined to get possession of Ulster, either by driving O'Neill into rebellion or by bringing against him some charge of conspiracy. New and insulting demands were made upon O'Neill. The Protestant Archbishop of Armagh and the Protestant Bishop of Derry and Raphael claimed large portions of his territories as belonging to their churches, and some of the minor chieftains were urged on to appeal against him to the English authorities. Having learned in 1607 that he stood in danger of arrest, he and Rory O'Donnell determined to leave Ireland. In September 1607, they sailed from Rathmullen, and on the 4th October they landed in France. After many wanderings, they made their way to Rome, where they received a generous welcome from Paul V. O'Donnell died in 1608, and O'Neill, who had cherished till the last a hope of returning to Ireland, died in 1616. Both chieftains were laid to rest in the church of St. Pietro de Montorio. Although the flight of the earls caused a great sensation both in England and Ireland, and although James I was said to have been pained by their departure, and even to have thought for a time of granting religious toleration, Chichester and his companions were delighted at the result of their work. The flight of Tyrone and Tarconnell, the attempt at rebellion of Sir Cahir O'Dowerty, and the trumped-up charges brought against some of the other noblemen in the north, opened up the prospect of a new and greater plantation than had ever been attempted before. Tyrone, Fermanagh, Donegal, Derry, Armagh, and Cavan were confiscated to the crown at one stroke, and preparations were made to carry out the plantation in a scientific manner. The greater portion of the territory was divided into lots of 2,000, 1,500, and 1,000 acres. The undertakers who were to get the largest grants were to be the English or Scotch Protestants, and were to have none but English or Scotch Protestant tenants. Those who were to get the 1,500 acres were to be Protestants themselves, and were to have none but Protestant tenants, while the portions of 1,000 acres each might be parceled out amongst English, Scotch, or Irish, and from these Catholics were not excluded. Thousands of acres were appropriated for the support of the Protestant religion, for the maintenance of Protestant schools, and for the upkeep of Trinity College. A small portion was kept for a few of the old Catholic proprietors, and the remainder of the population were ordered to leave these districts before the 1st May, 1609. Many of them remained, however, preferring to take small tracts of the mountain and bog land from the new proprietors than to trust themselves amongst strangers. But a great number of the able-bodied amongst them were caught and shipped to serve as soldiers in the army of Sweden. For some time after the flight of the earls, there seems to have been a slight lull in the persecution the king and his advisers, fearing perhaps that their action was only a prelude to a more general rebellion, in the course of which O'Neill might return at the head of a Spanish force. But once it was clear that no danger was to be apprehended, the Irish officials began to urge once more recourse to extreme measures. Fines were levied on Catholic towns, some of which, however, were remitted by the king. It was represented to Salisbury, 1609, that the Catholics had grown much more bold even in Dublin, that in the country they drew thousands to their idolatrous sacrifices, and that the Jesuits stir up the forces of disloyalty. The writer of this letter recommended that the fine of twelve pence should be exacted off the poor every time they absented themselves from religious services, that so much should be levied off the rich, as would suffice to repair all the churches and build free schools in every county, and he himself undertook to pay four thousand pounds a year for the right to collect the fines of the recusants in Munster, Leinster, and Connaught, provided only that he could count on the support of the ecclesiastical and civil authorities. In the following year, Chichester informed the authorities in England that the mayors of cities and towns, for the most part, refused to take the oath of supremacy, as did also the sheriffs, bailiffs, etc., and he inquired in what manner he should act towards them. To put an end to this state of affairs, Andrew Knox was sent over to Ireland as Bishop of Raffo, and was commissioned to take measures to stir up the Protestant bishops, and to suppress popery. On his arrival he found that he had a heavy task before him. In a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, 1611, he wrote that there were only four men in the ministry who have knowledge or care to propagate the Evangel. The defection, he wrote, is so great of those who sometimes profess the truth that where hundreds came to several churches before, they resort now scarce six, 
the gathering and flocking in great numbers of jesuits seminary priests friars and getting papists of all sorts were so frequent from rome and all parts beyond the seas that it seems to him the greatest lading the ships bring to this country are burdens of them their books clothes crosses and ceremonies natives and others in corporate towns publicly profess themselves their maintainers there is no diocese but it has a bishop appointed and consecrated by the pope nor province that wants an archbishop nor parish without a priest all actually serving their time and the pope's direction and plenteously maintained by the people so that the few ministers that are and bishops that profess to do any good profit no more than lot did in sodom in short it may be expected that if god the king and his grace prevent not this unnatural growth of superstition the face of the kingdom will be shortly clad with this darkness he lost no time in summoning a meeting of the bishops sixteen eleven most of whom according to him were not very reliable the archbishop of dublin jones was burdened with the cares of state the archbishop of armagh was somewhat old and unable the archbishop of cashel mcgrath was old and unable whose wife and children would not accompany him to the church the archbishop of tuam was well willed and best learned but wanted maintainers and helpers and the bishops of waterford and limerick were described as having no credit in accordance with the instructions that had been forwarded to them by the king they agreed that they would take common action for the suppression of papistry and the plantation of religion that they would observe the law of residence in their several dioceses that they would make visitations every year of their parishes and inquire into the condition of the churches and the behavior of their ministers that by authority of his majesty's commission they would carefully tender the oath of allegiance to every nobleman knight justice of the peace and other officers of corporate towns and make a return to the lord deputy of those who took the oath as well as of those who refused it that they would admit no cleric to any spiritual promotion who would not willingly take the oath of supremacy and that they would inquire in every deanery what persons receive or harbor trafficking priests jesuits seminaries and massing priests and friars and will present their names together with the names of the said priests and jesuits to the lord deputy a royal proclamation was issued sixteen sixty one ordering all jesuits and priests to depart from the kingdom immediately the laity were commanded to attend the protestant service under threat of severe penalties students in foreign colleges were ordered to return at once and catholic schoolmasters were forbidden to teach within the kingdom backed by all the powers of the crown knox and his fellow bishops set up a terrible inquisition in every part of the country and spared no pains to hound down the clergy and those who entertained them to drive the poorer classes by brute force into the church to harass the better classes by threats and examinations and to wipe out every vestige of the catholic religion Cornelius O'Devany, a Franciscan, who had been appointed Bishop of Down and Connor, 1582, was arrested together with a priest who accompanied him, was tried in Dublin, and was hanged, drawn, and quartered, 1612. Almost at the same time, the Protestant Bishop of Down and Connor was accused of incontinence, the turning away of his wife, and taking the wife of his manservant in her room, subordination of witnesses, and alienation of the diocesan property he fled from his diocese was arrested degraded and died in prison the archbishop of glasgow and bishop knox of ruffo himself a scotchman hastened to london to secure the appointment of one of their countrymen as his successor but chichester wrote that though he would not say that scotchmen were not good men he could aver that they were hot-spirited and very griping and such as were not fit for these parts several attempts were made to arrest dr eugene matthews or mcmahon who had been transferred, 1611, by the Pope from Clogger to the Archbishopric of Dublin. He was detested especially by the government, because it was thought that he owed his promotion to the influence of O'Neill, who was also suspected of having had a voice in the appointment of the learned Franciscan, Florence Conry de Tuam, 1609. During the course of these years, jurors were threatened by the Crown lawyers with the Star Chamber unless they found a verdict of guilty and were sent to prison for not returning a proper verdict against those accused by the protestant ministers of not attending church wars of court though catholic were committed to the guardianship of protestants and in every grant a special clause was inserted that the ward shall be brought up at the college near dublin trinity college in english habit and religion the irish were excluded from all offices men of no property were appointed as sheriffs and the fines for non-attendance at church were levied strictly 
Instead of being applied to the relief of the poor, they found their way, according to the Catholic lords of the Pale, into the pockets of the ministers. In reply to this last charge, Chichester asserted that they were not given to the poor because all the poor were recusants, but they were employed in the rebuilding of churches, bridges, and like charitable purposes. Yet Knox did not succeed in uprooting the Catholic faith in Ireland. According to a report furnished, 1613, to the Holy See by Monsignor Bindevoglio, internuncio at Brussels, whose duty it was to superintend affairs in Ireland, heresy had made little progress even in the cities, while the nobility and gentry were nearly all Catholic. There were then in Ireland about 800 secular priests, 130 Franciscans, 20 Jesuits, and a few Benedictines and Dominicans, of whom the Franciscans were held in special esteem. The best of the secular clergy were those who came from Douay, Bordeaux, Lisbon, and Salamanca. In the following year, 1614, Archbishop Matthews of Dublin held a provincial synod at Kilkenny, at which many useful regulations were made regarding the conduct of the clergy, preaching, catechizing, the celebration of Mass, the administration of the sacraments, the relations between the secular and regular clergy, the reading of controversial literature, and the observance and number of fast days and holy days. In the province of Armagh, Dr. Roth, acting under authority received from Peter Lombard, convoked a provincial synod at Drogheda, 1614. It was attended by vicars from the several dioceses, and by representatives of the various religious orders, and passed regulations somewhat similar to those enacted at Kilkenny. In both synods, the clergy were warned to abstain from the discussion of state affairs, and from disobedience to the civil rulers in temporal matters. At Drogheda, the new oath of allegiance, framed by James I, was condemned as being opposed to faith and religion. Catholics were commanded not to have recourse to prevarication, or wavering in regard to it, but to reject it openly, and were warned against attendance at divine worship in Protestant churches, even though they had previously made a declaration that they meant only to pay a mark of respect to the civil rulers. At the same period, the Franciscans and Dominicans founded new colleges on the continent, at Douay and Lisbon, to supply priests for their missions in Ireland. During the later years of Elizabeth's reign, the disturbed condition of the country made it impossible to convene a parliament, and after the accession of James I, his advisers feared to summon such a body, lest they might be unable to control it. Still, they never lost sight of the advantage it would be to their cause, could they secure parliamentary sanction for the confiscation and plantation of Ulster, and for the new methods employed for the punishment of recusants. These, for so far, had behind them only the force of royal proclamations, and their legality was open to the gravest doubt. The great obstacle that must be overcome before a parliament could be convoked was the fact that both in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords the Catholics might find themselves in a majority. To prevent such a dire catastrophe, it was determined to create a number of new parliamentary boroughs, so that many places that could scarcely pass the rank of the poorest villages in the poorest country in Christendom were allowed to return members, provided only that it was certain they would return Protestants. Nineteen of the thirty-nine new boroughs were situated in Ulster, where the plantations had given the English and Scotch settlers a preponderance. In the House of Lords the situation was also critical, but it was hoped that by summoning all the Protestant bishops, and also certain peers of England, who had got grants of territory in Ireland, the government could count on a majority, especially as some of the Catholic lords were minors, and as such not entitled to sit. For months, the plans for packing the Parliament and for preparing a scheme of anti-Catholic legislation were being concocted, and the Catholic lords, knowing well what was going on, felt so alarmed that they lodged a solemn protest with the King against the erection of towns and corporations, consisting of some few poor and beggarly cottages, into parliamentary boroughs, against the wholesale exclusion of Catholics from office on account of their religion, and conjured the king to give order that the proceedings of Parliament may be conducted with moderation and indifferency. In spite of this protest, the new boroughs were created, and the elections were carried out in the most high-handed manner. The sheriffs hesitating at nothing so long as they could secure the nomination of Protestant representatives. On the day preceding the opening of Parliament, fixed for 18th May, 1613, the Catholic lawyers of the Pale addressed a protest to the Lord Deputy. They asserted that while several of the Irish Catholic nobles entitled to sit in the House of Lords were not summoned, English and Scotch lords, already parliament in other kingdoms, 
had been invited to attend, that new corporations had been created, many of them since Parliament was summoned without any right or title except to assure a Protestant majority, that the sheriffs and returning officers had acted most unfairly during the election, and that the Parliament sitting in the principal fort and castle of the kingdom, surrounded by numbers of armed men, could not be regarded as a free assembly. When the House of Commons met on the following day, the Catholics proposed that Sir John Everard, who had been dismissed from his office of judge because he refused the oath of supremacy, should be elected speaker, while the Protestants proposed Sir John Davies for this position. The Catholics, knowing well that if the returns of the sheriffs were accepted, they would find themselves in the minority, maintained that the members against whose return objection had been lodged should not be allowed to vote. On this being refused, they tried to prevent a vote being taken, and when the supporters of Davies left the chamber to take account, the Catholics installed Sir John Everard in the chair. The Protestants, claiming that they had a clear majority, 127 out of a possible 232, removed Sir John Everard by force, and adopted Sir John Davies as Speaker. The Catholics then left the chamber, and both lords and commoners refused to attend any further sessions until they should have laid their grievances before the king. In consequence of their refusal, it was necessary to suspend the parliamentary session, and both parties directed all their attention to an appeal to the king. The Catholics sent to London as their representatives, Lords Gormanston and Dunboyne, Sir James Gow, and Sir Christopher Plunkett, William Talbot, and Edward Fitzharris and a general levy was made throughout the kingdom to raise money to pay their expenses. A great deal of time was wasted in inquiries in London and in Ireland. James found it difficult to decide against the Lord Deputy, while at the same time he could not shut his eyes to the justice of several of the claimants brought under his notice by the Catholics. At one time he promised their delegates that he would not interfere with the free exercise of their religion, provided they admitted it was not lawful to deprive him of his crown or to offer violence to his person. But when the Lord Deputy wrote, warning him of the effect this speech had produced in Ireland, James, while not denying that he had used the words attributed to him, issued a proclamation announcing that he would never grant religious toleration and ordering all bishops, Jesuits, friars, and priests to depart from the kingdom before the 30th of September, 1614. In April, 1614, the king decided to annul 13 of the returns impeached by the Catholics, but in regard to the other matters of complaint, he gave judgment in favor of the Lord Deputy. In a personal interview with the Catholic lords, he pointed out that it was his privilege to create as many peers in parliamentary boroughs as he liked. The more the merrier, the fewer the better cheer. He informed them, too, that they were only half subjects so long as they acknowledged the Pope, and could, therefore, expect to have only half privileges, and expressed the hope that by their future good behavior in Parliament they might merit not only his pardon but his favor and cherishing. In October 1614, Parliament was at last ready to proceed with its business. During the course of the negotiations, it would appear that the plan of passing new penal legislation against Catholics was abandoned. It was intended at first to enact a very severe measure for the expulsion of Jesuits and seminary priests, and another frame with the intention of making the laws against Catholics in England binding in Ireland. But these clauses were struck out, probably as a result of a bargain between the Catholic lords and the king. In return for this toleration, the Catholic lords agreed to support the Act of Attainder, passed against O'Neill and O'Donnell, together with their aiders and abettors, and to approve of the wholesale confiscation that had taken place in Ulster. In vain did Florence Conry, Archbishop of Tuam, call upon the Catholic members to stand firm against such injustice. His warning, that if they consented to the robbery of their co-religionists of the North, their own turn to be robbed would surely come, fell upon deaf ears. Their loyalty to England had nerved them to draw their swords against O'Neill, and it nerved them also to assist Chichester and Davies to carry on the Ulster plantations. Well might the latter boast in his letter to the Earl of Somerset that the service performed by this Parliament was of such importance as greater has not been effected in any Parliament of Ireland these hundred years. For, first, the new erected boroughs have taken place, which will be perpetual seminaries of Protestant burgesses, since it is provided in the charters that the provost and twelve chief burgesses, who are to elect all the rest, must always be such as will take the oath of supremacy. Next, all the states of the kingdom have attained Tyrone, 
the most notorious and dangerous traitor that ever was in Ireland, whereof foreign nations will take notice, because it has been given out that Tyrone had left many friends behind him, and that only the Protestants wished his utter ruin. Besides, this attainder settles the plantation of Ulster. Chichester, who had planned the plantation of Ulster, and who had enriched himself out of the spoils of the northern princes, was removed from office in 1615, and was succeeded by Sir Oliver St. John, who came to Ireland determined to support the anti-Catholic campaign. In a short time, more than eighty of the best citizens of Dublin were in prison because they refused the oath of supremacy, and throughout the country, jurors who refused to convict the Catholics were themselves held prisoners, so that the jails were soon full to overflowing. Immense sums were levied off both poor and rich for non-attendance at Protestant religious service. In the county cavern, for example, the fines for one year amounted to about eight thousand pounds, while large sums were paid by the Catholic noblemen for protection from the Protestant inquisitors. New plantations were undertaken on the lines of the Ulster Plantation in Wexford, Longford, Kings County, and Leitrim, though not having been carried out so thoroughly or so systematically as the former, they had not the same measure of success. All Catholic noblemen succeeding to property were obliged to take the oath of supremacy, though apparently they could procure exemption from this test by the payment of a fine. But the court of wards took care that minors should be entrusted to Protestant guardians, and should be sent, if possible, to Trinity College. By means such as these, Elizabeth and James succeeded in Protestantizing a certain number of the heirs to Irish estates. Proclamations were issued once more against the clergy, both secular and regular, and so violent was the persecution that the bishops of Ireland addressed a petition to the Catholic rulers of Europe, and especially to the King of Spain, asking them to intercede with James on behalf of his Irish Catholic subjects, 1617. The negotiations for the marriage of Prince Charles to a Spanish princess made it necessary for the king to be more guarded in his religious policy in Ireland. Oliver St. John, who had shown himself to be such a bitter enemy of the Catholics, was removed from office, and Lord Falkland was sent over as deputy in 1622. Rumors were afloat on all sides that his policy was to be one of toleration. The Protestants were alarmed, and at the installation of the new deputy, September 1622, James Usher, then Protestant Bishop of Meath, taking at his text, He beareth not the sword in vain, preached a violent sermon in favor of religious persecution. Primate Hampton wrote immediately to the preacher, reproving him for his imprudence, asking him to explain away what he had said about the sword, and advising him to spend more of his time in his own diocese of Meath, where matters were far from being satisfactory. On the return of Charles from Spain, a new proclamation was issued, 1624, ordering all titulary popish archbishops, bishops, vicar generals, abbots, priors, deans, Jesuits, friars, seminary priests, and others of that sect, made or ordained by authority derived from the see of Rome or other foreign parts, to depart from the kingdom within forty days under pain of his majesty's indignation and penalties. If any of these dared to remain, or if any persons dared to receive them, the offenders were to be lodged in prison, to the end such further order may be taken for their punishment, as by us shall be thought fit. A full account of the position of the Catholics of Ireland is given in a letter written from Dublin in 1623. Catholic minors were compelled to accept the oath of supremacy before they could get letters of freedom from the court of wards, established 1617. All mayors, magistrates, officials, etc., of corporate towns were commanded to take the oath under penalty of having their towns disenfranchised. Priests were arrested and kept in prison. Laymen were punished by sentences of excommunication and by fines for non-attendance at Protestant worship. They were summoned before the consistorial courts for having had their children baptized by the priests, and were punished with the greatest indignities. Catholics were forbidden to teach school, and Catholic parents were forbidden to send their children abroad. The Catholic inhabitants of Dragita were indicted before a Protestant jury, and having been found guilty of recusancy, they stood in danger of having all their property forfeited. In Louth, the juries were ordered to draw up a list of recusants. When three Catholic jurors refused, they were thrown into prison and obliged to give security to appear before the Dublin Star Chamber, and in Cavan, proceedings of a similar kind were taken. Amongst the distinguished bishops of the Irish Church at this period were Peter Lombard, Archbishop of Armagh, 1601-25, a native of Waterford, who studied at Oxford and Louvain, was appointed a professor at the latter seat of learning, took a very prominent part in the 
Congregatio de Auxilis, published some theological treatises together with an ecclesiastical history of Ireland entitled De Regno Hiberniae Sanctorum Insula Commentarius. But who, on account of the danger of stirring up still greater persecution, never visited his diocese? Eugene Matthews, or McMahon, Bishop of Clogger, 1609, and Archbishop of Dublin, 1611, who did splendid work for the Irish Church by the decrees passed in the Provincial Synod at Kilkenny, 1614, as well as by his successful efforts for the foundation of the Pastoral College at Louvain. David O'Kearney, appointed to Cashel, 1603, as successor to the martyred Archbishop of Hurley, who, though hunted from place to place, continued to fill the duties of his office till about the year 1618, when he went to Rome. And Florence Conry, Archbishop of Tuam, a Franciscan who served with the army of the Northern Princes, and who was specially detested by the English government on account of his loyal defence of O'Neill. Not being allowed to return to Ireland, he devoted himself to the study of theology and was the author of several very important works, some of which were not, however, free from the suspicion of something akin to Jansenism. By far the most useful book he composed was the celebrated Irish Catechism, published at Louvain in 1622. During the opening years of the reign of Charles I, 1625-49, the persecution was much less violent and as Charles was married to a French Catholic princess, and as he had promised solemnly not to enforce the laws against Catholics, it was hoped that at long last they might expect toleration. The distinguished Franciscan Thomas Fleming, son of the Baron of Slane, who had received his education in the Irish Franciscan College at Louvain, was appointed Archbishop of Dublin, 1623, and arrived in Ireland two years later. He was able to report that the conduct of the Catholics, not only in Dublin, but throughout Ireland, was worthy of every praise, and to point to the fact that many who made the pilgrimage to St. Patrick's Purgatory in Laldurg were obliged to return without satisfying their pious desires, because the island was so crowded that there was no room for them to land. Chapels were opened in some of the less pretentious streets in Dublin. Communities of religious orders took up fixed residence in the capital, and the Jesuits summoned home some of their ablest teachers to man a Catholic university, which they opened in Back Lane, 1627. The government stood in need of money to equip and support a new army, then considered necessary on account of the threatening attitude of France, and in order to obtain funds, a large body, both of the Protestant and Catholic nobility, were invited to come to Dublin for discussion. They were offered certain concessions, or graces, in return for a subsidy, and to placate the Catholic peers, it was said that the fines for non-attendance at church would not be levied, and that they might expect tacit toleration. The very mention of toleration filled the Protestant bishops with alarm, and considering the fact that they were dependent upon coercion for whatever congregations they had, their rage is not unintelligible. James Usher, who had become Protestant primate of Armagh, convoked an assembly of the bishops, they declared that the religion of the papists is superstitious and idolatrous, their church in respect of both apostatical. To give them, therefore, a toleration, or to consent that they may freely exercise their religion, and profess their faith and doctrine, is a grievous sin, and that in two respects. For it is to make ourselves accessory not only to their superstitions, idolatries, and heresies, and, in a word, to all the abominations of popery, but also, which is the consequent of the former, to the perdition of the seduced people, which perish in the deluge of Catholic apostasy. To grant them toleration, in respect of any money to be given, or contribution to be made by them, is to set religion to sale, and with it the souls of the people whom Christ our Saviour hath redeemed, with his most precious blood. The Irish deputies arrived in London to seek a confirmation of the graces at the very time that the Third Parliament of Charles, 1627, was petitioning him to put in force the laws against the recusants. The members of the English House of Commons complained that religious communities of men and women had been set up in Dublin and in several of the larger cities, that Ireland was swarming with Jesuits, friars, and priests, that the people who attended formerly the Protestant service had ceased to attend that in Dublin there were thirteen mass-houses, and that papists were allowed to act as army officers, and papists were being trained as soldiers. In these circumstances, the Catholic members of the deputation consented to abandon their claims for full toleration, though it was understood that the fines levied on account of absence from Protestant service would not be enforced, but they were promised that Catholic lawyers would be allowed to practice without being obliged to take the oath of supremacy. In return for the promised graces, which were to be ratified immediately in Parliament, 
the irish nobles promised to pay a sum of one hundred and twenty thousand pounds for the support of the new army the promised parliament was not held nor were the graces conceded either to the irish generally or to the catholics still there was no active persecution for some time the provincial of the carmelites in dublin was able to report to the propaganda sixteen twenty nine that all the ecclesiastics now publicly perform their sacred functions and prepare suitable places for offering the holy sacrifice and that with open doors they now preach to the people say mass and discharge all their other duties without being molested by any one the carmelites he wrote had a large church but not sufficient to contain one-sixth of the congregation the people flocked in crowds to confession and holy communion the franciscans dominicans capuchins and jesuits were hard at work and the parishes were supplied with parish priests who resided in their districts and were supported by the voluntary offerings of the people from a report of the year sixteen twenty seven it is clear that the dominicans had over fifty priests of their order in ireland together with several novices and students but already the enemies of the catholic religion were at work and as a result a proclamation was issued by lord falkland in sixteen twenty nine commanding that all monasteries convents colleges and religious houses should be dissolved that all religious and priests should cease to teach or to perform any religious service in any public chapel or oratory or to teach in any place whatsoever in the kingdom and that all the owners of religious houses and schools should apply them to other uses without delay sixteen twenty nine at first no notice was taken of this proclamation in dublin or in any of the cities of ireland usher wrote to complain of the unreverent manner in which the proclamation was made in drogheda it was done in scornful and contemptuous sort a drunken soldier being first set up to read it and then a drunken sergeant of the town making the same to seem like a may game the priests and friars merely closed the front doors of the churches he said but the people flocked to the churches as usual by private passages lord falkland does not seem to have made any determined effort to carry out the royal proclamation in dublin but unfortunately he was recalled in sixteen twenty nine and in the interval from his departure till the arrival of sir thomas wentworth sixteen thirty two loftus viscount of ely and lord cork were appointed as lord justices immediately the persecution began the protestant archbishop of dublin accompanied by a body of soldiers made a raid upon the carmelite church in cook street while mass was being celebrated on st stephen's day destroyed the altar and statues, and seized two of the priests. But the people set upon the archbishop and the soldiers, and rescued the prisoners. Their troops were called out at once, and several of the Dublin aldermen were lodged in prison. Most of the churches were seized, and the Jesuit university was given over to Trinity College. Attacks of a similar kind were made on the houses and churches of the regular clergy in Cork, Waterford, Limerick, and in various other parts of the country. An order was issued by the Lord's Justices that St. Patrick's Purgatory, together with St. Patrick's Bed and all the vaults, cells, and all other houses and buildings, should be demolished, and that the superstitious stones and materials should be cast into the law. Catholic deputies hastened to London to lay their grievances before the King, but though he was not unwilling to help them, he found it difficult to do much for them on account of the strong anti-Catholic feeling in England. Queen Henrietta Maria did appeal to the new deputy to restore St. Patrick's Purgatory, but, as it was situated, in the midst of the great Scottish plantation, he feared to grant her request at the time. Lord Cork reported that he had set up two houses of correction in dissolved friaries, in which the beggarly youths are taught trades. But soon the King and Wentworth grew alarmed about the storm that the justices were creating in Ireland. The Catholic lords threatened that unless an end was put to the persecution, which was contrary to the graces that had been promised, they would refuse to pay the subsidy they had promised, and letters were sent both by the King and Wentworth, throwing the blame on Loftus and Lord Cork, and reproving them for what they had done. In 1632 Sir Thomas Wentworth, afterwards Earl of Strafford, arrived in Ireland as Lord Deputy. He was a strong man, intensely devoted to the king, and determined to reduce all parties in Ireland to subjection. In religion he was a high churchman of the school of Laud, and opposed to the Scotch Presbyterians of the north of Ireland, almost as much as to the Irish Catholics. From the beginning he was determined to raise the revenues of the crown in Ireland, to establish a strong standing army, and to secure the future peace of the country, by carrying out a scheme of plantations in Connaught and Munster, along the lines followed by the advisers of James I, in case of Ulster. 
one of his first acts after his arrival in ireland was to commission dr john bramhall afterwards protestant bishop of derry and primate to hold an inquiry into the state of the protestant church the latter after having made some investigations informed archbishop laud that he found it difficult to say whether the churches were more ruinous and sordid or the people irreverent in dublin that one parochial church in dublin had been converted into a stable another had become a nobleman's mansion while a third was being used as a tennis court of which the vicar acted as keeper the vaults of christ's church had been leased to papist as tippling rooms for beer wine and tobacco so that the congregation stood in danger of being poisoned by the fumes and the table for the administration of holy communion was made an ordinary seat for maids and apprentices the inferior sorts of ministers were below all degrees of contempt in respect of their poverty and their ignorance and it was told him that one bishop held three and twenty benefices with care of souls wentworth lost no time in trying to raise money for the army but many of the lords both catholic and protestant were so annoyed at the refusal to confirm the graces and at the delay in calling the parliament that had been promised that wentworth was forced to make some concession parliament was convoked to meet in sixteen thirty four and the lord deputy nominated his own supporters in the boroughs so as to counterbalance the representation from the counties which representation he could not in all cases control the catholics were strong in the lower house particularly but care was taken that they should be in a minority the main question was the granting of subsidies but several of the protestants and all the catholics demanded that the graces should first be confirmed both protestant and catholic landowners were interested in safeguarding the titles to their property by having it enacted that sixty years possession should be regarded as a sufficient proof of ownership as such an enactment would have upset all wentworth's plans for a wholesale plantation he succeeded in resisting such a measure and partly by threats partly by underhand dealings with particular individuals he obtained a grant of generous subsidies without any confirmation of the graces End of chapter 10, part 1. Chapter 10, part 2 of History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, volume 2, by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In April 1635, Parliament was dissolved, and almost immediately the Lord Deputy made preparations for acting under the Commission for inquiring into defective titles granted to him by the King. All the Protestants are for plantations, he wrote, and all the others are against them. If the Catholic juries refuse to find a verdict in favor of the King, then recourse must be had to Parliament, where a Protestant majority is assured. Portions of Tipperary, Clare, and Kilkenny were secured without much difficulty, but nothing less than the whole of Connaught could satisfy the deputy. Roscommon was the first county selected, and the commissioners, including the Lord Deputy, arrived in Boyle to hold the inquiry, July 1635. The jury, having been informed by Whitworth that, whether they found in his favour or not, the king was determined to assert his claims to their county, and that their only hope of mercy was their prompt obedience delivered the required verdict. Sligo and Mayo also made their submission. In Galway, however, the jury found against the king. In consequence of this, the sheriff was fined one thousand pounds and placed under bail to appear before the star chamber, and the jurymen were threatened with severe punishment. They were fined four thousand pounds each and ordered to be imprisoned till they should pay the full amount. In this way, the whole of Connaught, with the exception of Leitrim, which was planted already, together with a great part of Clare, Tipperary, and Kilkenny, was confiscated to the crown. But Wentworth postponed the plantation of Connaught to a more favorable period, and before any such period arrived, he had lost both his office and his head. The danger to Charles I from the Scotch Covenanters was already apparent, and Charles urged his deputy to raise an army in Ireland. During the years 1639 and 1640, the work of training the army, many of the officers of which and most of the soldiers were Catholics, was pushed forward. But the triumph of the Scots and the execution of the Earl of Strafford in April 1641 made it impossible to use it for the purpose for which it was designed. 
Acting on the instigation of the English Parliament, Charles sent an order that the Irish troops should be disbanded, and added that he had licensed certain officers to transport 8,000 troops to the aid of any of the sovereigns of Europe friendly to England. For one reason or another, very few of the soldiers left Ireland, as both their own leaders and the king knew well that their services would soon be required at home. Parliament had met in Ireland in March 1640, and, having voted several subsidies to aid the king, it adjourned. When it met again in 1641, the Catholics were actually in the majority, and seemed determined to hold their own. The king wrote to confirm the graces, and to suggest that the bill should be introduced to confirm defective titles in Tipperary, Clare, and Connaught, but the obstructive tactics of the Earl of Ormond, and the unfavorable attitude of the Lord's Justices, Sir William Parsons and Sir William Borlace, towards Catholic claims, prevented anything being done. Parliament was adjourned till the ninth November, but before that date arrived, the issues had been transferred to another and a different court. From 1632 till 1640, though the deputy was doing his best to rob a large portion of the Catholic owners of their property on the grounds of defective titles, and though in many districts the Protestant bishops and ministers created considerable difficulties for their Catholic neighbors, Still, the religious persecution was carried out only in a half-hearted manner. The king was shrewd enough to recognize the important part that might be played by the Irish Catholics in the civil struggle that he foresaw, and he was anxious not to antagonize their leaders. This period of comparative calm was providential for the church in Ireland, by enabling it to organize its forces and to prepare for the terrible days that were soon to come. In accordance with the advice given by Archbishop Lombard years before, Rome decided to fill several of the sees that had been left vacant. Hugh McCallwell, Cavallis, a distinguished Irish Franciscan who had been instrumental in founding the College of St. Anthony at Louvain, and whose theological works caused him to be regarded by his contemporaries as the ablest theologian of the Scottish school in Europe, was appointed Archbishop of Armagh, 1626, but he died in Rome a few weeks after his consecration. Less than two years later, it was decided to transfer Hugh O'Reilly from Kilmore to the Primatial See, 1628. Thomas Fleming had been appointed to Dublin in 1623, and despite the efforts of his enemies, he succeeded in eluding the vigilance of those who wished to drive him from Ireland. Malachy O'Quilly, who had acted for years as vicar apostolic of his native diocese of Killaloe, was appointed to Tuam, 1630, in succession to Florence Conry and Thomas Walsh, a native of Waterford, was promoted to the see of Cashel, 1626. Amongst the distinguished ecclesiastics who were promoted to Irish dioceses during the reign of James I and Charles were the learned David Roth, Ossery, 1618, Roach, McGowan, Rockus de Cruz, who had done so much for the restoration of the Dominican houses in Ireland, Kildare, 1629, and Heber McMahon, Down, 1642, Clogger, 1643. As a result of the long persecution and of the absence of bishops from so many dioceses, a certain amount of disorganization might be detected in several departments, and to remedy this, provincial synods were held to lay down new regulations and to adjust the position of the church to the altered circumstances of the country. A synod was held at Kilkenny, 1627, which was attended by bishops from Leinster and Munster, Another very important one, the decrees of which were confirmed by the Holy See, was held for the province of Tuam in 1632, and a third, attended by the Leinster bishops, was held in the county Kilkenny in 1640. The Irish colleges on the continent continued to pour able and zealous young priests into the country, while the colleges for the education of the Franciscans, Dominicans, and Jesuits supplied new recruits to replenish the ranks of the religious orders. The Capuchin founded Irish colleges on the continent, at Lille, Antwerp, and at Sedan, and so earnestly did they work in Ireland that a special letter in praise of the Capuchins was forwarded to Rome by a number of the bishops in 1642. The results of this renewed activity were soon apparent in every part of the country. Thus, for example, in a report presented, 1631, from the Diocese of Elphin, then ruled by Bishop Boetius, Egan, it can be seen that although all the churches, including the cathedral, had been destroyed or taken possession of by the Protestants, there were at the time forty priests at work in the diocese. The decrees of the Council of Trent had been promulgated, the parishes had been rearranged, and the learning of the parish priests appointed had been tested by examination. 
regular synods, visitations and conferences of the clergy were being held, and steps had been taken to ensure that the people should be instructed fully in their religion. In the Parliament of 1641, the Catholics were in the majority, and they insisted that the graces must be confirmed. The king granted their demands, and the bill was actually on its way to Ireland, when the lords, justices, parsons, and borlais, who administered the government of the country, prorogued the session. They wished for no settlement with the Catholics, lest the settlement might put an end to their hopes of a plantation, and the Earl of Ormond tried also to block the passage of the bill, in the hope of saving the king from the odium which he would incur in England and Scotland, by granting toleration to the Irish Catholics. The Catholic noblemen of Ireland, whether Irish or Anglo-Irish, had good reason to complain. They had seen the Catholics driven out of the good lands of Ulster to make way for English and Scottish planters, and they well knew that the dangerous similar transactions in Connaught, Munster, and Leinster had not passed away with the death of Strafford. They had seen the operation of the Court of Wards, and they could not fail to realize that as a result of its work the landowners of Ireland would soon be dispossessed or Protestantized. They knew something of the Protestant Inquisition courts, as run by the ministers and bishops, of the persecution of their clergy, the fees and fines levied on the unfortunate Catholic peasantry, and of the still graver danger that lay before them, in case the Covenanters and the Puritans were to overthrow Charles I, or to succeed in forcing him to accept their policy. Were they to remain passive, they believed, they could have no hope of redress, or even of safety, and hence many of them made up their minds that the time for negotiations had passed, and that they could rely only on force. Never again were they likely to get such a favorable opportunity. England was torn by internal dissensions. The disbanded Irish soldiers, who had been trained for service against the Scots, were still in the country. And with so many distinguished Irishmen scattered throughout the countries of Europe, there was good hope that they might get assistance from their co-religionists on the continent. The distinguished Waterford Franciscan, Father Luke Wadding, who had founded the College of St. Isidore in Rome, and had taken such a prominent part in the foundation of the Irish College, was in Rome ready to plead the cause of his countrymen at the papal court. His fame as a scholar was known throughout Europe, and his active support could not fail to produce its effect in Europe, and particularly in Spain, where he was esteemed so highly by Philip IV. Owen Rowe O'Neill, who had achieved a remarkable distinction in the army of Spain by his gallant defense of Arras against the French, Colonel Preston, uncle of Lord Germiston, and a host of others, who had learned the art of war in France, Spain, and the Netherlands, were willing to return to Ireland and to place their swords at the disposal of their country. Early in 1641, Rory O'More, who was closely connected with both the Irish and the Anglo-Irish nobles, suggested to Lord Maguire of Enniskillen the idea of an appeal to arms, and hinted at the possibility of a union between the Irish nobles and the lords of the Pale. In a short time, most of the important leaders of the North, Sir Phelim O'Neill, Turlow O'Neill, Lord Maguire, Hugh McMahon, Arthur McGinnis of Down, Philip, and Miles O'Reilly of Cavan, had come to an understanding. The war was to begin in Ulster on the night of the 23rd October, 1641, and on the same night an attempt was made to seize Dublin Castle. The latter portion of the program could not be carried out, owing to the action of an informer who betrayed Maguire and Hugh McMahon to the Lord's Justices. But at the appointed time, the Irish Catholics of Ulster rose almost to a man, and in a very short time most of the strong places in the province were in their hands. In such a movement, it was almost impossible for the leaders to prevent some excesses, particularly as many of the men who took part in it had been driven from their lands to make way for the planters, and had suffered terribly from the harshness and cruelty to which they and their families had been subjected. Naturally, they seized their own again, and in some cases they may have used more violence than the situation required. But it is now admitted by impartial historians that the wild stories of a wholesale massacre of Protestants are without any more solid foundation than the fact that the Protestants were for the most part driven out of Ulster in much the same way as the Catholics had been driven to the mountains thirty years before. Most of the few who were killed were probably struck down while attempting to defend their homes, and in no case is there evidence to prove that the leaders countenanced unnecessary violence or murder. If the historian wishes to look for organized lawlessness and murder, he can find it much more easily in the campaign of the infamous Sir Charles Coote, or in the raids carried out by the forces of the Scotch Covenanters of the North. 
the Catholic lords of the Pale hastened to Dublin Castle to offer their services against the northern rebels, but they were received so discourteously by the lords' justices that they recognized the absolute necessity of joining with the Catholics of Ulster. In announcing their defection, the lords' justices positively gloated over the special prospect of having the province of Leinster planted with English settlers, December 1641. The action of the English Parliament in decreeing that for the future there should be no toleration allowed to Irish Catholics, December 1641, and in putting up for sale 2,500,000 acres of fertile land in Ireland, the proceeds to be expended in a war of extermination, strengthened the hands of the Irish leaders and helped to bring over the waverers to their side. The Catholic clergy had sympathized with the movement from the beginning, but they had exerted themselves particularly in moderating the fury of their countrymen and in protecting the Protestants, both laymen and clerics, from unnecessary violence. But as there was a danger that the movement would break up and that the Irish forces would be divided, it was necessary for the bishops to take action. Religion was nearly the only bond that was likely to unite the Irish and the Anglo-Irish nobles, and the Church was the only institution that could give the movement unity and permanency. A meeting of the bishops and vicars of the northern province was held at Kells, May 1642, under the presidency of Dr. Hugh O'Reilly, Archbishop of Armagh. They prescribed a three days fast, the public recitation of the rosary and the litanies, and a general communion for the success of the war issued a sentence of excommunication against murderers, mutilators, thieves, robbers, etc., together with all their aiders and abettors, denounced the Catholic Irishmen, who refused to make common cause with their countrymen, and ordered all bishops, vicars general, parish priests, and heads of religious houses to spare no pains to raise funds immediately for the support of the soldiers. In May 1642, a national synod was held at Kilkenny. It was attended by the primate of Armagh, the archbishop of Tuam and Cashel, by most of the bishops either personally or by procurators, and by representatives of the religious orders and of the secular clergy. They declared that the war was being waged for the defense of the Catholic religion, for the preservation of the rights and prerogatives of the king, for the just and lawful immunities, liberties, and rights of Ireland, for the protection of the lives, fortunes, goods, and possessions of the Catholics of Ireland, and that it was a just war in which all Catholics should join. They condemned murder, robbery, and violence, advised all their countrymen to lay aside racial and provincial differences, took measures for the restoration of the cathedrals and churches to their owners, exhorted all, both clergy and laymen, to preserve unity, and called upon the priests to offer up mass at least once a week for the success of the war. During the year 1642, the war has spread into all parts of Ireland, and most of the prominent nobles, with the exception of the Earl of Clanrickard, had taken the field. Owen Rowe O'Neill and Colonel Preston had arrived with some of the Irish veterans from the continent and had brought with them supplies of arms and ammunition. Urban the Eighth had forwarded a touching letter addressed to the clergy and people of Ireland, February 1642, and had contrived to send large supplies of weapons and powder. A general assembly of Irish Catholics was called to meet at Kilkenny in October 1642. There were present eleven spiritual peers, fourteen lay peers, and two hundred and twenty-six representatives from the cities and counties of Ireland under the presidency of Lord Mount Garrett. Generals were appointed to lead the forces in the different provinces, as unfortunately, owing to the jealousy between the Anglo-Irish and the Irish nobles, Owen Roe O'Neill could not be appointed commander of the national army. Arrangements were made for sending ambassadors to the principal courts of Europe, for the establishment of a printing press, for raising money, and for the promotion of education. The Irish Franciscans of Louvain were asked to transfer their press and library to Ireland to help in the creation of a great school of Irish learning. Father Luke Wadding, who was appointed the Irish representative at the papal court, and agents were dispatched to France, Spain, the Netherlands, and to several of the German states. Urban the Eighth, yielding to the entreaties of the Irish ambassador, gave generous assistance and wrote to nearly all the Catholic rulers of Europe, recommending them to assist their co-religionists in Ireland. In 1643, the well-known oratorian Father Francisco Scarampi landed in Wexford as the accredited agent of the Pope, bringing with him supplies of money and arms. Hardly, however, had he arrived when he discovered that though the Irish armies had met with considerable success both against the royalist forces in dublin and the scotch covenanters in the north negotiations had been opened up for an extended truce 
the anglo-irish nobles had never been enthusiastic for the war as an irish war they fought merely to preserve their estates and to secure a certain degree of liberty of worship but in their hearts they were more anxious about the cause of the king than about the cause of ireland the marquis of ormond whom the king had created his lord lieutenant in ireland had many friends amongst the lords of the pale and by means of his agents he succeeded in bringing about a cessation september sixteen forty three the irish catholics were to send agents to the king for a full discussion of their grievances and were to help him with supplies anxious to secure the help of the irish catholics and fearing to give a handle to his parliamentary opponents by granting religious toleration charles was in a very difficult position and to make matters worse ormond was determined not to yield to the demands of the catholics he was prepared to make a conditional promise that the laws against them would not be enforced but beyond that he was resolved not to go after long and fruitless negotiations with ormond the war was renewed sixteen forty four representatives from france and spain had arrived in kilkenny and it was thought that if the pope could be induced to send a nuncio such a measure would strengthen the hands of the irish ambassadors on the continent at the request of sir richard bellings secretary to the supreme council innocent the tenth consented to send giovanni battista Minuccini as his representative to ireland sixteen forty five the latter landed at Kenmar in october and proceeded almost immediately to kilkenny in the meantime charles i was being hard pressed in england and as he could have no hope of inducing ormond to agree to such terms as would satisfy the catholics of ireland he commissioned the earl of glamorgan himself a catholic and closely connected with some of the irish families by marriage to go to kilkenny and to procure assistance from the catholic confederation at all costs shortly after his arrival he concluded a treaty in the name of the king august sixteen forty five in which he guaranteed the free and public exercise of the roman catholic religion all churches possessed by the irish catholics at any time since october sixteen forty one were to be left in their hands and all churches in ireland other than such as are now actually enjoyed by his majesty's protestant subjects were to be given back to the catholics all jurisdiction claimed by protestant bishops or ministers over irish catholics was to be abolished and all temporalities possessed by the catholic clergy since october sixteen forty one were to be retained by them two-thirds of the income however to be paid to the king during the continuance of the war charles had already addressed a letter to the nuncio promising to carry out whatever terms glamorgan would concede and adding the hope that though this was the first letter he had ever written to any minister of the pope it would not be the last the terms were to be kept a secret but in october sixteen forty five archbishop o'quilly of tome was killed near sligo in a skirmish between the confederate and parliamentary forces and a copy of the treaty which he had in his possession fell into the hands of the enemy as soon as it was published it created a great sensation in england and charles immediately repudiated it glamorgan was arrested in dublin by ormond but was released after a few weeks and returned coolly to kilkenny to conduct further negotiations since his arrival in kilkenny sixteen forty five the nuncio was anxious to break off negotiations with ormond and to devote all the energies of the country to the prosecution of the war but the anglo-irish of the pale were bent upon accepting any terms that ormond might offer and soon the supreme council was divided into two sections one favouring the nuncio the other supporting ormond negotiations had been opened directly with rome by queen henrietta through her agent sir kenelm digby in return for promises of men and money the latter signed a treaty even much more favourable to the irish catholics than that which had been concluded with glamorgan sixteen forty five but as the original of this treaty had not come to hand and as it was feared that there was little hope of its being put in force the supreme council patched up an agreement with ormond march sixteen forty six although the latter had got a free hand from the king he granted very little to the catholics the oath of supremacy was to be abolished in the next parliament as were to be also all statutory penalties and disabilities his majesty's catholic subjects were to be recommended to his majesty's favour for further concessions all educational disabilities of catholics were to be removed and all offices civil and military were to be thrown open to them even this treaty was kept a secret but in the meantime the confederation should send troops to the assistance of the king but before the troops could be sent charles was driven to take refuge with the scots at newcastle may sixteen forty six from which place he wrote forbidding ormond to proceed further in treaty with the rebels or to make any conditions with them 
Notwithstanding Renatini's earnest entreaties, the majority of the Supreme Council insisted on accepting Ormond's terms. The Confederation had been so weakened by dissensions that General Monroe thought he could march south and capture Kilkenny. But at Benburb he found his way barred by the forces of O'Neill, and he was obliged to retreat to Coleraine, having left a great portion of his army dead on the field, and his standards, guns, and supplies in the hands of O'Neill. 5th June, 1646. The news of the great victory was brought to the nuncio at Limerick, where the captured banners were carried in procession through the streets and deposited in the cathedral. General Preston had also scored some successes in Connaught, so that once again the tide seemed to have turned in favor of the Confederates. Runicini was more than ever determined to refuse half-measures, such as were being offered by the terms of Ormond's treaty. He summoned the meeting of the bishops in Waterford, August 1646, and after long discussion it was agreed that those who accepted Ormond's terms were guilty of perjury, because they had thereby broken the terms of the Oath of Confederation. According to this oath, the members had pledged themselves to be content with nothing less than the free and public exercise of their religion, while Ormond left nearly everything to the goodwill of the king, from whom nothing could be expected, considering the state of affairs in England. In spite of all remonstrances, the Supreme Council published the peace in Kilkenny, but their messengers were refused admittance into several of the cities of the South. Ormond was invited to Kilkenny, where he received a royal reception from his friends, but O'Neill marched south and compelled Ormond to beat a hasty retreat towards Dublin. Runicini returned to Kilkenny, and some of the prominent adherents of Ormond were arrested. A new Supreme Council was chosen, and O'Neill and Preston were commissioned to march on Dublin, but, though they brought their armies close to the city, yet, owing to underhand communications carried on between Ormond's agent and the Earl of Clanrickard and Preston, and the jealousy between the generals, the attack was not made. A new General Assembly had been elected and met at Kilkenny, 10th of January, 1647. After a long discussion, the Ormond peace was condemned, and a new form of oath was drawn up to be taken by all the Confederates. Ormond, who could have done so much for his master had he obeyed his instructions and made some satisfactory offers to the Irish Catholics, surrendered Dublin into the hands of the Parliamentarians, and fled to France. To make matters worse, Preston was defeated by the Parliamentarians at Summerhill, August 1647, and Lord Nchequin was carrying all before him in the south. Everywhere he went he had acted with great savagery, and was especially violent in his opposition to the Catholic religion. But early in 1648 he changed his politics and declared for the king against the Parliament. Immediately the former friends of Ormond on the Supreme Council insisted on making terms with Lord Nchequin. Runicini opposed such a step as a betrayal, and his action was approved by a majority of the bishops. The nuncio left the city and went towards Maryborough, where O'Neill was encamped. In May 1648, the truce with Lord Nchequin was proclaimed, and in a few days Runicini issued a sentence of excommunication against all who would receive it, and of interdict against the towns which recognized it. The Supreme Council replied by appealing to the Pope. The only result was that the division and confusion became more general. Several of the bishops and clergy were to be found on both sides. The Supreme Council dismissed O'Neill from his office, and afterwards declared him a traitor. The nuncio went to Galway, from which port he sailed in 1649. Though it is difficult to entertain anything but the greatest contempt for the Ormond faction and the Supreme Council, and though Renarcini was an honest man who did his best to carry out his instructions, still he did not understand perfectly the situation. He allowed himself to show too openly his preference for O'Neill, and displayed too great an inclination to have recourse to high-handed methods. His arrest of the Ormondist faction on the Supreme Council, and the censures which he leveled against his opponents, however justifiable these things might have been in themselves, were not calculated to restore unity and confidence. Ormond returned to Ireland in 1648, and received a great welcome from those of the Supreme Council, who were opposed to Minuccini and O'Neill. In January 1649 he concluded a peace with them, by which he guaranteed that in the next Parliament to be held in Ireland, the free exercise of the Catholic religion should be conceded, that the Act of Uniformity and the Act of Royal Supremacy should be abolished, that all offices, civil and military, should be thrown open to Catholics, provided they were willing to take a simple oath of allegiance, that all plans for any further plantations in Munster and Leinster and Connaught should be abandoned, that all acts of attainder, etc., passed against Irish Catholics since October 1641, should be treated as null and void, 
that the clergy should not be molested in regard to the churches church livings etc until his majesty upon full consideration of the desires of the catholics formulated in a free parliament should express his further pleasure and that the regular clergy who would accept this peace should be allowed to continue to hold their houses and possessions further concessions were to be dependent on the king's wishes the catholic confederation as such was dissolved and ormond was installed as lord lieutenant to govern the country in conjunction with twelve commissioners of trust appointed by the confederates but o'neill and his army still held out against any terms with ormond and a large number of the cities refused to hold any communications with him still he hoped to capture dublin from the parliamentarians before help could arrive from england but he suffered a terrible defeat at rathmines second august sixteen forty nine Less than a fortnight later, Oliver Cromwell arrived in Dublin with a large force to crush both the Royalists and the Catholics. Cromwell, having taken a little time for his troops to recruit, marched on Drogheda, then held for the king by Sir Arthur Aston, and so earnestly did he push forward the siege that in a short time he carried the city by assault and put most of the garrison and a large number of the citizens to death. Over a thousand were slaughtered in St. Peter's Church, to which they had fled for refuge, and special vengeance was meted out to the clergy, none of them who were recognized being spared. Similar scenes of wholesale butchery took place at Wexford, into which his army gained admission by treachery. Ormond was unable to make headway against such a commander, and frightened at last by the prospect that opened out before him, he made overtures to O'Neill for a reconciliation o'neill agreed to lend his aid against cromwell he sent a portion of his army south and he himself though ill was already on the march when he died at cloggeter sixth november sixteen forty nine his death at such a time was an irreparable loss both to the catholic religion and to ireland had he lived and had ormond and his faction cooperated with him the campaign of cromwell might have had a very different termination during the closing months of 1649, the situation in Ireland seemed hopeless. Though as an unscrupulous diplomatist, Ormond had few equals, he was utterly worthless as a soldier, and to make matters worse, he was still distrusted by the great mass of the Irish people. In the hope of restoring unity and of encouraging the people to continue the struggle, a synod of bishops and clergy assembled at Clonmacnoise, December 1649. They issued a declaration warning the people that they could expect no mercy from the English Parliament, that the wholesale extirpation of Catholicism was intended, as was evidenced by the actions of Cromwell, and that the lands of the Irish Catholics were to be handed over to English adventurers. They called upon them to forget past differences, to sink racial and personal jealousies, and to unite against the common enemy. But the country distrusted Ormond and refused to rally to his standard. Another meeting, consisting of the bishops and of the commissioners of trust, was held at Logree, in which it was agreed that there should be a general levy of all men fit to bear arms, and the monastery of Kilbegan was fixed as the place of rendezvous. Several of the cities and leading men refused, however, to take any part in a movement controlled by Ormond, and as a last desperate resort, at the meeting of the bishops held at Jamestown, 12th August, 1650, the bishops declared that there could be no hope of unity unless Ormond surrendered his trust to some person in whom the entire country had confidence. Very reluctantly Ormond agreed to this request and left Ireland in December, having appointed the Earl of Clanrickard as his successor. The latter was a Catholic who had played a very ignoble part throughout the war. Had he displayed years before but half the energy he displayed in its later stages, things might never have come to such a pass. As it was, Cromwell made great progress in the south, though he was forced to raise the siege of Waterford, and suffered a bad defeat at Clonmel from the nephew of O'Neill. He left Ireland in May 1650, and entrusted the command to Ireton. Owing to the state of disunion, Ireton was enabled to take city after city. Limerick was taken in 1651, and Terence O'Brien, Bishop of Emley, was put to death. Bishop McMahon of Clogger, who had assumed the leadership of the army of Owen Rowe O'Neill, after the latter's death, was defeated at Scarifalis, 1650. Later on he was captured and put to death, his head being impaled on the gates of Enniskillen as a warning to his co-religionists. The submission of Clan Rickard in 1652 practically put an end to the war, and before another year had elapsed, all effective resistance had ceased. During the Kilkenny Confederation, the Catholic Church was restored to its original position. 
in the districts controlled by the confederates the bishops and clergy were allowed to occupy once more their houses and churches wherever these had not been destroyed and religious communities of both men and women were set up again close to their former monasteries and convents though at the same time the catholic lords of the pale were alert lest they should be asked to return any of the ecclesiastical or monastic lands that had been granted to them by royal patent in dublin and wherever ormond and the royalists had authority both clergy and people enjoyed complete toleration but in certain portions of the north and wherever the puritans and parliamentarians held sway persecution was still the order of the day when dublin was surrendered to the parliamentarians 1647 the priests and later on all catholics were expelled from the city in the south of ireland lord inchiquin acted in the most savage manner in cashel and generally in the cities which he conquered while the parliamentarian party in the north showed no mercy to the catholics who fell into their hands after the arrival of cromwell the prospect became even more gloomy though he announced that he would interfere with no man's religion he declared that on no account could he tolerate the celebration of mass the clergy were put to the sword in Drogheda and Wexford. The Archbishop of Tuam was killed during the war, 1645. Boetius Egan, Bishop of Ross, fell into the hands of Lord Broghill, and was put to a cruel death, because, instead of advising the garrison of Carrick Drohid to surrender, he encouraged them to continue the struggle, 1650. Terence Albert O'Brien, Bishop of Emley, was captured by Ireton after the siege of Limerick, and was hanged. Heber McMahon, Bishop of Clogger, was put to death by the orders of Coote, 1650. Bishop Roth of Ossory died as a result of the sufferings he endured, and Bishop French of Ferns, after undergoing terrible trials in Ireland, was obliged to make his escape to the continent. In arranging the terms of surrender, the Cromwellian generals sometimes excluded the bishops and clergy from protection, and at best they granted them only a short time to prepare for leaving the country. The presence of the priests was regarded as a danger for the projected settlement of Ireland, and hence the order was given, 1650, that they should be arrested. In 1650 a reward of twenty pounds was offered to any one who would betray the hiding place of any Jesuits, priests, friars, monks, or nuns. At first those clergy who were captured were sent into France and Spain, but later on large numbers of them were shipped to the Barbados. Thus, for example, in 1655, an instruction was sent to Sir Charles Coote that the priests and friars then captive in Galway, who were over forty years of age, should be banished to Portugal or France, while those under that age were to be shipped away for the Barbados or other American plantations. For those who returned, death was the penalty that was laid down. Since the priests still contrived to elude their pursuers by disguising themselves as laborers, peasants, beggars, gardeners, etc., an order was issued in 1655 that a general search should be made throughout Ireland for the capture of all priests. Five pounds was to be paid to any one who would arrest the priest, and more might be awarded if the individual taken were of special importance. When the jails were well filled, another instruction was issued that the priests should be brought together at Carrick Fergus for transportation. Here it was claimed that some offered to submit to the terms of the government rather than allow themselves to be sent away, but as the statement comes from an unreliable source, it should be received with caution. In 1657, Major Morgan, representative of Wicklow, in the United Parliament of England and Ireland, declared, We have three beasts to destroy that lay heavy burthens upon us. The first is the wolf, on whom we lay five pounds a head of a dog, and ten pounds if a bitch. The second beast is a priest on whose head we lay ten pounds, and if he be eminent, more. The third beast is a Tory, on whose head, if he be a public Tory, we lay twenty pounds, and forty shillings on a private Tory. Towards the end of the protectorate, the government, instead of transporting the priests abroad, sent them in crowds to the island of Arran and to Innisbofin. The Lord Deputy and Council, wrote Colonel Thomas Herbert, 1658, did in July last give order for payment of one hundred pounds upon account to Colonel Sadlier to be issued as he should conceive fit for maintenance of such popish priests as are or should be confined to the Isle of Boffin, according to sixpence daily allowing, building cabins and the like. It is not doubted but care was taken accordingly, and for that the judges in their respective circuits may probably find cause for sending much more priests to that island. I am commanded to signify thus much unto you, that you may not be wanting to take such care in this business, as according to former directions and provision is made. 
Already in 1642, the English Parliament had passed measures for the wholesale confiscation of Catholic Ireland, and had pledged the land to these adventurers who subscribed money to carry on the war. In 1652, when the reduction of Ireland was practically complete, it was deemed prudent to undertake the work of clearing Leinster and Munster of its old owners, to prepare the way for the adventurers and for the soldiers, whose arrears were paid by grants of farms or estates. According to the terms of the Act and of the instructions issued in connection with it, all Irish Catholics were commanded to transplant themselves to Connaught before the 1st May, 1654, under pain of being put to death by court-martial, if they were found after that date east of the Shannon. Exceptions were indeed made in the case of those women who were married to English Protestants before December 1650, provided that they themselves had become Protestant. In case of boys under fourteen and girls under twelve in Protestant service, and who would be brought up Protestants, and lastly in case of those who could prove that for the previous ten years they had maintained a constant good affection towards the Parliament, the order to transplant was notified throughout Ireland, and a commission was set up at Logri to consider claims and to make assignments of land in Connaught, all of which was to be at the disposal of the Irish except the prescribed territory along the seaboard. Even the inhabitants of Galway, who had submitted only on the express condition of retaining their lands, were driven out of the city, and the city itself was handed over to the corporations of Gloucester and Liverpool, to recoup them for the losses they had suffered during the Civil War. Petitions began to pour in for mercy, or at least for an extension to the time limit, but though on the latter point some concessions were made, few individuals were allowed any reprieve. The landowners were marked men, and they were obliged to go. It would be impossible to describe the hardship and misery suffered by those who were forced to leave their own homes and to seek refuge in what was to them a strange country. To ease the situation, large numbers of the men capable of bearing arms were shipped to Spain or to others of the continental countries, but soon it was thought that this was bad policy, likely only to serve some of the English rivals. It was then determined to transport large numbers to the West Indies, the Barbados, Jamaica, and the Caribbean Islands. Shiploads of boys and girls were seized, according to orders, from England, and were sent out of the country under the most awful conditions, to a land where a fate awaited many of them that was worse than death. The magistrates had no scruple in committing all Catholics who remained east of the Shannon and who were brought before them as vagrants, and then they were hurried off to the coast. At first the idea was to remove the native population entirely from Leinster and Munster, thus the soldiers and adventurers might be contaminated, and stern measures were taken to prevent any of the officers or men from taking Irish wives. Ireton laid it down that any officer or soldier who dared to marry an Irish girl until she had been examined by a competent board to see whether her conversion flowed from a real work of God upon her heart should be punished severely. But later on, petitions poured in from the new Protestant landowners to be allowed to keep Catholics as servants and laborers, and on the understanding that the masters would utilize this opportunity to spread the true religion, their requests were granted. Some obtained dispensations, or at least managed to secure delays. Others probably were able to come to terms with the soldiers to whom their farms had fallen in the general lottery, and others still preferred to risk the danger of transportation by remaining in their own district, rather than to seek a new home. Had the protectorate lasted long enough, the policy of transplanting might have succeeded. But as it was, the Cromwellian planters soon disappeared or became merged into the native population, and in spite of all the bloodshed and robbery, the people of Ireland generally were as devoted to the Catholic religion in 1659 as they had been ten years before. When it became clear from the course of events in England that Charles II was about to be restored to the throne, Lord Broghill and Sir Charles Coote both of whom had helped to crush the Irish royalists, and had profited largely by the revolution, hastened to show their zeal for the king's cause. The Catholics who had fought so loyally for his father hoped that at last justice would be done to them by reinstating them in the lands from which they had been driven by the enemies of the king. But Charles was determined to take no risks. He sent over the Duke of Ormond, the most dangerous enemy of the Catholic religion in Ireland, as Lord Lieutenant, 1660. A parliament was called in 1661, and as the Catholics had been driven from the corporate towns during the Cromwellian regime, and as the Cromwellian planters were still in possession, the House of Commons was to all intents and purposes Protestant. 
an act of settlement was passed whereby catholics who could prove their innocence of the rebellion were to be restored but the definition of innocence in the case was so complicated that it was hoped few catholics if any would succeed in establishing their claims 1661 a court of claims composed of five protestant commissioners was set up to examine the individual cases but in a short time when it was discovered that a large number of catholics were succeeding in satisfying the conditions laid down by law for restoration to their property an outcry was raised by the planters and the court of claims was suspended sixteen sixty four the act of explanation was then passed to simplify the proceedings as a result of which act two-thirds of the land of ireland was left in the hands of the protestant settlers Close on sixty of the Catholic nobility were restored as a special favor by the king, but a large body of those who had been driven out by Cromwell were left without any compensation. In consequence of the Cromwellian persecution, nearly all the bishops and a large body of the clergy, both secular and regular, had been driven from Ireland. But after the accession of Charles, who was known to be personally friendly to the Catholics, many of them began to return. It would be a mistake, however, to imagine that the persecution had ceased, or that the laws against the clergy were not put in force in several districts. Ormond returned to Ireland as hostile to Catholicity as he had been before he was driven into exile, and as he thought that he had a particular grievance against the Irish bishops, he was determined to stir up the clergy against them, to divide the Catholics into warring factions, and by favoring one side to create a royalist Catholic party, as distinct from the ultramontane or papal party. For this work he had at hand a useful instrument in the person of Father Peter Walsh, a Franciscan friar, who had distinguished himself as a bitter opponent of the nuncio and as a leader of the Romandist faction in the Supreme Council. In 1661 it was determined by some leading members, both lay and clerical, to present an address of welcome to Charles II, but by the influence of Walsh and others, the address, instead of being a mere protestation of loyalty, was framed on the model of the Oath of Allegiance, 1605, which had been condemned more than once by the Pope. Many of the Catholic lords indicated their agreement with this address or remonstrance, as it was called, and some of the clergy, deceived by the counsels of Father Walsh, expressed their willingness to adhere to its terms. Ormond, who spent money freely in subsidizing Walsh and his supporters, had good reason to be delighted with the success of his schemes. Grave disputes broke out among the clergy, which the government took care to foment by patronizing the remonstrance and by wrecking its vengeance on the anti-remonstrance on the ground of their alleged disloyalty. To bring matters to a crisis, it was arranged by Walsh and Ormond that a meeting of the bishops, vicars, and heads of religious orders should be held in Dublin, June 1666. In addition to Dr. O'Reilly, Archbishop of Armagh, Bishops Plunkett of Ardal, and Lent of Kilfenora, there were present a number of vicars of vacant dioceses, together with representatives of the Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, Capuchins, and Jesuits. Dr. O'Reilly spoke strongly against the terms of the remonstrance as being highly disrespectful to the Pope, and the majority of those present supported his contention. They expressed their willingness to present an address of loyalty from which the objectionable clauses should be omitted but Walsh, dissatisfied with anything but a complete submission, shifted the ground of the debate by endeavouring to secure the acceptance of the assembly of the pro gallican Declaration of the Sorbonne, 1663. Even still, his efforts were far from being successful, and the meeting was dissolved by Ormond. The primate was kept a prisoner in Dublin for some months, and then transported to the continent, while the other members present were obliged to make their escape from Ireland or to go into hiding. By orders of Ormond, close watch was kept upon the clergy, who sided against the remonstrance, and many of them were thrown into prison. In 1669, Ormond was recalled, and after a short time, Lord Berkeley was sent over as Lord Lieutenant. Though he was instructed to execute the laws against the titular archbishops, bishops, and vicar generals that have threatened or excommunicated the remonstrance, yet, as the personal friend of the Duke of York, and as one who knew intimately the king's own views, he acted in as tolerant a manner towards Catholics as it was possible for him to do, considering the state of mind of the officials, and of the Protestant bishops and clergy. From 1670 till the arrival of Ormond, once more in 1677, though several proclamations were issued, and though here and there individual priests were persecuted, Catholics as a body enjoyed comparative calm. The Holy See took advantage of this to appoint to several of the vacant sees. 
Among those appointed at this time were Oliver Plunkett to Armagh, 1669, Peter Talbot to Dublin, which had not been filled since the death of Dr. Fleming in 1655, William Burgot to Cashel, 1669, and James Lynch to Tuam. Dr. Plunkett had accompanied Scrampy to Rome, 1645, where he read a particularly brilliant course as a student of the Irish College, and afterwards acted as a professor in the propaganda till his nomination to Armagh. Dr. Talbot was born at Malahide, joined the Society of Jesus, was a close personal friend of Charles II during the latter's exile on the continent, and after the restoration enjoyed a pension from the king. Shortly after his appointment, an outcry was raised against him because he and his brother, Colonel Talbot, were supposed to be urging a re-examination of the Act of Settlement, and Charles II was weak enough to sign a decree banishing him from the kingdom. He returned to Ireland only in 1677, the year in which Ormond arrived for his last term of office as Lord Lieutenant. Already Shaftesbury's two subordinates, Titus Oates and Tonge, were concocting the infamous story of the Popish plot in the hopes of securing the exclusion of the Duke of York from the throne. In this plot, according to the account of its lying authors, the Catholics of Ireland were to play an important part, the Jesuits and the Archbishops of Dublin and Tuam being supposed to be particularly active. In October 1678, a proclamation was issued ordering all archbishops, bishops, vicars, abbots, and other dignitaries of the Church of Rome, and all others exercising jurisdiction by authority of the Pope, together with all Jesuits and regular priests, to depart from the kingdom before the 20th November, and all popish societies, convents, seminaries, and schools were to be dissolved at once. This was followed by a number of others couched in a similar strain, and large numbers of priests were sent to the coast for transportation. The chapels opened in Dublin and in the principal cities were closed, and the clergy who remained were obliged to have recourse to various devices to escape their pursuers. Dr. Talbot was arrested and thrown into prison, 1678, where he remained till death put an end to his sufferings in November 1680. Though both the king and Ormond were convinced of his innocence, yet such was the state of Protestant frenzy at the time that they dared not move a hand to assist him. Dr. Plunkett, after eluding the vigilance of his pursuers for some time, was arrested in 1679. He was brought to trial at Dundalk, but his accusers feared to trust an Irish court. The case was postponed, and in the meantime his enemies arranged that he should be brought to London for trial. Every care was taken to obtain a verdict. The judges refused a delay to bring over witnesses for their defense, and made no attempt to conceal their bias and their hatred for the Catholic religion, the very profession of which was sufficient to condemn him in their eyes. He was executed at Tyburn, 1681, and he was the last victim to suffer death in England on account of the plot of Oates and his perjured accomplices. But in Ireland, Ormond had no intention of dropping the persecution. Several of the bishops and vicar generals were arrested, and either held as prisoners or banished, and spies were sent through the country to track down those who defy the proclamation of banishment by remaining to watch over their diocese. On the accession of James II, February 1685, the Catholics of Ireland had reason to hope for an improvement of their position, and this time at least they were not disappointed. The Duke of Ormond was recalled, and the Earl of Clarendon was sent over as Lord Lieutenant. He was instructed to maintain the Act of Settlement, but at the same time to allow Catholics full freedom of worship, and to consider them eligible for civil and military appointment. With him was associated, as the military commander, Colonel Richard Talbot, Earl of Tyconnell, brother of the late Archbishop of Dublin. In accordance with the well-known wishes of the King, Catholic officers were appointed in the army, Catholics were allowed once more to act as sheriffs, magistrates, and judges, and steps were taken to see that the corporations, which had been closed against Catholics for years, should be no longer safe Protestant boroughs. The Irish bishops hastened to present an address of welcome to the King, and they were assured of His Majesty's favour and protection. Religious communities of both men and women were reopened in Dublin and in the principal cities throughout Ireland, and synods of the clergy were held to restore order and discipline. Irish Catholics as a body were delighted with the royal edicts in favor of religious toleration, but the small Protestant minority in the country were alarmed at seeing Catholics treated as equals, and particularly at the prospect of seeing the Act of Settlement upset and their titles to their estates questioned by the real owners, whom they had despoiled twenty years before. Their fears were increased when the Earl of Clarendon, who they regarded as in some sort their protector, was recalled, 1687, to make way for the Earl of Tyrconnell as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. 
the new lord lieutenant was far from being perfect nor was he always prudent in his policy or his actions but if his conduct towards the small body of protestants in ireland be compared with that of his predecessors for more than a century or with that of his successors towards the irish people he ought to be regarded as one of the most enlightened administrators of his age the revolution that broke out in england sixteen eighty eight the arrival of william of orange sixteen eighty eight and the flight of king james to france were calculated to stir up strife in ireland though it is remarkable as showing the fair treatment they had received that a great body of the irish protestant bishops were in favour of supporting james against the usurper and that it was necessary to have recourse to lying stories of an intended general massacre to stir up opposition to the king tyconnell who had long foreseen such a course of events had made wonderful preparations considering the situation of the country and the constitution of his council had james the second contented himself with inducing louis the fourteenth to send arms and ammunition to ireland and to utilize to the fullest the splendid french navy tyconnell aided by the able irish officers who flocked to his standard from all parts of europe might have bidden defiance to all invaders but james insisted on returning to ireland he landed in march sixteen eighty nine and proceeded to dublin where a national parliament was summoned to meet in may as a result of allowing the majority of the people to have some voice in the selection of the members the house of commons in sixteen eighty nine was, was almost as catholic as that of sixteen sixty two had been protestant in the house of lords the protestants might have been in the majority had all the spiritual and temporal peers taken their seats but as several of the bishops were absent from the country and as many of the lay lords had either joined the party of william or were waiting to see how events would go few of them put in an appearance from the beginning it was clear that the ideals of james were not the ideals of the irish parliament he wished merely to make ireland the stepping-stone to secure his own return to england while the representatives of ireland were determined to provide for the welfare and independence of their own country they began by laying down the principle that no laws passed in england had any binding force in ireland unless they were approved by the king lords and commons of ireland they next affirmed the principle of liberty of conscience for all whether catholic or protestant thereby setting an example which unfortunately was not followed either in england or in later parliamentary assemblies in ireland they decreed further that for the future catholics should not be obliged to pay tithes for the support of the protestant ministers but rather that both catholics and protestants should contribute to the support of their respective pastors a system which no impartial man could condemn as unfair they repealed the acts of settlement and explanation and declared that those who held estates in ireland in october sixteen forty one should be restored to them or if they were dead that their heirs should enter into possession the soldiers and adventurers were deprived thereby of the property which they had acquired by legalized robbery and had held for over twenty years but it was provided that those who had purchased lands from the cromwellian grantees should be compensated from the estates of those who were then in rebellion against the king in view of what had taken place in ulster under james i of what the earl of wentworth had in contemplation for portions of munster and connaught had his plans not miscarried and of what had been done by cromwell in nearly all parts of catholic ireland the action of the parliament in sixteen eighty nine was not merely justifiable it was extremely moderate an act of attainder was also passed against those persons who had either declared for william of orange or who had left the country lest they should be regarded as taking sides with james the second such men were called upon to return within a certain time unless they wished to incur the penalty of being regarded as traitors and punished as such it is not true to say that there was any secrecy observed in regard to this act or that knowledge of it was kept from the parties concerned till the time limit had expired it was discussed publicly in the presence of the protestant bishops and protestant representatives and its provisions were well known in a short time in england and ireland derry and enniskillen had declared against king james towards the end of sixteen eighty eight and all efforts to capture these two cities had failed in august sixteen eighty nine the duke of schomberg arrived at bangor with an army of about fifteen thousand men but little was done till the arrival of william of orange in june sixteen ninety had the irish and french military advisers had a free hand they might easily have held their own even though william's army was composed largely of veteran troops drawn from nearly every country of europe had james taken their advice and played a waiting game by retiring behind the shannon so as to allow time to have his own raw levies trained and to hold william in ireland when his presence on the continent against louis the fourteenth was so urgently required the situation would have been awkward for his opponent 
and even when James decided to advance, had he gone forward boldly, as was suggested to him, and insisted upon giving battle north of Dundalk, in the narrow pass between the mountains and the sea, William's cavalry would have been useless. The issue might have been different. But with a leader who could not make up his mind whether to give battle or to retreat, and who, having at last decided to fight in the worst place he could have selected, sent away his heavy guns towards Dublin, with the intention of ordering a retirement, almost when the decisive struggle had begun. It was impossible for his followers to expect any other result but defeat. In the Battle of the Boyne, the brunt of the fighting fell upon the Irish recruits, and both the Irish cavalry and infantry offered a stubborn resistance. James fled to Dublin, and in a short time left Ireland, 1690. The Irish and French commanders then fell back on the line of the Shannon, according to their original scheme. They defended Limerick so bravely that William was obliged to raise the siege, but the capture of Anthlone, 1691, and the defeat of the Irish forces at Aughram turned the scales in favour of William. Towards the end of August, 1691, the second siege of Limerick began. Sarsfield, who was in supreme command, made a vigorous defence, but as it was impossible to hold out indefinitely, and as there seemed to be no longer any hope of French assistance, he opened up negotiations with General Ginkle for a surrender of the city. As a result of these negotiations, the Treaty of Limerick was signed on the 3rd October, 1691. End of Chapter 10, Part 2 Chapter 11 of A History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Rev. James McCaffrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Penal Laws When the Irish leaders entered into correspondence with General Ginkle, they were by no means reduced to the last extremity. The situation of the besiegers was rendered difficult by the approach of winter, and there was a danger that the city might be relieved at any moment by the appearance of a French fleet in the Shannon. Hence, to avoid the risks attendant on the prolongation of the siege, and to set free his troops for service on the continent where their presence was required so urgently general ginkle was willing to make many concessions before the battle of Aughrim, william had offered to grant the catholics the free exercise of their religion half the churches in the kingdom and the moiety of the ecclesiastical revenues but the position of both parties had changed considerably since then and sarsfield and his companions could hardly expect so favourable terms they insisted however on toleration and though the first clause of the treaty dealing expressly with that subject was drafted badly, they certainly expected they had secured it. In addition to the military articles, the Peace of Limerick contained thirteen articles, the most important of which were the first and the ninth. By these it was provided that the Catholics should enjoy such privileges in the exercise of their religion as is consistent with the laws of Ireland, and as they did enjoy in the reign of Charles the Second that their majesties, as soon as their affairs should permit them to summon a parliament, would endeavour to procure for Irish Catholics such further security in that particular as may preserve them from any disturbance on account of their religion, and that the oath to be administered to Catholics should be the simple oath of allegiance to William and Mary. Those who signed it, the treaty, writes Lecky, undertook that the Catholics of Ireland should not be in a worse position in respect to the exercise of their religion than they had been during the reign of Charles the Second and they also undertook that the influence of the government should be promptly exerted to obtain such an amelioration of their condition as would secure them from the possibility of disturbance. Construed in its plain and natural sense, interpreted as every treaty should be by men of honour, the Treaty of Limerick amounted to no less than this. The treaty was ratified by the sovereigns in April 1692, and its contents were communicated to William's Catholic ally, the Emperor Leopold I, 1657 to 1705 as a proof that the campaign in Ireland was not a campaign directed against the Catholic religion. The king was, therefore, pledged to carry out the agreement, and by means of the royal veto and the control exercised by the English Privy Council, he could have done so notwithstanding the bigoted fanaticism of the Protestant minority in Ireland. Nor can it be said that the conduct of the Irish Catholics afforded any pretext for denying them the rights to which they were entitled. 
Once their military leaders and the best of their soldiers had passed into the service of France, there was little danger of a Catholic rebellion, and during the years between 1692 and 1760, even at times when the Jacobite forces created serious troubles in Scotland and England, the historian will search in vain for any evidence of an Irish conspiracy in favor of the exiled Stuarts. The penal laws were due solely to the desire of the Protestant minority to wreak a terrible vengeance on their Catholic countrymen, to get possession of their estates, to drive them out of public life by excluding them from the learned professions and from all civil and military offices, to reduce them to a condition of permanent inferiority by depriving them of all means of education at home and abroad, to uproot their religion by banishing the bishops and clergy, both regular and secular, and in a word to reduce them to the same position as the native population of the English plantations in the West Indies. For some years, however, after the overthrow of the Irish forces, it was deemed imprudent by the king and his advisers to give the Irish Protestants a free hand. Louis the Fourteenth was a dangerous opponent, until the issue of the great European contest was decided, it was necessary to move with caution at home. Besides, Leopold I, William's faithful ally, could not afford, even from the point of view of politics, to look on as a disinterested spectator at a terrible persecution of his own co-religionists in Ireland. But once the fall of Namur, 1695, had made it clear that Louis the Fourteenth was not destined to become the dictator of Europe, and above all, once the Peace of Ryswick, 1697, had set William free from a very embarrassing alliance, the Protestant officials in Ireland were allowed a free hand. Parliament was convoked to meet in 1692. The Earl of Sydney was sent over as Lord Lieutenant, and in accordance with the terms of the Treaty of Limerick, Parliament should have confirmed the Articles. But then Mike Dopping, the Protestant Bishop of Meath, took care to inflame passion and bigotry by declaring that no faith should be kept with heretics, and when Parliament met it was in no mood to make any concessions. The few Catholic members who presented themselves were called upon to subscribe a declaration against transubstantiation prescribed by the English Parliament, but which had no binding force in Ireland. Having in this way excluded all Catholics from Parliament, an exclusion which lasted from 1692 till the days of the Union, the Houses passed a bill recognizing the new sovereigns, and another for encouraging foreign Protestants to settle in Ireland. But they refused absolutely to confirm the Treaty of Limerick. After Parliament had been prorogued, the Privy Council endeavoured to induce the Earl of Sydney to issue a proclamation ordering the bishops and clergy to depart from the kingdom, but under pretense of consulting the authorities in England, he succeeded in eluding the would-be persecutors, who were obliged to content themselves with indirect methods of striking at the priests, until Sydney was recalled, and until Lord Capel, a man after their own heart, arrived as Lord Lieutenant in 1695. In August of that year, Parliament met once more. In his opening speech, the Lord Lieutenant struck a note likely to win the approval of his audience. My lords and gentlemen, he said, I must inform you that the Lord's Justices of England have, with great application and dispatch, considered and retransmitted all the bills sent to them, that some of these bills have more effectually provided for your future security than hath ever hitherto been done, and, in my opinion, the want of such laws has been one of the greatest causes of your past miseries, and it will be your fault, as well as misfortune, if you neglect to lay hold of the opportunity, now put into your hands by your great and gracious king, of making such a lasting settlement, that it may never more be in the power of your enemies to bring the like calamities again upon you, or to put England to the vast expense of blood and treasure it hath so often been at for securing this kingdom to the crown of England." The measures taken to secure the Protestant settlement will repay study. It was enacted that no parent should send his children beyond seas for education, under penalty, both for the sender and the person sent, of being disqualified to sue, bring, or prosecute any action, bill, plaint, or information in course of law, or to prosecute any suit in a court of equity, or to be guardian or executor or administrator to any person, or capable of any legacy or deed of gift or to bear any office within the realm. In addition, such persons were to be deprived of all their property, both real and personal. Any magistrate who suspected that a child had been sent away could summon the parents or guardians and question them under oath, but failing any proof, the mere absence of the child was to be taken as sufficient evidence of guilt. Popish schoolmasters in Ireland were forbidden to teach school, under threat of a penalty of twenty pounds and imprisonment for three months. 
but lest the Catholics might object that they had no means of education, it was enacted that every Protestant minister should open a school in his parish, and every Protestant bishop should see that a public Latin free school was maintained in his diocese. Having fortified Protestantism sufficiently on one flank, the members next proceeded to forbid Papists to keep arms, armor, or ammunition, empower magistrates to search the houses of all suspected persons, threaten severe penalties against all offenders, forbade the reception of Popish apprentices by manufacturers of war materials, prohibited all Catholics from having in their possession a horse over the value of five pounds, and empowered Protestant discoverers of infringements of this measure to become owners of the Catholic neighbor's horse by tendering him five pounds. Lest these laws might become a dead letter, it was enacted that if any judge, mayor, or magistrate, or bailiff neglected to enforce them, he should pay a fine of fifty pounds, half of which was to go to the informer and besides, he should be declared incapable of holding such an office for ever. To prevent any misconception, it was explained that all persons who, when called upon, refused to make the declaration against transubstantiation should be regarded as papists. For so far, however, the opportune moment for a formal rejection of the Limerick Treaty had not arrived, but when Parliament met in 1697, it was deemed prudent to carry out the instruction of the Bishop of Meath that no faith should be kept with Catholics. The Articles of Limerick were confirmed, with most of the important clauses omitted or altered. The first clause, guaranteeing toleration, was deemed unfit to be mentioned in the bill. It is clear that in the House of Lords grave difficulties were urged against such a wholesale neglect of the terms of the treaty, and that it was necessary to invoke the authority of the King and of the English Privy Council before the measure was passed. Seven of the lay lords and six of the Protestant bishops lodged a solemn protest against what had been done. Among the reasons which they assigned for their disagreement with the majority were, 1. Because we think the title of the bill doth not agree with the body thereof, the title being an act for the confirmation of articles made at the surrender of Limerick, whereas no one of the said articles is therein, as we conceive, fully confirmed. 2. Because the said articles were to be confirmed in favor of them to whom they were granted, but the confirmation of them by the bill is such that it puts them in a worse condition than they were before, as we conceive. 4. Because several words are inserted in the bill, which are not in the articles, and others omitted, which alter both the sense and meaning as we conceive. The way was now clear for beginning the attack upon the clergy. An act was passed ordering all popish archbishops, bishops, vicar-generals, deans, jesuits, monks, friars, and all other regular popish clergy, and all papists, exercising any ecclesiastical jurisdiction, to depart from the kingdom before the 1st May, 1698, under threat for those who remain beyond the specified time, of being arrested and kept in prison till they could be transported beyond the seas. They were commanded to assemble before the 1st May at the ports of Dublin, Cork, Kinsale, Ugal, Waterford, Wexford, Galway, or Carrickfergus, register themselves at the office of the mayor, and await till provision could be made for transporting them. All such ecclesiastics were forbidden to come into the kingdom after the twenty ninth December, 1697, under pain of imprisonment for twelve months, and if any such person ventured to return after having been transported, he should be adjudged guilty of high treason. If any person knowingly harbored, relieved, concealed, or entertained any popish ecclesiastic after the dates mentioned, he was to forfeit twenty pounds for the first offence, forty pounds for the second, and all his lands and property for the third offence, half to go, if not exceeding one hundred pounds, to the informer. Justices of the peace were empowered to summon all persons charged upon oath with having aided or received ecclesiastics, and to levy these fines, or to commit the accused person to the county jail till the fines should be paid. All persons whatsoever were forbidden, after the 29th December, 1697, to bury any deceased person in any suppressed monastery, abbey, or convent that is not made use of for celebrating divine service, according to the liturgy of the Church of Ireland, as by law established, or within the precincts thereof, under pain of forfeiting the sum of ten pounds, which sum might be recovered off any person attending a burial in such circumstances. Justices of the peace were empowered to issue warrants for the arrest of ecclesiastics who came into Ireland or remained there in defiance of these statutes, and were commanded to give an account of their work in this respect at the next quarter sessions held in their counties. Finally, it was provided that any justice of the peace or mayor who neglected to enforce this law should pay a fine for every such offence of one hundred pounds, half of which was to be paid to the informer, and should be disqualified from serving as a justice of the peace. An act was also passed, 
to prevent Protestants intermarrying with Papists. If any Protestant woman, heir to real estate or to personal estate, value five hundred pounds or upwards, married a husband without having first got a certificate in writing under the hand of the minister of the parish, bishop of the diocese, and some justice of the peace, and attested by two witnesses that her intended husband was a Protestant, the estates or property devolved immediately on the next of kin of a Protestant. And if any man married without having got a similar certificate that the lady of his choice was a Protestant, he became thereby disqualified to act as a guardian or executor, to sit in the House of Commons, or to hold any civil or military office, unless he could prove that within one year he had converted his wife to the Protestant religion. Any clergyman assisting at such marriages was liable to a penalty of twenty pounds, half of which was to be paid to the informer. In order to secure that none of the bishops or regular clergy should escape, the revenue officers in the different districts were instructed to make a return of the names and abodes of all priests on the 27th July, 1697. According to the digest compiled from these returns, there were then in Ireland 892 secular priests and 495 regulars. The houses of the regular clergy were broken up. Their property was disposed of or handed over in trust to some reliable neighbor, and the priests prepared to go into exile. During the year 1698, 444 of them were shipped from various Irish ports, several others were arrested and thrown into prison, and a few escaped by passing as secular priests. Many of the unfortunate exiles made their way to Paris, where they were dependent upon the charity of the French people and of the Pope. Similar vigorous action was taken to secure the banishment of the bishops and vicars, in the hope that if these could be driven from the country, the whole machinery of the Catholic Church in Ireland would become so disorganized that its total disappearance in a short time might be expected. Several of the bishops had been declared traitors for having supported the cause of James I, and had been obliged to flee to the continent. Two others were shipped in accordance with the law of 1697. Three were discovered by the revenue officials, of whom the Bishop of Clonfort was arrested, rescued, and died. The Bishop of Waterford made his escape after a few years of hiding, and the Bishop of Cork was arrested and transported, 1703. So that there remained in Ireland only the Archbishop of Cashel and the Bishop of Dromore. News of what was taking place in Ireland was conveyed to the Emperor, who instructed his ambassador to lodge a strong protest but the ambassador was put off with empty promises or with a bold denial of the truth of his information. Nor were these acts allowed to remain a dead letter. The revenue officials, the magistrates, sheriffs, judges, Protestant bishops, and Protestant ministers joined in the hunt for regulars, bishops, vicars, deans, etc., and generous rewards were offered to all informers. The accession of Queen Anne, 1702 to 14, led only to a still more violent persecution. Parliament met in September 1703, and proceeded almost immediately to attack both priests and lay Catholics. Most of the bishops were dead or had been driven from the country. The regulars, it was thought, could not survive. It was determined, therefore, to attack the remaining secular clergy in two ways. First, by enforcing strictly the laws against Catholic education in Ireland, and by making more severe the laws against going to colleges abroad as well as by enacting that any priest who entered Ireland after 1st January 1704 should be punished in accordance with the terms of the law laid down previously against bishops and regulars, so that by these means the supply of clergy might be cut off, and second, by obliging all the priests in Ireland to register themselves so that the government could lay hold of them whenever it wished to do so. According to this latter measure, all priests were commanded to give an account to the clerks of the peace of their district of their place of abode, their parishes, together with the time and place of their ordination, and were to provide two securities of fifty pounds for their future good behavior. Those who neglected to make this return were to be imprisoned and transported, and it was provided later on that no parish priest could have an assistant or curate. To crush the Catholic layman, it was enacted that in case the eldest son became a Protestant, his father could not sell, mortgage, or otherwise dispose of the family property that no Catholics could act as guardian to orphans or minors, but that these should be handed over to the custody of some Protestant, who was required to bring them up in the Protestant religion, that no Catholic could purchase any lands, tenements, or hereditaments, or any profits or rents from such possessions, or acquire leases for a term exceeding thirty-one years, or inherit as nearest of kin to any Protestant. 
the estates of a Catholic landowner, dying without a Protestant heir, were to be divided equally among his sons. No person could hold any office, civil or military, without subscribing to the Declaration Against Transubstantiation and the Oath of Abjuration, and receiving the sacrament. No Catholics, unless under very exceptional circumstances, could be allowed to live in Galway and Limerick, and no person could vote at any election without taking the oaths of allegiance and abjuration. Sir Theobald Butler, appearing at the bar of the House of Commons to plead against these measures, and to point out that as no laws of the king were enforced in the days of Charles II, the proposed bill was in direct opposition to the terms of the Treaty of Limerick, but his protests produced no effect in England or in Ireland. The whole army of government officials, Protestant ministers, and spies were set to work to discover what persons had left Ireland to go abroad for education, to seize all the priests found entering the country, and to take measures against those in the country who neglected to register themselves as they had been commanded to do. 189 priests were registered in Ulster, 352 in Leinster, 289 in Munster, and 259 in Connaught. Against the laity, too, the full penalties of the law were enforced, but yet it is satisfactory to note that in the year 1703 only four certificates of conformity were filled, 16 in 1704, 3 in 1705, 5 in 1706, 2 in 1707, and 7 in 1708. It was clear, therefore, that if the Catholic religion was to be suppressed, recourse must be had to even more extreme measures. In 1709, an act was passed ordering all priests to take the oath of abjuration before the 25th March, 1710, unless they wished to incur all the pains and penalties leveled against the regular clergy. By the oath of abjuration, they were supposed to declare that the pretender hath not any right or title whatsoever to the crown of this realm, or any other the dominions thereunto belonging that they would uphold the Protestant succession, and that they made this declaration heartily, willingly, and truly. Rewards were laid down for the encouragement of informers, fifty pounds being allowed for discovering an archbishop, bishop, vicar, or any person exercising foreign jurisdiction, twenty pounds for the discovery of a regular or a non-registered secular priest, and ten pounds for the discovery of a popish schoolmaster. To facilitate the arrest of the clergy, it was provided that any two justices of the peace might summon Catholics before them and interrogate them under oath, when and where they heard Mass last, what priest officiated, and who were present at the ceremony. Failure to give the required information about Mass, priests, or schoolmasters was to be punished by imprisonment for twelve months, or until the guilty person paid a fine of twenty pounds. A pension of twenty pounds a year, increased afterwards to forty pounds, was provided for those priests who left the Catholic Church. As regards lay Catholics, further measures were taken to encourage the children of Catholic parents to become Protestant by ordaining that in such a case the Court of Chancery could interfere and dictate to the Father what provision he must make for such children. Similarly, wives of Catholics were encouraged to submit by the promise that the Court of Chancery would interfere to safeguard their interests. Stringent regulations were made to ensure that all pretended converts engaged in the professions and in public offices should rear their children in the Protestant faith, and to ensure that no Catholic could teach school publicly or privately, or even act as usher in a Protestant school. The priests though not unwilling to take a simple oath of allegiance, refused as a body to take the oath of abjuration, and immediately they became liable to all the punishments directed against the bishops and regulars. Wholesale arrests took place over the country. Spies were employed to track them down. The men who had gone security for their good behavior in 1704 were commanded to bring them in under threat of having the recognizances estreated. Judges were ordered to make inquiries at the assizes, and Catholics were called upon to discover on their clergy by giving information about the priests who celebrated Mass. The search was carried on even more vigorously in Munster and Connaught than in Ulster and Leinster, so that during the remainder of the reign of Queen Anne, no priest in any part of Ireland could officiate publicly with safety. Petitions were drawn up and forwarded to all the Catholic sovereigns of Europe, asking them to intercede for their co-religionists in Ireland. But though many of them did instruct their representatives in London to take action, their appeals and remonstrances produced very little effect. At the same time, the laws in regard to Catholic property and Catholic education were enforced with great severity, 
particular care being taken that only Protestants should be recognized as guardians of Catholic minors or orphans, and that the guardians should rear the children as Protestants. Against the law, the wishes or even the last testament of a dying father were of no avail. During the reign of George I, 1714 to 27, there was very little improvement in the condition of the Catholics of Ireland. Indeed, in regard to legal enactments, their condition was rendered much worse. They were obliged to pay double the contribution of their Protestant neighbors for the support of the militia. Their horses could be seized for the use of the militia. They were prevented from acting as petty constables or from having any voice in determining the amount to be levied off them for the building and repairing of Protestant churches or for the maintenance of Protestant worship. In 1719, a new and more violent measure was passed by the House of Commons, according to one of the clauses of which all unregistered priests caught in Ireland were to be branded with a red-hot iron upon the cheek. The Irish Privy Council changed this penalty to mutilation, but when the bill was sent to England for approval, the original clause was restored. For purely technical reasons, the bill never became law. In 1742, another bill was introduced and passed by both houses in Dublin, by which all unregistered priests who did not depart out of Ireland before March 1724 were to be punished as guilty of high treason, unless they consented to take the oath of adjuration. A similar punishment was decreed against bishops, vicars, deans, and monks, without allowing them any alternative. All persons adjudged guilty of receiving or affording assistance to priests were to be put to death as felons without benefit of clergy. Popish schoolmasters and tutors were to undergo a like punishment, and to ensure that the law would be enforced, ample rewards were given to all informers. But when the bill was sent to England, it failed to receive the sanction of the king and privy council, and was therefore allowed to lapse. The results of these laws made to secure the extirpation of the Catholic religion were to be seen in 1731, when a systematic inquiry was conducted by the Protestant ministers and bishops into the condition of the Catholics in every single parish in Ireland. In Armagh there were only twenty-five mass-houses, some of them being mere cabins. In Meath there were one hundred and eight, and Clogger only nine, although in addition it was reported that there were forty-six altars where the people heard mass in the open air. In Raffa, one old mass house, one recently erected, one cabin and two sheds. In Derry, there were nine mass houses, all mean and considerable buildings. But mass was said in most parts of the diocese in open fields or under some shed set up occasionally for shelter. In Dromore, there were two mass houses and two old forts where masses are constantly said. And in Down, there were five mass houses. But in addition, the priests celebrated in private houses or on the mountains. In the Diocese of Dublin, it was reported that the number of mass houses amounted to 58, 16 of which were situated within the city. In Ferns, there were 31, together with 11 movable altars in the fields. In Leland, 28, besides three altars in the fields and three private chapels, and in Ossory, there were 32 old mass houses, and 18 built since the reign of George I. In Cashel there were forty mass houses, and it was noted particularly that one was being built at Tipperary, in the form of a cross, ninety-two feet by seventy-two. In Cloyne there were seventy mass houses. In Tuam, the Protestant archbishop reported that there were mass houses in most parishes. In Elfin, it was reckoned that there were forty-seven mass houses, a few of them being huts. In Killala there were four, in Achenry thirteen in Clonfort, 40, and in Kilmacdoo, there were 13. But in a remarkable fact that in spite of all the legal penalties directed against the priests, and of all the work that was being done by the government officials, the priest-catchers, whose profession, according to the Irish House of Commons, was an honorable one, and by the magistrates and ministers, there was a very large number of secular priests still ministering to the people, and also of friars, who were reported as being active in preaching to the people, sometimes in private houses, and sometimes in the open fields. And it is even still more remarkable that despite the vigilance of the Protestant bishops, there were even then over five hundred popish schools, in some of which the classics were taught, and there were besides several schoolmasters, who moved from place to place. The Protestant Bishop of Derry announced with a considerable amount of pride that there were not any popish schools in his diocese. Sometimes, he said, a straggling schoolmaster sets up in some of the mountainous parts of some parishes, but upon being threatened, 
as they constantly are, with a warrant or presentment by the church wardens, they generally think proper to withdraw. During the reign of George II, 1727 to 60, the persecution began to abate, though more than one new measure was added to the penal laws. Primate Bolter, who was practically speaking ruler of the country during his term of office, was alarmed at the large number of papists still in the country, five to one was his estimate, and at the presence of close on three thousand priests, and suggested new schemes for the overthrow of popery. The Catholics were deprived of their votes at parliamentary or municipal elections, lest Protestant members might be inclined to curry favor with them by opposing the penal code. Barristers, clerks, attorneys, solicitors, etc., were not to be admitted to practice unless they had taken the oaths and declarations which no Catholic could take. Converts to Protestantism were to be treated similarly unless they could produce reliable evidence that they had lived as Protestants for two years and that they were rearing their children as Protestants. Very severe laws had been laid down already against marriages between Catholics and Protestants, but as such marriages still took place, it was declared that the priest who celebrated such marriages was to be reputed guilty of felony, that after the first May, 1746, all marriages between Catholics and persons who had been Protestants within the twelve months preceding the marriage should be null and void, as should all marriages between Protestants if celebrated in the presence of a priest. Later on, the death penalty was decreed against priests who assisted at such unions. Finally, through the exertions of Primate Bolter and Bishop Marsh, the charter schools were established. They were intended, as was explained in the prospectus, to rescue the souls of thousands of poor children from the dangers of popish superstition and idolatry, and their bodies from the miseries of idleness and beggary. The schools were entirely Protestant in management, and the children were reared as Protestants. Once a Catholic parent surrendered his children, he could never claim them again. In 1745, the Irish Parliament appropriated the fees derived from the licenses required by all hawkers and peddlers to the support of the charter schools, and it is computed that between the years 1745 and 1767, these same institutions received about £112,000 from the public funds. Though emancipation was still a long way off, yet after 1760 it began to be recognized that the penal code had failed to achieve the object for which it had been designed. End of chapter 11. Recording by Maria Therese. End of History of the Catholic Church from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Rev. James McCaffrey.